Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's great to see all of you. Have a good day and good night. And uh, I would like to welcome you uh, to the second panel of the ECOMOS Expect Unexpected, uh, organized by ECOR. And as you remember that the tema of our first panel was earthquake, and this time we gathered to address the very critical and other issue that far-reaching consequences for communities and their cultural heritage around the world, the challenge of flood disaster, and the imperative of effective risk management. Um, according to the emergency event database MData, flood is among the top five disasters in terms of loss of life and damage and their large impact, according to uh, 2022 uh, numbers. The consequences of flood are severe, ranging from loss of life and property to long-term environmental and economic devastation. And as we witness uh, an increase in the frequency and intensity of extreme weather events this critical, uh, that we come together today to discuss uh, strategize and the implement of effect measure to mitigate the risk uh, of the flooding. Uh, today's gathering is not just about uh, uh, acknowledging the problem, but more importantly about the finding the sustainable solutions together, to think about the solutions together. And I'm sure that our collective efforts will shape the future of our heritage and users where the devastating effects of flood disaster are mitigated and communities feel the impact of this uh, adversity. Uh, as you know, this uh, panel is a uh, two day as tradition. <laughs> the first day uh, of the two day program will as uh, we did in last time and the future presentations by a member of our scientific committees. And the second day uh, will be dedicated to the recent floods, uh, devastating floods in Pakistan and Nigeria, which caused significant loss uh, to the cultural heritage and the people. And in the first day, distinguished, uh, distinguished uh, experts from the scientific committees will talk. And the second day uh, from the national committees of ICOMOS Nigeria and the ICOMOS Pakistan will share with us the impact of these two major disasters on cultural heritage and the work they have carried out in this area. And I would like to thank to all the scientific committees and the colleagues who responded to our call for contribution. I'm sure that these topics will be discussed in our two-day panel. We'll also provide an important input for the uh, tema of the ECOMOS uh, triennial scientific plan entitled Disaster and Conflict Resilient Heritage that we will discuss between 2024 and 2027. And uh, thank you very much again uh, for your time, uh, giving your time, attention, and dedication to addressing this critical issue. Uh, may our shared commitment lead us to future where the impact of flood disaster on heritage is mitigated uh, and help to improve the capacity of the communities. And also, I have a great thank uh, to Veronica Casanovas. All these uh, last two months we worked together to bring everything together. And uh, 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 she spent lots of time and effort for bringing everything, uh, bombarded you with the many uh, mails. And I also would like to, uh, thanks to Eje, uh, she is with me in Istanbul. Veronica is in Vietnam. And uh, today we will try to, uh to do the uh all program together so uh in here i am leaving the uh screen to our uh, president chris marion for a welcoming speech thank you and a very uh, fruitful uh, meeting to all of us thank you Zaina, very much for that um, kind introduction. Do you can you see this okay? Yes, we can. Perfect. Um, well, thank you. Well, welcome everybody, um, ladies and gentlemen, and our distinguished guests and colleagues, and especially our esteemed speakers who have taken the time um, to put together presentations and be with us here today. Uh, and would just overall like to welcome you on behalf of ECOMOS ICOR 
um, with regards to the Sycamore's panel series. Uh, the second is Zainab had said, uh, and this is with regards to floods. Today and tomorrow, Zainab was saying, we will gather to address a continually growing concern around the world, and that being the need to protect our invaluable natural sites and historic structures from the devastating impacts of floods. Our collective cultural heritage is a testament to our creativity and our resilience and our history that have shaped who we are today. However, with all of this, as climate change intensifies along with other factors, the frequency and the severity of floods are on the rise as we know and we see in the news, posing a significant threat to the shared history and traditions and stories that it's made from, both in terms of a short-term and long-term impacts. These are just some examples that we can see here, a very, very small sampling of the impacts that floods have had on our natural sites and our cultural heritage structures and historic towns and cities, as well as archeological sites. And these are really, as you can see from some of the dates, really fairly recently, uh, a lot just over the last 10 years, uh, but really affecting every part throughout the world from Africa and Timbuktu and Victoria Falls and Zimbabwe and Ethiopia and Egypt into Australia and Oceania, um, from Fiji to Papua New Guinea and the Solomon Islands in Australia, uh, various sites in Asia uh, that we're all probably quite familiar with from Angkor Wat and Petra and Jordan and the Forbidden City to historic cities there in Asia, including Kyoto and Lijiang in China. A lot as well in Europe and historic cities, including such cities as Venice and Athens and Istanbul to sites and structures. Um, again, that we probably know quite well from Versailles and Stonehenge and the Colosseum in Rome, on through South America and sites such as Machu Picchu and Easter Island, and on through North America. So this is, is just an example, but really um, we're, we're quite prone and exposed to floods in a number of areas that are being uh, hit and experiencing floods and the short and long-term impacts. So when we look at impacts in particular, just a, a very brief overview. A lot of times, you know, floods are a, a little bit different from some of the other hazards that we experience. Um, yeah, there's a lot of immediate term impacts, but then short term and longer term uh, that need to be dealt with just from um, impacts on the structures and foundations and load bearing walls uh, to the materials, the wood that swells up and warps and rots and decays over time impacts on the brick and mortar and erosion, uh, corrosion of, of metal components and discoloration, um, even damage to the overall utilities, uh, which helps uh, having those in place in terms of the recovery aspect, whether it's electricity, whether it's HVAC systems to help maintain temperatures and humidities and so forth, and even access roads to help emergency responders getting there um, in a timely manner. Uh, also, significant impacts on the interiors, uh, as, as we know from furniture and interior finishes and archives, frescoes and paintings that may be on ceilings and walls, um, artifacts and, and relics. We also experience a lot just in terms of natural sites and cultural landscapes and archaeological sites, um, erosions, uh, alterations to the topography and the landscapes and gardens that are there loss of vegetation at times and trees and soil that are just uh, wiped away and hopefully regrow, but may not. There could be changes in water flow patterns and collapse of ruins nearby, depending on the extent of the flood, and oftentimes submerging artifacts and archeological sites. We also include, you know, looking at burial grounds and crypts that are impacted and loss of grave markers and tombstones um, and impacting archeological sites um, and, and features that may be underground and impacted by floods that haven't been um, uncovered at that point in time. So with that, there's obviously economic consequences from the restorations and repair costs, impacts on revenue from tourism and cultural tourism and economic strains. It's not just those particular sites, but the overall communities are impacted, um, but also just from a cultural perspective and who we are and our cultural identity from potentials of losing both tangible and intangible heritage and loss of authenticity of, of what we have. Um, the displacement of communities and the impacts on one's local identity, um, interruption of schools and educational programs that go on along with this, um, a disruption of traditional practices and, and potentially cultural events. 
So with that, as you can see, there are you know immediate as well as short, short and longer term impacts that we really need to be looking at. And I think uh, today and tomorrow is a fantastic opportunity that we'll hear much, much more about with regards to creating awareness, but also hearing more about different mitigation efforts and communities coming together uh, to be able to address these um, in various manners. So with that, I'd just like to turn this back over, um, but uh, again, kind of repeating on from saying up and thank Veronica so very, very much for um, her tireless efforts over the last several months, as well as Zainab Eche, um, incredible efforts that they have put into this. And uh, I'm sure this will be a fantastic event. And thank you, Dr. Zainab Gulunal for all of this um, as well for uh, for assisting. So with that, I would, I would like to turn this back over. Um, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Chris, uh, for your speech. And I think uh, AJ have a small reminder before we uh, start to other speeches. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, thank you. Uh, firstly, I would like to share all the things that I have done. We have just learned that we have some inconvenience with the starting time. Uh, the panel was planned to be starting at uh, one uh, Central European time, but uh, I believe there was a mistake with the uh, Zoom, so apologies uh, for that. Uh, I have a small reminder for our panelists today. Uh, Sorry, we don't hear you well. Sorry. Hi. We don't hear very well. Yes. Uh, Your is sound is broken. With my sound? I think that one of you needs to mute because you're in the same room. Yes. When you, when you talk, one should mute. There you go. Is is that okay now? Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we have a very rich but tight schedule, so we would like to kindly ask you to respect your uh, speech time, which is 20 minutes. And for our attendees, if you have any questions to our panelists, you can use the Q&A uh, function of the webinar. We, we ask you to kindly provide an email address. We will have a discussion Q&A session at the end of today, but if we won't have any time, uh, we will uh, ask our panelists to answer your questions uh, via email. So if you could provide your email addresses with your questions, uh, then we won't have any problems. Uh, President of ICOMOS, Teresa Patricio, uh, she won't be able to join us here today, uh, but she sent a video, so I will be sharing that with you right now. We can't hear her. Yes, colleagues. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening for some of you. I'm very honored to say a few words to you uh, today on the opening of the second ECOMOS panel, expected and expected, uh, that today and tomorrow will concern specifically floods. Years, ECOMOS has been confronted with various crises in the world where uh, monitoring and response for cultural heritage and for our national committees and members is a necessity of paramount importance. We have been confronted with many disasters, confronted with wars, conflicts, and political instabilities that are ravaging a number of regions on the globe, but also with earthquakes, uh, wildfires, uh, cyclones, heat waves, and severe storms, and of course, with floods. Um, 
Per, upon request of DECOMOS board, uh, ECORP Crisis Monitoring and Response Working Group, coordinated by Zeynep Gulunay, conducts contacts and surveys with our members and proceeds with the monitoring and follow up of the various crisis situation worldwide. To give you some idea, during recent uh, months, they have monitored the situation and are still monitoring uh, during the conflicts and instabilities in Burna, uh, Ethiopia, uh, Israel, Ukraine, uh, the occupied Palestinian territory, and of course, Gaza, and also uh, the situation in Sudan. They have also monitored uh, the situation in Syria and uh, in Turkey, following the earthquakes, and of course, they have monitored, uh, monitored the situation uh, during the floods in Pakistan and Nigeria. So for this work, we are in contact with our national committees and with the partner organizations, and uh, uh, we have been asking collaboration of our international scientific committees and working groups, so the technical bodies of e-commerce. And these last uh, 19 months, we organized three emergency meetings with you, we do all in March 2022, in April 2023, and more, uh, more recently uh, in the last month of um, November 2023. So setting up the crisis monitoring and response uh, unit was the first step to establish an e-commerce mechanism for faster and precise assessment and monitoring system. The meeting of today and tomorrow, that is in fact the second e-commerce panel series expected unexpected represents the e-commerce intentions to prepare with the crisis monitoring and response working group and together with e-commerce international scientific committees and working group guidance and best practice for response so the main idea is to focus on the critical response phase of the emergency uh, for cultural heritage and their users it is the moment to share experience and knowledge, good practice, but also difficulties, questions, and to raise problematic issues. So it is in order to be better prepared for crisis situation, but also to guarantee the protection of cultural heritage from future natural events and unexpected human disasters. So the second panel series, uh, Expected and Expected, as I already told, is dedicated to floods. Uh, following the dramatic disaster on Pakistan and on Nigeria. So um, we hope that bringing together the knowledge of uh, e-commerce international scientific committees, presenting these good practices and lessons learned from the work in the area of expertise for managing the impacts of flooding will help the colleagues on the ground for better preparation, emergency response and uh, for better recovery. So allow me, before finishing, to thank the colleagues that always respond positively for the needs of our national committees. Zeynep Pilunal, the coordinator of the e-commerce ICOR uh, Crisis Monitoring and Response for Heritage Work for Heritage, and, um, and Veronica Casanova for the organization of the second panel. I hope that this panel can meet the, the needs and the expectations of all and of course, especially of our colleagues from Pakistan and Nigeria. Uh, please be sure of the unconditional support of ECOMOS and of ECOMOS board, and uh, many thanks for all your efforts. Thank you very much. So we would like to uh, thanks to uh, Teresa. Uh, right now, Teresa is in Dubai at the Conference of Parties meeting to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. I hope uh, she can bring all. Uh, Dr. Rohichi Gyasu, Vice President of uh, ECORP, International Scientific. Committee on Risk Preparedness. Uh, hi, Rohit, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Zainab. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, it, okay. All right. So first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to, uh, to speak in this very important panel. Uh, the title of my uh, speech is The Interface of Climate Change and 
uh, flood risks, filling the gaps. Um, so uh, let's first start with what's happening due to climate change. We all know that flood was always there. Flood is a disaster that has impacted uh, our heritage sites for, uh, we have uh, many uh, examples from around the world historically, uh, but the increased number and the frequency of floods in the recent years points us towards the impact of climate change uh, on uh, people's lives, livelihoods, and of course, also cultural heritage. So as this map, uh, this uh, graph shows, uh, we are really facing, in fact, the increased number of flood events. Uh, there are plenty of examples from uh, which tell us how floods are affecting our heritage sites. Uh, just two years ago, in Germany and Belgium, uh, floods affected many important historic settlements, uh, and that event of flood was very unprecedented. We never faced such uh, flood intensity uh, in in that part of the world, uh, and there were no past records of such uh, floods. Also, uh, in areas where there were not, not very heavy uh, rains, we are, we are experiencing rains which are very heavy and they happen in a very short period of time. Uh, in fact, just a few days ago in the Gulf region, in many countries, uh, including UAE, uh, Oman, uh, there were very heavy rains and uh, the infrastructure was not really ready to accept uh, this kind of uh, uh, event. So now what we are facing is not only that we have a high intensity and frequency of rainfall, but we are also facing them in, in areas where which are not expected to have uh, such heavy rains. And also uh, sometimes they are taking place at, uh, at a time when uh, it is not supposed to be rainy season. So uh, of course, this is also having a much huge impact in uh, in urban areas, uh, for example, in Hanoi in Vietnam, uh, the uh, Badin archaeological site, which is located right in the middle of the city, uh, is actually facing much more uh, challenge from flooding, uh, because um, when you have uh, slopes not really um, in uh, able to take water away from the site, and there's a huge uh, development around the sites, then the impact on such archaeological sites in the middle of urban environment uh, is uh, also something to be really concerned about. Uh, if you think about world heritage uh, cities, uh, we know very well that many world heritage cities are actually much more at risk of floods now, uh, especially those which are along the river or along the coast. And we know that most of the world heritage cities are actually located in those areas. So as you can see in this, um, in this uh, uh, map, many of the world heritage cities which are in the dark purple are actually at much higher risk from floods. So uh, recently a survey was uh, conducted on, the, uh, on, the, on what site managers think are the impacts of uh, different kinds of, of mainly climate change related events. And as you can see from this uh, uh, result, 53% uh, of site managers uh, said that extreme rainfall events is uh, an issue that they are facing uh, in their sites. And that's also connected to 42% uh, of them saying that the intensity and frequency of floods as experienced in their sites is much higher uh, you know, than before. So we know that uh, this is not just a scientific uh, um, statistics that we have to be concerned about. This is also actually experienced by the managers who are there at the site uh, in a very direct way. So when we talk about flooding and the issues, uh, what's important for us to really uh, be mindful is that flooding is not just a consequence of heavy rain. Uh, there are many uh, different reasons why flooding can happen, uh, whether it is storms or cyclones or hurricanes or typhoons, whatever we may call them. Uh, 
they are bringing much more storm surges and then consequently there is uh, flooding. And also sea level rise uh, is slowly but surely uh, increasing the, um, the risk of flood to many of our heritage sites. And sea level rise is also linked to erosion and erosion also uh, somehow creates much more flood risk along the coastal areas. Also, we have to be uh, thinking about uh, the reality of floods occurring many times in combination with many other kinds of events. Uh, for example, in Japan, when we had a tsunami in 2011, uh, tsunami actually caused lots of flooding in those areas. Um, and also, uh, if they are associated with cyclones or storms, uh, often they can also lead to fire. So uh, while we are concerned about floods, our, our uh, interventions or our flood mitigation measures have to really think about all these combinations which are practically possible at a site and try and address them rather than in an exclusive standalone manner talk about or uh, uh, think about uh, flood mitigation. Now, I want to <clears throat> bring you to the other important um, challenge that we are facing, as I mentioned earlier as well, and that is increased rate of urbanization with the fact that the number of people living in urban areas is much higher now than the rural areas, and the number is increasing in a very fast pace. Uh, obviously, this also has a consequence on floods. So if when we have uh, this kind of urbanization and a lot of that urbanization is not really planned, then you see urban sprawl and a lot of our landscape or the larger uh, areas around our uh, heritage sites are uh, being developed in a very haphazard manner. And when that kind of development happens, uh, it also sometimes affects the local hydrology or the local water systems. And as a result, uh, the uh, the flood risk increases. So just to give you an example from uh, from Bangalore, uh, you see there are many lakes around there, but they were actually part of a larger ecological system which where lakes were connected to uh, through canals and therefore was an efficient uh, water system uh, that was linked to each other. Now, with the development that has happened, a lot of this water system doesn't really work very well. And so either it causes heavy floods uh, because the water is stagnant, it cannot flow. And many of the historic structures like dams, in this case, you can see a part of that are not functioning anymore. So either they become uh, dysfunctional and not serve the purpose of controlling the flow of water uh, or uh, they are not in use at all. So uh, what I want to bring forward is the importance of not just looking at um, heritage <clears throat> sites uh, and the issues regarding the floods without considering the kind of development that is happening around these sites. Because uh, development around these sites, which is beyond the control and the management of institutions and organizations responsible for managing heritage uh, is uh, the real, reason why flood risk cannot be reduced. And therefore, there's a need to have much better collaboration and communication between those who are managing the sites and uh, the larger uh, organizations and institutions and departments uh, which are responsible for development. So <clears throat> in this case, uh, there is also this high, huge risk of fire in the lakes because uh, simply the, uh, the lakes become like uh, sewage dumps and, and therefore pollution increases and the, consequently this kind of risk happens. Uh, <clears throat> we also have to be uh, uh, keeping in mind that there were many traditional systems which uh, actually uh, we can see in many of our uh, vernacular houses, which were designed to accept floods like the houses that are built on stilts, as you can see here in Ayutthaya uh, in uh, Thailand, uh, which is a world heritage site as well. But as people abandon these traditional designs, which were very much uh, taking into account the risk of flood, not to uh, stop the flood from affecting, but actually living with risks of flood. 
and in fact, the whole architecture had evolved in response to floods. We see that the risk of uh, negative impacts of these floods is increasing. As you can see in the image on the right side, when people just uh, build over, uh, no longer have these stilts, um, of course, uh, the uh, they will be much more impacted uh, by floods. And I wanted to <clears throat> talk about another site, which is uh, now I want to make the issue of flood also uh, uh, link it to how we manage the sites. Uh, this is one of the World Heritage Sites in Konarak in India. Uh, it has, um, uh, now the issue is that this site is facing uh, increased floods, uh, as you can see here, and the original drainage system is not working. And so one needs to really uh, figure out why the original water system is not working while the increase, uh, you know, you have this increased incidence of floods affecting the site. Now, one of the reasons for that, of course, is that the intensity of rainfall uh, is increasing during monsoon time, but this is not just connected to that uh, issue. It's also connected to what kind of uh, changes have happened around this world hated site. So um, the site was excavated and therefore the slope of the site had undergone a change. So from historically being on a higher ground, this acted more like a bowl and therefore uh, the drainage system designed originally was not able to function because uh, there have been these archeological uh, remains that have been uh, kept, you know, put around uh, as a result, uh, you know, when the site was excavated and therefore uh, the site just uh, couldn't have the proper slope. Um, and that affected the, this archaeological context uh, while the site was being excavated and uh, made ready for uh, visitors was creating a risk of flood unknowingly rather. Uh, also, uh, the fact that uh, landscaping that was done around the site was not really considering the local landscape, you know, it's uh, along the coast and therefore the kind of soil is much more sandy and when you try to convert it to this kind of green lawn, you actually change the nature of the soil. And when you change the nature of the soil, of course, uh, uh, you know, uh, water is no longer able to seep in, rather water gets accumulated. And, and therefore the risk of flood actually uh, is more because simply you have changed the original uh, landscape. And not only the, uh, the nature of the soil, but also, um, the kind of vegetation that you plant, uh, not respecting the indigenous uh, vegetation, but planting trees which probably retain a lot of water. And, and therefore, uh, again, with heavy rainfall and having this kind of landscape and vegetation actually uh, creates more risk of flooding because water is simply retained and is not able to, uh, to really be, uh, let's say, uh, it cannot be absorbed in the ground as it would do originally. So a change in the nature of vegetation, again, a part of a regular management practice is something that uh, is creating heavy, more flood risk. So the point I want to make here is that we also need to look at the management systems that we have at our site level and try and see how these management systems are, if, if they are knowingly or unknowingly increasing the risk of flood uh, along with, uh, you know, uh, especially with uh, the increased climatic events uh, of heavy rainfall. So uh, I wanted to mention the importance of also understanding how our weather patterns are changing and how these changed weather patterns along with many other factors combined together actually create the, the, the effects that we see. So for example, in this case, uh, there were uh, incident of flash floods uh, um, in the Himalayan region in the north of the country. And uh, when the, there were heavy rainfall, which actually happened before the monsoon season. So it, it took place in June, a um, couple of years ago. And because it took place in this kind of uh, unprecedented time when they were not supposed to be having rains, the temperatures were very high because there was a high summer season. So not only heavy rain uh, uh, happened, but also a part of the glacier melted uh, because it was a very high temperature. And therefore, the amount of water that you see in the river uh, actually was much higher uh, because water came both from the rain and from the 
melted glacier and came down the hill uh, carrying with it a lot of silt. Along with that, the development that had happened along the river where for tourism uh, purposes, a lot of these hotels and pilgrim infrastructure had come up. Uh, actually, uh, this also uh, didn't let water to get along the flood plains. Uh, you know, so water was kind of uh, not having the enough uh, uh, area to spread around uh, when this amount of water came in. And therefore, you found that a lot of these structures got, got damaged. Um, and then many heritage uh, sites and this very important site was covered in silt because of that uh, glacier melt, which carried this uh, uh, silt along with water um, uh, from that glacier. So, um, so uh, we can see that how a lot of impact on heritage sites happened also because uh, embankments were created and when the embankments broke away uh, with the huge flow of water, uh, that directly and indirectly affected uh, these heritage structures as well. And you can see how erosion uh, was a huge issue. You can see the whole, uh, uh, when the water came in, a large part of the land was cut out, you know, uh, because of this uh, heavy erosion. Uh, mm -hmm. Here you can see how uh, the water was like uh, taking away or scooping out the entire uh, uh, soil. And along with that, you can see that there's been a lot of deforestation. Uh, trees have been cut down. And because of that, there were also, the soil was not so, uh, the, there were also incidents of landslides and which were then, uh, you know, along with this flooding, you had these landslides happening. And therefore a combined effect of this uh, is what created the impact of floods. So the point that I want to make here with these examples is that while we look at heritage conservation and management, it's very important for us to make the linkage. And that's why I titled the presentation, Filling the Gap, that the gap is that we have not been able to establish the linkages between heritage conservation and management, uh, climate change adaptation, disaster risk reduction, more from the point of view of catastrophic flood events, and very importantly, the development that has not been sustainable and has uh, kind of increased the risk of floods. So if we don't understand these interlinkages, probably our solutions will not be so effective uh, or sustainable in the long run. So I would like to uh, uh, say that uh, we have to look for a combined set of solutions uh, for flood risk mitigation, uh, which include uh, both uh, mitigating the risks of disaster, of I mean flood disaster, uh, but also mitigating against climate change uh, and also adaptation measures. So a combination of measures is what we need to always be looking for rather than uh, more siloed kind of measures for, uh, for flood, uh, reducing the risk of flood. Uh, which also uh, means that disaster risk management and climate change adaptation, which have often been looked uh, separately, have to be brought together, uh, where we not only look at the natural variability in terms of the changing uh, intensity and frequency of uh, rainfall, and also the fact that it is happening in, uh, in the times uh, when they are not supposed to happen, and also the human cause factors, uh, as I explained to you through some examples, which are linked to the larger development process. So, because that is also creating, uh, you know, not only uh, the, as I, as I showed you, uh, destroying the ecology of the place, but also uh, increasing greenhouse gas emissions. And, and therefore these factors all come together and uh, increase both the vulnerability and exposure of our heritage sites to floods. So we need to overcome the critical challenge of mainstreaming heritage for climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction for floods. Uh, it cannot be looked at um, without seeing them as transversal, uh, which I mean to say uh, across various sectors, we have to see how we can reduce flood risks, uh, where we try to, uh, for example, look at how infrastructure uh, can be upgraded how we can look at the issues of governance, uh, issues related to land management, housing. I mean, all these issues are in various sectors, but uh, what we need to really do is uh, we need to mainstream or include links with culture 
And there I have just added nature as well. Because if we don't look at the linkages between nature and culture, just making interventions, uh, physical interventions to the built fabric is not going to help. We have to, as I showed you through examples, uh, the whole, uh, our heritage sites, the cultural sites are sitting within a more natural environment, uh, which uh, are the, the landscape uh, environment or the landscape context. And that has to be really understood to be able to uh, influence uh, efficient measures. Uh, this also requires us to work across ministerial coordination, because as you see, uh, in many countries, uh, the climate changes under environment ministry, uh, disaster risk management under home affairs, while cultural heritage is, uh, of course, under Ministry of Culture and sometimes tourism too. And then we have a separate uh, ministry on urban development. Now, as I showed you through several examples, it's so uh, important that all these ministries and departments are talking to each other. Otherwise, our flood mitigation measures are not going to be uh, effective. Uh, and also, I would like to emphasize that our interventions at different scales have to be connected to each other. If we are working at the site level, uh, it is connected, as I showed also through some examples, uh, to what is being done at the regional level. So uh, we need to look at planning and design interventions, uh, both um, how at the site level they can affect and also how at the regional level they can affect. And therefore uh, we need to, and sometimes even beyond, right? I mean, even towards the level of the national government, where the policies uh, and programs at the larger national level are not somehow connected to what happens at the site level. So we need to bring together top-down and bottom-up approaches. It's really, uh, it's not either of them, it's the uh, bringing together of both the approaches which are really necessary. Uh, so uh, as I also mentioned earlier, this means that we need to, while look at the policies and plans for the city or the region, uh, we also need to look at how our management systems are there at the site site level and how uh, if we are dealing with urban areas, how uh, our urban heritage uh, or urban development is trying to address them. So uh, we need to integrate adaptation and mitigation in regular heritage management procedures. Uh, it cannot be seen as a separate heritage flood plan. Uh, it's not going to work. Uh, it has to be part of the heritage management plan. And also it requires us to have a place-based approach, which means that we can no longer just look at management from the point of view of how we define the boundaries of the site. Uh, there is a larger context which has to be respected, understood, and uh, included if we are going to manage our sites. And that's the only way we can really address the risk of floods in an efficient manner. Um, <clears throat> which uh, in case of cities has to also uh, look at uh, the links between the peri-urban and rural areas. Maybe there is a project happening in a rural area, but that project will have an impact of on either our historic uh, urban uh, neighborhood or one of the sites uh, within the city. Uh, but it, the, it, the intervention or uh, maybe like a dam might be constructed somewhere much further away from the site. So we need to have those kind of uh, connections. And that requires us to also look for new approaches, tools, and methodologies and learn from traditional management systems. So I'm going to conclude by just talking about or uh, emphasizing the importance of really working at multiple levels, whether it is a, a level of uh, looking at has, uh, having uh, proper hazard maps and land use regulations, or having uh, policies regarding uh, reforestation to reduce the risk of floods, or how to activate uh, rivers and canals in urban areas so that water can be discharged in an appropriate manner, or looking at buildings uh, which are our heritage structures, how best can we prevent them from the risk of, of floods, whether we go for stilts, whether we go for uh, um, the other measures like lifting sometimes maybe it is not preferred, but maybe there is no other option to look for. So we need to think about many uh, measures that have to be applied according to the local context. And I just uh, wanted to also have this example again from uh, site in, in, uh, um, <clears throat> in Ayutthaya where 
I just wanted to mention the importance of designing flood mitigation measures by taking into account the fact that uh, we are not only looking at mitigating the risk of flood, but we are also trying to protect the heritage values of the site and the landscape. So our measures, for example, in this case, uh, these uh, kind of uh, these these uh, flood protection measures are not permanent, but they can be put in place in there in case there is a warning for flood. I mean, there could be uh, much more discussion around what are the most appropriate systems. But what I want to emphasize is that there is a need to not only look at technical solutions, but also look at how the design of these flood mitigation measures can respect the values of the site, which requires us to be much more innovative in the way we deal with them. Uh, thank you very much once again. Uh, thank you very much, Rohit, for this very informative presentation and uh, joining us in, uh, in a very late night in your uh, part of the world. So I would like to invite the Dr. Lori Collins. Uh, she is a member of the Botanic on Upper Space Heritage. Uh, thank you. Hello. Good day to everybody. Good morning from here. Going to try to screen share here. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak today and participate with everyone um, on here, both the panel and, and visiting people. Um, I am in the Aerospace Heritage um, in the um, Scientific Committee for Aerospace Heritage, which is fairly new, um, maybe one of the newest groups that have uh, joined ICOMOS. And so uh, my talk today will focus on, on, on aerospace, but I did want to say that um, I'm also part of a center um, with digital heritage and geospatial information uh, will be some of the case studies that I show today um, will extend be a little bit beyond uh, aerospace. I'll, I'll show you some of the other um, disaster mitigation kinds of things that we've done with um, that are pertinent to this group. Um, but I'm going to focus on uh, the work that we're doing at Cape Canaveral in Florida um, at the Space Force Station here. Um, where uh, many of the the topics that were just mentioned um, in the previous uh, presentation are happening at a very rapid rate, in particular erosion and and coastal change. But um, as was mentioned, you know, heritage is really uh, being lost to a lot of different um, processes, um, some of which are are induced by us, and some that are are coming from uh, nature, and. Um, Many of these are happening at, at unprecedented sorts of rates, uh, bringing lots of new challenges for both managers and, um, and responders as well. Um, I'm going to focus on maybe some of the applications and methodologies that are being used to address these and sort of operationalizing uh, solutions, if you will, uh, or at least uh, uh, sort of development of planning and um, strategies that we can use in these kinds of instances. Um, so many of the things that I'll be sharing uh, as examples are developed from uh, sort of an integration of different types of methods and approaches that we use in our center. So we're using a lot of different types of three-dimensional documentation, but also combining with um, geographical information systems approaches and uh, utilizing a lot of things like airborne LIDAR and remote sensing kinds of techniques um, away from the site, but then combining that with uh, actual survey kind of um, data gathering that we're doing on site uh, with both imaging and uh, different types of uh, both laser and structured light types of scanning and, and survey methods. Um, some of these are sort of traditional approaches when you think of survey like like GPS or um, total station kinds of things, and others are more, uh, let's say, uh, cutting edge or uh, different types of methodology such as terrestrial laser scanning, allowing us to document very wide um, swaths of areas in, in very um, efficient methods and approaches that uh, take into consideration uh, disaster kinds of things that are going on that may not be safe for uh, on the ground kinds of survey that would require us to be much more intensive on the ground. Um, 
things like drones that are allowing us to kind of get away from that um, kind of uh, ground methodology and kind of approach things still very uh, locally specific are really increasing our ability to cover a lot of areas and um, both from an inspection standpoint post-disaster and also to develop methods and strategies for dealing with uh, pre-disaster and sort of planning and um, strategizing. Um, but these these combined kinds of techniques are pretty much what I'll be showing uh, results from uh, in in the different types of projects that we do. Um, the center that I work with deals with a lot of these sort of broad thematic approaches. Um, and then, uh, you know, all of these can be uh, impacted by by flood and um, the different types of uh, climate impacts that we're kind of talking about and touching upon today. Um, I thought I would start with just some examples just to kind of tell you that in Florida, where I'm from, there are, I think, seven um, national historic landmark areas in our state that are impacted by flood, in particular flood or climate change kinds of, of activities uh, happening. And uh, I think our center has worked at all but one of those. So I have kind of examples um, to kind of share this one being uh, the Castillo de San Marcos in St. Augustine, the entire city of St. Augustine in Florida, in fact, has to be very resilient forward thinking in terms of, of flooding, because every time there's any um, increase in even uh, a little bit of rainfall, it, it results in dramatic um, uh, sheet flooding across the city. And um, so there's a lot of effort into uh, sort of documenting the city as a whole, but also focusing in, this is a National Park Service, uh, National Landmark site, um, and we are working with a lot of uh, agency managers and site managers that require really detailed um, terrain and elevational mapping and understanding the built environment in relation to those um, kinds of things. And then being able to develop tools for them so that we um, can, for example, share uh, different flood scenarios through time and also take into account some of the spatial data mapping um, and to kind of visualize and understand what is happening across larger areas. Another um, global kind of uh, site that is of interest that I think that um, we've worked out outside of the United States, um, we work, do a lot of work in Mexico and Guatemala as well, um, and here I'm showing uh, the archaeological park and ruins of Quiriqua, which is inscribed to the UNESCO World Heritage. Um, and here, not only are they facing things like volcanic eruptions and other kinds of um, challenges that result in that in some of in some of the really vulnerable areas, both um, societal vulnerability as well as uh, as well as site vulnerability. Um, but here we're having repeated kinds of uh, things. Every time there's a cyclone or a, a hurricane, um, a tropical storm, we're seeing uh, flooding across the site that's damaging to some of these significant monuments that are contained uh, within the site that are, are um, the reason for the site being inscribed on, on the World Heritage List. In fact, some of these really um, incredible uh, carved stone monuments that are being impacted by mudslides and debris fields and uh, you know all kinds of uh, water inundation kinds of things. At this site, uh, you know these kinds of events happen quite frequently. Um, in fact, I think uh, the UNESCO website talks about uh, Mitch Hurricane Mitch in 1998. There was a big disaster there in 2020. There was another disaster. Uh, with a tropical storm coming through. Um, and we had documented all of the sculptural corpus here in 2018, and then were able to provide all of that data um, in ways that managers could utilize this um, to mitigate for um, and understand some of the impacts going on with the um, sculpture on site. Um, and here I'm just showing a few examples of, of our 3D data versus what and ultimately in 2020 happened to um, these monuments. You can see the water lines and actually the mud um, 
that flowed through the site that that was of impact to a lot of these sculptures. And then the database that we created in 3D with these monuments um, became very useful for understanding, you know, water lines, what parts of the monuments were impacted, um, which parts were remaining inundated and underwater uh, or impacted from, from the mud itself. Um, so those kinds of, of uh, things are very much in our wheelhouse uh, and we we are very much uh, a team that sort of responds to disaster events like that, um, post-disaster for survey kinds of, of needs, but also, like I say, with pre, pre-disaster kind of planning and kind of um, trying to develop these tools for uh, managers and, and, and governments and agencies that we're working with. Um, at Cape Canaveral, and in specific to uh, aerospace heritage, um, Cape Canaveral is kind of unique in not only the density and types of sites that are represented there from um, space heritage, but also uh, from the unique environment and the challenges that that brings. So um, the site selection being uh, where it is, is important for the launch complexes themselves needing to be um, or wanting to uh, take advantage of this coastal uh, environment. However, that also brings with it some very um, complex kinds of relationships uh, with, with natural and um, sea level rise and, uh, and climate change kind of impacts that are occurring there. The site is really being impacted uh, by hurricanes, storms, just storm intensity. Um, and the frequency of those storms, you know, the, every every hurricane we're getting now are are high intensity storms. Um, but then even the tropical storms and the the hurricane, you know, the the category one and two type storms are in fact bringing with them high amounts of erosion and uh, and and sheet flooding, storm surge kind of thing across the site in. Um, very uh, deleterious ways that that are um, creating challenges for for the managers of the site. Um, all of these factors uh, are important for not only the historic resources, but the fact that uh, Cape Canaveral is very dynamic and is actually still in use uh, with space industry and SpaceX and Blue Origin and several other um, companies that are developing and, and investing in a lot of infrastructure. And in some in some instances are actually reutilizing some of the historic sites. So it's really important that we have a very um, accurate understanding and documentation of the historic sites for their protection and conservation, but also for that um, idea that this is a changing dynamical kinds of system that is very much um, an investment for these different groups as well. Um, these uh, sites are, you know, all close proximity to coastal environments that, um, are, you know, have a lot of uh, potential for impact across these uh, very expensive uh, infrastructural development that um, you see presented here. There are 33, I think, um, complexes that uh, up and down the coast here, and then several new ones that are coming on board and reusing a lot of these uh, sites as well. Um, so this is this is a very large and dynamic kind of system. Um, the space heritage at Cape Canaveral is also um, unique in that it spans uh, from the very beginnings of of sort of uh, the intercontinental ballistic missile um, development and research and development that went into a lot of the Cold War era kinds of sites that exist there. Um, a lot of uh, the missile program kinds of sites that um, are one of a kind. And then also uh, the national uh, landmark designation has to do with the manned or crewed um, missions. Um, they call it man in space uh, theme. And uh, here I'm showing uh, the Friendship 7 Mercury mission uh, with John Glenn uh, doing those, uh, getting into the capsule there. Um, all of these sites are uh, very much um, fragile and uh, being documented for purposes of uh, preservation, but also uh, how they're being adapted to the, the current environments. Um, the map that I show are um, showing all of the sites that to date we have documented um, using these kinds of, of digital strategies that I'm referring to. 
Um, many of these are part of that national landmark designation. Um, others are contributing kinds of sites and uh, and others are sites that are currently going through um, potential for reuse or, or redevelopment and are in need of documentation of the historic structures prior to any activities um, happening there. Um, all of these sites are contributing to not only our understanding and knowledge and presentation of the heritage at the site, but also in addressing and looking at these sorts of challenges uh, from a managerial kind of perspective um, for uh, dealing with these. Um, all of the, the sites that we are documenting are being done in a way that is also allowing um, sort of a permanence of record. Um, we are affiliated with our library system, the state library system. And so everything that we develop in a digital context is also being preserved in that manner um, with metadata and through the, our state our state library system for the world in that kind of way as well. Um, and I've got some, each of these, I sort of am including some um, QR codes that will take you directly to the, the different content if you are so interested in seeing. Um, this was a documentary about the the overall project. Um, sharing with you some of the examples of what we're up against, um, rapid erosion happening uh, you know, across the site, storm surge events that I, I mentioned, as well as um, the uh, need to document all of these areas that are literally, quite literally being washed away. Um, each time we have a storm, uh, our team is going out post storm and and remapping some of these features and we have target areas developed along our beach survey zones where we're looking at um, literally you know feet and meters uh, being lost of of um, bank and dune system. Um, and the data that we're collecting is also useful, I should say, in an integrative way, because we're very much working with their natural resource team, who is trying to respond to stabilization, um, maybe the creation of new dune systems. Um, they have they manage this resource not only for the heritage sites, but also for um, uh, natural systems and uh, some endangered species, in fact, that that are here, including uh, beach mice population that uh, very much relies on these healthy dune systems. And so um, a lot of the data that we're collecting, we're doing in concert with an integration of both natural and cultural kind of resource management um, across the base. Um, and I'm just kind of showing, you know, some some post storm imagery here. This was Hurricane Dorian that we had come, uh, uh, not uh, an extremely in, um, intense situation, uh, but nonetheless, we had a lot of erosion happening from this storm. This was in 2019, um, where you can see uh, the continual loss of, of um, area here. And then this is interesting because a lot of what we're doing is time depth kind of uh, uh, study as well. So um, we're taking a geographic information system approach to kind of um, geo-referencing if things are not, um, if we have old aerial imagery or lower flown aerial imagery, we're able to geo-reference these and kind of consider them um, in relation to uh, landmark studies of what's happening kind of through time. Um, and if we kind of map that beach interface um, from 1972 to, um, to basically post uh, our last storm where we have aerial imagery flown, you can see that's the amount of, of beach loss that we've had um, across this area. Um, so now we're into some of these historic structures that are uh, closer, a little bit closer to the um, coastal environment here. Um, again, I think I'm showing a different view of, of that. And then we're we're also examining this from a little bit deeper perspective, going back to a baseline of, of 1943 and um, kind of showing the loss through time. And we've done this not only for individual sites, like this is Launch Complex 34 that, that is having some really critical needs, but we've also done this for the entirety of the base. Um, and we've also linked it to um, 
the building information management kinds of uh, data that the base itself has. So we work with managers there to kind of include some of their uh, their maps that include facilities across the, the base structure so that we can see what these sort of dynamic changes using aerial LIDAR, we can see what has been lost, what is being retained, what is being most impacted along these, these coastal interfaces. Um, all of this, it, the flood event itself or the, the surge itself is one thing. Dealing with the aftermath of that can be challenging as well because the salt air, the, the inundation events, the, um, the loss of structure elements, and then sort of what happens after that is also something that we're trying to document with the, these um, forms of digital uh, uh, survey. And so things like structural degradation and loss can include all of these um, rusting and uh, degradating metal uh, areas and, um, and actually even the metal corroding that is inside the structural elements. So a lot of these are cement uh, reinforced with rebar. And what's happening is there's chemical changes occurring uh, from some of the water and the, the salt airs that are actually degrading the buildings from the inside out. And so being able to study this and look at these uh, surfaces in great detail with the three-dimensional scanning has been of uh, great uh, value to the, the managers to understand not only mitigative approaches, but also areas that are um, structurally not okay, uh, or are, you know, in need of, of uh, engineering kinds of understanding. So a lot of times what we're doing is, is collecting that data and serving it up in such ways that different types of professionals can then work with it, architects and, and structural engineers, for example. Um, some of the sites that we are documenting are literally not only one of a kind, but also memorials themselves. So that Launch Complex 34 that I showed that's facing critical need with a lot of the beach erosion is also the site of the Apollo 1 memorial. Um, and this is a site that, um, you know, people still come to today for uh, memory and, and social kind of memory of this event that was important to our national history and, and the world space and uh, uh, heritage programs as well. Um, and, and so this site memorializing um, this site in 3D became an important kind of um, effort, but also using that 3D data. Um, and here you're looking at a terrestrial laser scan that encompasses the entirety of the pad, as well as the, um, the memorial structure, which is the um, stand on which the uh, Apollo 1 test um, caught fire. And uh, that, that has become the memorial site today. Um, the pad itself has faced a lot of uh, de degradation from erosion and different um, uh, impacts from uh, being in that proximity to the coastline. And so having this kind of very detailed terrain mapping where we can understand not only all of the, the metal degradation to the memorial itself, but um, there's also, you know, things of consideration such as pollution and contaminants relating to these sites that have to be, you know, understood in terms of what is happening across uh, larger areas, in particular to a fragile coastline. Um, and then our 3D models, the renders and the models themselves become useful for um, a broader impact kind of uh, strategy as well for education and outreach and for um, incorporating these things into curricula and classroom kinds of activities as well. From a management standpoint, we can serve data up in different types of ways. It might be very interesting, for example, to use reflectivity data or understanding how metals are corroding across the site from um, that kind of exposure. Um, so having a, a very detailed and sort of forensic kind of capacity with uh, data collection is very uh, critical for um, ongoing management needs at this particular site. 
Um, and I'm not sure how the broadband width will uh, show, but this is, you know, a point cloud of data that we're collecting at a um, complex. So we have the entire complex and focusing in on a blockhouse that's uh, got some structural issues and uh, in need of documentation. Some of the site is actually subterranean. And so understanding the terrain in relation to the structure um, and then you know, having this data in such a way that it can be incorporated into other types of programs like CAD for measure drawings and um, GIS for understanding uh, a 3D kind of view of the site. Um, we can also use this for a snapshot in time, if you will, of, of what the structural integrity is of a particular site as we document it. And many of these sites, in fact, we are re-documenting um, at interval so that we understand uh, what some of these change and loss, um, are, what, what kinds of processes are happening at these sites. And here I'm showing that data served in a different way. So utilizing that data to create detailed terrain models and measure drawings um, that include both inside and, and exterior kinds of elements, as well as subterranean elements in this case with the tunnel system. Um, and then interestingly, we're also, we have historic drawings at this particular site. A lot of these space sites have been as built um, mapped uh, in different ways. And so we're able to compare the actual, uh, you know, what, what's happening with the site now to that sort of historic perspective, which again gives us a, a more critical way of viewing change and um, degradation across site areas. Uh, here showing a different type of scanning. So I was showing wider scale, the ability to bring a scale into closer view and, and document monuments here, uh, looking at the Friendship 7 uh, Mercury uh, mission monument that is, is present on the site. Um, this is the same kinds of technology that I showed you that we're using. We used at Curigua at that um, flood site that I showed from Guatemala. And so a lot of these technologies uh, have very broad applications. So, you know, it's not just useful for space heritage or for um, this type of, of structural um, aspect, but also very fine details um, with some of our scanners. We're getting half a human hair of accuracy. Um, so that we can even create replicas or if pieces or structural elements are missing on a site, um, you know, we can tr do treatments and conservation kind of measures using um, some of these technologies as well. Um, and I encourage you, this is our, our 3D uh, models, and all of our models are created in such a way that um, they can be visualized both in uh, uh, on your desktop kind of thing, um, but also utilizing other types of technique like mixed reality, virtual reality, and augmented reality kinds of applications. It's important for us when we document something that we do it to the best possible practices, but also that we maintain the data in its um, interoperable format, neutral format, that it doesn't require any specific kinds of software. Um, we do things in compliant ways where we can make sure that we archivally protect the data that we collect, but also that we can continue to share this data into the future in ways that are going to make sense for people and are going to be very easy to use. So um, what we try to do and strive to do with the data sets or provide them in different ways that managers in particular that have maybe don't have the certain software or don't have certain capacity or capabilities are able to utilize these. So all of our GIS data that we collect, we may contain that in a geo database that's more specific to GIS professionals, but we also are serving that out in ways that are through web-based um, GIS mapping approaches where a manager can sit on their computer, not have any particular software, use cloud-based um, solutions, have secure capabilities to drag and drop their own data sets that are maybe more sensitive or information that they're not wanting to share with the public, but then having this sort of overall um, foundation that they can utilize for these different complexes and can understand the resources that they have on site. Um, and then finally, we also are doing these in virtual tour presentations. So we decided that um, in particular for flood and, and climate change kind of ap um, applications, things that are making change across a site like this, it's important to have condition assessment capabilities. 
And so um, when we survey, we're also doing it with 360 imagery um, and then bringing together the 3D data and the 360 imagery to provide sort of holistic um, views of each one of the complexes. And these are all just viewable, like you would take a um, real estate kind of tour on your, on your computer. Um, the managers are able to then do this for the sites themselves and kind of go in and, and look and see what was happening at the site at that time and where they are within the site. It can be a very useful kind of management tool, but also very useful for things like um, uh, broader impacts kinds of, of things that are emerging from our projects uh, that in particular, since we're a university, you know, bringing this into curriculum and bringing this into um, library digital collections is also uh, a real uh, goal and thing that we're striving to make multiple uses of the same types of data that we're collecting. Um, and everything that I shared here today is not just me. I want to say that um, we have a team that has collaborated on this, including a lot of members of uh, both the natural and cultural uh, resource groups at the um, installation and then um, receiving funding from uh, the Argonne National Laboratory um, in particular for a lot of the projects that I've shown and, and special thanks to them. Um, and I'd be happy to take any questions or, or respond to anything through the um, Q&A. And thank you very much for having me present. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Collins, for a very informative uh, presentation. And if you have any questions go to Dr. Collins, you can uh, send in a Q&A uh, card. So I would like to invite uh, Han Quan Shei. Uh, he is the Vice President of uh, Water and Heritage. Uh, Hank, uh, place is yours. Um, Hank, I think you are muted. You know? Yes, yes. Sorry. Okay. If, if My name is Hank van Schaik, and yeah, I, um, I'm a water engineer. I started working with Heritage in 2012 at the invitation of Diedrich Six. And uh, the uh, theme we are working on is uh, water and heritage connecting past with present and future. Uh, can I move the, how do I move the pictures? Uh, I think we can, we can do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So the title of your event is um, Expect Unexpected Floods. And I added also droughts. Can you move my thing? The next one, please. Um, now, looking at extremes, I came, I also worked on the world of water and climate change in particular. And I'd just like to add a few words on that one to say a few words. This is an extreme which happened in 2011 in, in Germany. It was an absolutely extreme uh, amount of water rain which came down and it completely took away a, an old, a very old city. Uh, we also saw some examples already with Rohit, uh, similar pictures in the Himalayas. Um, now these are, please next one. These are examples of uh, floods which are absolutely beyond what we as engineers take as being a part of our control. So what you see here is a curve and it shows that we as engineers, we design our structures uh, within boundaries. And uh, we also assume, and that's very important, we sh assume um, that um, say precipitation, but also runoff has a normal distribution. That's what you see here, a normal distribution. And what we do is we cut off the ends of the normal distribution. Um, and we consider that as being beyond our 
structures, the control of our structures. And that beyond is actually called disaster. So everything in between the vertical lines is what we can control with our dams, with our buildings, etc. And beyond is called a disaster. Now, the picture you saw before, the village or the, the city, was taken out completely because it was way beyond the control, controlled, uh, say, through uh, design parameters um, structures. The next one. And what is now the impact of climate change? Climate change, next one. Climate change implies that the normal, what we see here, distribution of floods or uh, rainfall, etc. Next one. And the design criteria, next one. That normal distribution changes. And what you see here is that there also, because it changes, the design criteria are not anymore applicable in the sense that the extremes are increasing both on the on, on both sides, um, and the extremes are and the, and the structures are not able to cope with the new uh, say um, distribution pattern of rainfall or water, etc. So that just as a background. So what it means is that we are sitting with the structures which were not designed for conditions which we are facing. Uh, in the future. And now what can we do with these structures which are not designed for, say, futures? Next one. Yeah, next one. I call it, it's actually, uh, you know, preparing for a fight which you are actually not prepared for. Uh, and that which you know is going to, to be quite uh, yeah, serious. And I took Cassius Clay, a boxer who fought uh, Sony Liston in the, I think it was 70s or something. What did he do to prepare? What should we do with our uh, structures to prepare for changing, uh, say, what we call towards unstation, unstationarity, to change away from the stationarity principle? Uh, what do we do? First of all, we have to prepare ourselves that we accept that we are able to accept and also recover from extremes. For example, a building, we should prepare with, for example, uh, guidelines, how to deal with an extreme which is coming towards us. Uh, we have to be um, elastic. We have to be able to recover from the uh, blows uh, quickly. And that means that you have to have your teams to clean up the mess and all, all, all that sort of thing. The second one is we have to prepare to be robust. So when it comes to buildings, one has to prepare to, to, to maybe strengthen the walls or in, in our country, the Netherlands, we have to build up higher dikes, etc. And the third one, we have to try and dodge the blows. And that means we have to divert. If there is a, an unexpected flood, we have to divert around the building or away from the building with maybe ditches, etc. So that just as a sort of little introduction on um, yeah how to deal with uh, with changing climate, with situations which are not stationary anymore. Next one, please. By the way, I thank you for inviting me to be here because I'm talking from, as I said, a water management perspective and thinking about the importance of um, say also heritage for adaptation and mitigation. So it's a, a little different perspective. Uh, and we started with this uh, discussion on the importance of heritage, the significance of heritage, material governance, and also spiritual, the, the, the significance of that heritage. We started talking about that in 2012, when we organized a conference in Amsterdam titled um, water and heritage, protecting deltas, heritage helps. It can help. It's not only about protecting heritage against the impact of floods, but heritage can also help mitigation and adaptation. And this is the statement of Amsterdam. So next one, please. Um, now this um, idea of bridging water-related heritage with the future, 
connecting it to the future as an aid, as a help, actually came up because in the Netherlands, nine out of 12 heritage sites are actually water related. But when asking water people like myself at that time in 2012, what is the significance of this heritage for water management challenges today? Many people say, we don't know. Because we look towards the future. We don't consider really the past. And my colleague, Diederik Six, he, as a restoration architect, he found that in the heritage world, often people do not consider the future. They are focusing on more on protecting and conserving the past. So that the mission which we, at that time, for ourselves, the two of us, uh, defined was how can heritage also help serve the future, future challenges. Next one, please. Uh, now, this work, which started in 2012, led up to the International Scientific Committee on Water, which was established in 2022 as a probationary uh, committee. Next one, please. And as you see, the most important is to provide water managers with research-based evidence about the significance of water-related cultural heritage to enhance water, sustainable water management. So the outlook is actually not going into the heritage towards water, uh, water professionals. Next one. Uh, and have the significance of water-related heritage acknowledged as an essential contribution to water-related sustainable development. Next one. Save the significance also, obviously it's ECOMOS, we have to save water-related cultural heritage recognized to the progression towards fully achieving the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Then the next one. And develop the narrative that's very important to make water people understand the narrative of the significance and conservation of water-related cultural heritage for the future through cooperation with water professionals. That's very important. We seek bridges. It's about bridge building with the water sector, you can say. This is actually the in, in Sydney, yeah, uh, the General Assembly. OK, next, please. Now, our audience, you can say, is very much the water world. And that's why we went to the United Nations 2023 Water Conference, the second ever. The first was, one was in 1977 in Mar del Plata. And we organized, parallel to this uh, big UN conference, uh, sessions in collaboration with the SDG Working Group and also the IC on the Water Heritage. Um, we organized session a, a conference. We organized a, a ceremony in Central Park. We had a session with youth, and we also had a session for children. But at the UN Water Conference, very important. Our audience is in the water world. Next one. Um, now, looking at ICOMOS, um, there are two thematic studies. No, sorry, this is about the UN Water, um, say, paradigm. In 2021, the um, United Nations uh, Water Development Program published um, a, a document called Valuing Water. And this concept, Valuing Water, is very important uh, for the water world. Um, and um, there is also a conceptual framework for making better uh, decisions on the impacts of water and impacting water. And when one reads these documents, despite our efforts to get heritage into it, there is very little or no, nothing about cultural heritage. Very much is about natural heritage, ecosystems, but cultural heritage is only mentioned once, and that's a reference to our book, our publication. Next one. And this underlines, underscores the, say, ignorance or maybe not understanding of water uh, it, including the UN, uh, the relevance of uh, water-related heritage for today and tomorrow. Now, looking at water-related um, heritage, 
Uh, we distinguish water services, which is drinking water, irrigation, etc., uh, from waterscapes. Rohit talked about uh, a lot about the waterscapes. Um, then the next one is about waterways, canals, and also um, the say uh, ports and etc. Um, and then we talk about water for power, say like uh, dams and uh, hydro, etc. And the last one is water visions. Water visions is the inspiration, the, the religions, the Aboriginal uh, spiritualities, etc. cetera. Um, and across all of them, it's not mentioned, but is the governance, uh, the governance dimension or the governance domain. So we are talking about a, a material domain, the structures, a governance domain, and a spiritual domain. Next one, please. Now, in New York, at the UN Water Conference, we submitted a recommendation uh, to initiate a what we call water culture and heritage platform, uh, where uh, and the mission is to develop partnerships um, and narratives at national and also international level on the significance of water-related heritage for water management um, challenges. Um, and that, again, as I said, material governance and spiritual. And also to go towards, uh, say, guidelines and policy um, recommendations, etc. cetera. Um, and then eventually, if uh, summarizing it, the idea is to go towards cultural heritage services, such as there are also ecosystem services provided by IUCN, to the water um, management, uh, uh, say, uh, um, institutions, and also such as there are climate services for water managers. Next one. Now, on the um, yeah, uh, point of, and what, uh, what type of services, what type of structures or systems are we talking about? Well, the first one, uh, and I'm talking with Pau and also other people, is on the uh, importance of terraces. And these are centuries old, millennia old often in Asia. There are many also World Heritage sites, uh, like in uh, Philippines or in uh, Peru or in Indonesia or Nepal, etc., India. Terraced irrigation is uh, an agriculture all over the world, this is Ribera Sacra in Spain. Uh, these are uh, systems which are also not only important for their cultural heritage value, but they are also providing livelihood to many people. And yet in the water related discussions, in water conferences, one never hears about them. It's never mentioned the importance of these structures and often in, for example, uh, because of the population or because of low production, uh, low efficiency, many of these sites are threatened by degeneration and, and uh, depopulation, etc. So uh, this is a very concrete example, I think, and uh, what we are uh, say promoting is to have a global study made on the importance of uh, these terrorist irrigations as cultural heritage, and not necessarily recognized heritage, but also unrecognized heritage, but still heritage for livelihood. Um, a second um, theme is uh, waterways. Uh, many, many cities all over the world are uh, built around or near water. Um, and uh, these uh, structures, uh, which, which are often age old, uh, centuries old, like for example, in Amsterdam, um, they are, um, many of them are heritage, uh, but also many of them are being, uh, yeah, are degenerating. And we recognize, we, we, we encourage the, uh, say, development of, um, or, or the recognition of these structures as heritage also for people's livelihoods. Millions of people depend on these uh, structures, but it's not being discussed in, again, in, uh, in my world, the Water World International Conferences as a, as, a, as a theme. Another one is Kanat Systems, which is an underground uh, 
sort of channeling system in particularly in arid areas for agriculture, but also drinking water coming from Iran. Um, about uh, a million or more people depend on it, um, but many of them are falling into disrepair because of deep boreholes, etc. And the last one is small hydropower. Again, many, many uh, say, uh, uh, in, uh, structures are around the world. It's also very much spread in India and all over the world, in Europe, in, in America. Uh, but many of them are falling into disrepair or being neglected or sometimes even being broken down uh, because they are seen as obstructions for fish migration. And uh, there are obviously examples or possibilities to, uh, say, circumvent the, uh, the, the, the dams, which are there to, um, to, to hold water for, the, for these um, mills. But um, yeah, ecological guidelines, including in, the, in, in Europe, the European water guideline, uh, when strictly implemented, um, you know, just make the uh, dams to be, uh, to, to, to break them away. So we say also this one should be given uh, attention in the form of a thematic study to overcome the, yeah, sometimes controversial uh, interests between water in this case and uh, natural or environmental uh, objectives. Next one, please. Uh, so on the ICOMO side, there are um, two thematic studies, um, and one is on the uh, Mediterranean, uh, old structures, water, including the Canats, for example. Uh, and the second study is on South and Southeast Asia. Or east and uh, east and southeast Asia on the monsoon uh, regions countries. Uh, they are compilations of, in particular, the second one of uh, about fifteen countries uh, cases in uh, China, Philippines, Thailand, Indonesia, Japan, Taiwan, etc. Um, and they are here the written by uh, Professor Michel Cotte. Um, and he talks about the notion of living heritage. Um, I say here that he does not talk about livelihood, but in fact, it's not true. I, I read it again, and he does mention livelihood. But our position in the ISC water is that livelihood maybe should be given more attention because it uh, and also quantitatively to show uh, in thematic studies the importance of um, for example, uh, terrorist irrigation uh, for the for millions of people. Next one, please. Um, now, in the Netherlands, um, we are looking at um, heritage, um, also um, by uh, from the perspective of uh, reuse and redevelopment, um, including in connection with climate change. So next one. And that is also about adaptation. Um, and for that, the Minister of Culture has um, put up a subsidy fund to um, yeah, reuse and to rehabilitate uh, sites in particular. Here you see a what's called a, mill, a water mill site uh, and it's not about the water mill itself, but also Rohit was all talk, already talking about the ensemble of uh, the, say, structure or, or the icon uh, in, uh, in a landscape. And here we see a water mill landscape, which benefits from this subsidy to be, re, to be made, to, to refit it, um, say, for uh, number one, uh, climate change. Huh? It has an, a, a possibility to retain water. Uh, it also has a has uh, the uh, capacity to generate a, a little bit of, a, say, uh, electricity. So indeed, it's uh, refitting, one can say, heritage to make it fit for, say, today and tomorrow for water uh, management challenges. Next one. Uh, and the next step, apart from, re say, reusing uh, 
uh, say locations, uh, the next step is to develop guidelines. Uh, and this is a guideline which is developed for streams and for brooks and for water mill landscapes. And that can be used for, say, uh, you know, at national level, it's being used now to, uh, to refit <laughs> brooks. Thank you very much. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. And I would like to invite the professor Milos uh, Tordaski. Uh, he is from International Scientific Committee on Analysis and Restoration of Structures of Architecture. This is yours, Milos. Hello. Well. I need to see my screen. Sorry, this is you, not me. <laughs> Sorry. Share screen. Oh, wow. Sorry, I don't, I don't, I don't eat, see it. It's okay. If you go out from your you. Milos, at the bottom of your screen, do you see a ribbon with the, it should say share screen in the middle? It's in green color.
Is there anything we can do to help you? Yeah, I see it now, but I don't see see you. I... Milos, if you like, you can send your uh, presentation to us. Then uh, we can uh, share your screen. I uh, I have opened it, yeah, but uh, the view is here. Okay. I don't see the sharing now. It's on the bottom of the screen. It's the green one. With the yeah, I know, I know, I know, but uh, I don't see it. You know, Sorry. Problem. <laughs> this is the problem. <laughs> that I, well, you know, do you have your Zoom screen open all the way? I hope so, yeah. Like, you, do you see a ribbon on the bottom that says, you know, where your uh, microphone uh, and your... Yeah, yeah, no, I, unfortunately not. I don't know why. Uh, maybe full screen, if you... Uh, push the button on the corner to full screen, then you will be able to see it. Full screen, yes. Yeah. Full screen. Okay. Now, you see my screen now? No. Now, now. Full screen and then go across the bottom, and you see a green thing that says share screen. Uh, now you should screen. You should see it. No. No. Is is it working? The green uh, but button on the top uh, on the bottom. No. Okay. And if it's okay for you, you can send your presentation. Then we can share for you. You can send us a mail. I don't know why I can open it. Well, now? Does it work? No. Wow. I don't know. Ah, uh, okay. Someone is warning us that some uh, sometimes is not at the bottom but uh, at the top. Could you please check the top of your page screen? Maybe it's in there. Yes. Is it yes. okay? Yes, we yes, yes, we see your screen. Okay. Yeah? Yes. Okay. So now you if see you put, it? Yeah, if you if, if you go to the presentation mode, maybe now or, you, see, you see it now? Yes, yes, we see. It's okay. Okay, okay. So sorry. It's so, okay, no, no, no problem. So hello, hello. Any natural or man-made disaster <laughs> is very painful for society and individuals and brings much suffering and material damage or losses. However, the path to a resilient cultural heritage begins at the moment of an event. If we understand disaster as an unplanned experiment, it becomes a source of very valuable information for the design and adoption of measures to prevent or reduce, as well as treat the consequences. It is therefore one of the important tasks of every disaster to collect and study data on its causes, intensity, and impacts in all spheres of the functioning of society. Special attention 
must be paid to identification of deficiencies and errors which increase the damage. Creating a map of the damage area is also important for subsequent damage removal and renovation planning. Today, mapping is facilitated by laser scanning tools and the use of drones as uh, was shown uh, in the previous presentations. In the area of risk management, detailed knowledge of endangered entities, including their quality, status, and evacuation options is essential information and must be investigated. This also presupposes detailed knowledge of access and evacuation routes, the readiness of spaces for the gathering of affected persons or the storage of relocated artifacts. It is also necessary to anticipate the occurrence of obstacles caused by disasters that may make transport impossible, for example, inundation of roads or bridges. Close cooperation with citizens and property owners in emergency situations requires the best possible communication, providing early warnings, instructions already or available help from professionals and rescue teams. Architecture heritage, historical infrastructure and objects of art are subjected to various forces and actions during flood events often not usually considered in the design of structures. The causes of damage can be categorized according to the types of impacts that they can cause. The categorization helps to develop preventive, protecting, or remedial measures. The following types of loads or actions are typical in flood situations. Horizontal static pressure of raised water creates loads proportional to the height of the water. It can damage or even destroy long freestanding walls, basement walls, retaining walls, or shutters of building openings. Upward hydrostatic pressure. Hear me, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, the slides are not moving. Sorry? Uh, your slides, they're not moving. We are still uh, seeing the opening page. Uh -huh. It doesn't move? No. Oh. Oh. Uh -huh. I don't know what can be the problem. You see, I, but you see the screen, the full screen. Uh, not the full screen. But uh, what we see is uh, the main uh, window of your PowerPoint, but not the presentation mode. Uh. You can click on slideshow to, to have the presentation mode. It's on the bottom of your, of your window. Do I have it on the ball? What do you mean? I can stop sharing. Milos, are you using two screens? No. Okay. I only I only see, of course, okay. I only see the uh, the gallery, but uh, full screen at the gallery. I don't know what is the problem. Sorry. Stop sharing. Stop sharing. Share screen again. I don't see it. No? Yes. You don't see, see it now. Sorry? You don't see. You don't it doesn't move. It now doesn't. it's perfect. Moves or not? It's perfect. Okay. So. So I stopped somewhere here. Well, I spoke about the loads. Yes. The upward hydrostatic pressure raises all movable objects in interiors and typically unhinges doors 
raises floors, roofs, and whole objects, decreasing their stability against overturning. It may also cause water penetration through sewerage systems into areas protected by vertical flood barriers. It facilitates relocation of wooden structures or buildings and massive transport of soil or sand. Velocity water stream actions, especially dynamic high velocity streams, can have an extremely dangerous impact on structures. They typically damage the banks of river ways or channels and are responsible for most of the severe damage to bridges and also to earth structures. Wave impacts are typical for sea storms or river flash floods and they can destroy or displace whole structures and objects. Dynamic impacts of floating objects mainly endanger bridges and other objects inside or close to river channels. Water penetrating through particulate media can wash out fine particles and cause remarkable compacting and subsidence. Further subsoil condition changes may initiate several types of failures like collapse of retaining structures, landslides or debris flow due to a change in groundwater level. Full immersion into water accompanied by saturation of materials causes a wide variety of actions and damage related to volumetric changes, chemical actions, and loss of strength. According to the sensitivity of heritage objects to flood loadings or actions, a scale ranking the object resistance has been designed. Five grades of objects we use and they include flood resistant structures and buildings, structures made of materials with a high volumetric change due to moisture, structures made of materials that lose their strength to a great extent when subjected to moisture, structures susceptible to partial damage due to flooding, and structures and elements vulnerable to overall collapse or displacement. Each category is described with characteristic features and examples of typical damage accompanied with the example of objects. For example, F2 category features materials fast degrading and losing their mechanical characteristics due to high moisture of water saturation, which induces significant reduction of load carrying capacity of structural elements or subsoil and may cause fatal failures during flood or after it. Dried brick masonry, masonry of burnt bricks with sensitive stones with clay mortars, decay timber structures and element, infill subsoil and fine particle subsoil are representative of this category. Preventive measures and priorities are then associated with the above ma ma uh, mentioned ranking with typical general features. For the robust objects, no hard measures are necessary only recommended preparedness facilitating cleaning and drying after the flood. For the volume change sensitive materials, prevention of contact with water. In the water weakening materials, critical structural elements require assessment of their load carrying capacity by professionals, and the structures usually need temporary supports or permanent strengthening before flood situations. And evacuation of movable objects is recommended. Where the situation and financial resources are low, it is advisable to use territorial protection by means of mobile or stable flood protection barriers. In order to engage and enable an active participation of stakeholders in preventive risk reduction strategies, especially of non-technical users of cultural heritage assets, such as owners and managers, it is necessary to provide them with user-friendly, accessible, and comprehensive methods for vulnerability evaluation. Therefore, the novel concept of criticality was developed and introduced. Criticalities are defined as factors or aspects of a system with cultural heritage values, decisive for survival and recovery in the face of natural disaster and other global threats. They represent a more delicate scale of vulnerability assessment. Critical elements and parameters can be modified with suitable measures, interventions, or actions that improve the resilience of the system. Criticalities are hence measurable and controllable. 
The methodology proposed considers two main groups of criticalities which characterize cultural heritage systems. Managerial criticalities relate to those aspects which are not connected to the physicality of the cultural heritage asset, but rather to their operation, administration, and care. Managerial criticalities include the following categories. Information concerning cultural heritage objects, funding availability and accessibility, knowledge and awareness, cultural heritage management planning and policy and regulation. Examples of managerial criticalities are the lack of knowledge of information, negligence, lack of maintenance, energy decision-making, poorly designed emergency or post-disaster plans, missing funds, and similar. Each material uh, managerial uh, critical element aspect is strongly context-specific and requires an accurate assessment and thought prioritization in order to reduce the risks related to natural or man-made hazards and improve the resilience of the overall cultural heritage system. Physical criticalities uh, relate to the aspects of a cultural heritage system involving its actual material composition and structural conditions. The sensitivity of historic structures and structural elements to disasters is influenced by material and structural capability to resist exceptional loads and environments during disastrous situation. Also, physical critical elements are significantly context specific and require a thorough investigation of material characteristics and the general environmental situations for example, hydrogeologic conditions, before being adequately evaluated. It should be emphasized that there exists a wide range of historic structures and materials, and also a wide range of types of damage. This makes it difficult to design widely applicable measures and unified methods. Experience from natural disasters shows that the extent of loss and damage is highly dependent on the condition of buildings and structures. Poor quality and neglected maintenance of buildings reduces their ability to withstand destructive forces. Structures and buildings usually do not have instruction manuals and maintenance schedules. Successful preventive protection requires developing such tools and making them available to stakeholders. The maintenance action is usually initiated as a result of the regular inspection, or it can be carried out really regularly on a basis of maintenance plans, which is a better and recommended standard approach. The maintenance action, in most cases, does not need design work or even an engineering supervision. It can rely only on skills of proper, properly trained craftsmen which substantially shortens the time to action and prevents development of a defect into a more serious damage or even a failure. A maintenance guide is a useful tool and should combine tips for inspection with recommendations how to fix and identify problem. It is the follow-up activity to remedy the identified deficiencies that is the most important, mere knowledge of defects and weaknesses without remedying them as quickly as possible does not bring the desired benefit. The concept of resilience indicates the ability of a community or urban unit to withstand shocks to its survival and to absorb changes without a transition to a different state. In other words, resilience represents the capacity of a system or object structure to absorb disturbances and reorganize while undergoing under the effects of change, so as to while retaining essentially the same function, structure, identity, and feedbacks. Three aspects of resilience are involved in response to disasters, and all are important for cultural heritage, physical resilience, refers to the ability of a city or community to rebuild its physical structure. Emotional resilience refers to the ability of individuals, families, and communities to cope with and heal or recover from trauma. And cultural resilience signifies the perseverance of cultural practices and norms through events of great cultural trauma. 
Disaster affects many buildings, as well as a large variety of movable family heritage, requiring the involvement of owners in effective resilience preparedness. Such an approach entails providing them with adequate supporting information and sources of advice. Therefore, it is believed that manuals for condition self-assessment and for the adoption of appropriate actions before, during, and after any disaster will help to reduce damage and loss from it. Self-assessment and enhanced resilience methodology is based on the identification and modification of manageable or steerable critical elements in a system. As already mentioned, the critical elements in system with cultural heritage values are understood as factors or aspects uh, which are decisive for the survival and uh, recovery of the, of the system. Such elements can be modified with suitable measures, interventions or actions that improve the resilience of the system. Guiding manuals should classify criticalities into three groups depending on the type of situation in which the assessment is carried out. Site criticalities, building criticalities, and movable heritage criticalities, including family heritage. Each criticality should be dealt with on an individual page of a manual and the following data or information provided. Hazard or disaster scenarios relevant to the criticality, criticality description, typical damage or failed cause due to presence of the criticality in relation to the given hazard, possible measures for improving resilience, which can be feasibly implemented in different phases of a disaster before, during, and after it. Each measure should be labeled using a color code, characterizing its mode of applicability, measures that can be performed by the owners themselves, measures that require the involvement of skilled labor, and measures that require professional engineering or conservationist assessment prior to implementation. Such manuals should be used in the preliminary vulnerability assessment of cultural heritage assets and should be employed as a reference material. However, they can help to accelerate the identification and repair of criticalities that may lead to damage during emergency situations. They further prevent losses due to the inappropriate treatment of cultural heritage assets affected by disasters. Special attention was paid to movable monuments and family cultural heritage as they represent the groups most at risk during floods. The manuals are available on the web in eight European languages. The manual is supplementary to the institutionally provided civil protection tools aimed at increasing the resilience of assets having cultural and historical value which are created by critical scenarios or have been hit by natural or man-made disasters. It is primarily intended for the owners, administrators, or users of such cultural heritage properties and objects, but also provides useful information and advice to citizens and institutions in crisis, especially civil protection rescue teams and their auxiliary units. The development support tools for behavior in risky situations must be understood and mastered by future users in the form of teaching and practical training. In the case of temporary technical means, this applies in particular to the erection of barriers or the installation of reinforcing elements by professional civil protection teams. Even in these cases, however, it is also necessary to train volunteers from endangered places. A training in the preparation of emergency plans and the use of stakeholder manual are particularly important. It is especially vital to learn about the possibilities of rescuing buildings or objects affected by a disaster, for example, flooding with contaminated water. Instructions and practical experience in the preservation of mobile cultural heritage help to preserve a considerable volume of family heritage uh, on paper or storage media. 
which often have a general social value. The presented methodology was practically tested during the danger of floods in Prague, and which is a monument inscribed on the World Heritage List. Thank you for your attention. I'm very sorry for the traumas I made. Uh, th thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, I would like to invite uh, Mario Imerich, and um, he is from International Scientific Committee on Water and Heritage. Place is yours. And I would like to remind the old presenters that we are sending a message for reminding your last five minutes. Uh, you can see from the chat box that uh, how much time you have. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation to participate in this event. Uh, hello to everybody from, from Barcelona, Spain. I'm going to share my screen. I don't know what, what it is. Yeah. Okay, so. Well, as you know, um, floods and in general, uh, natural disasters create a lot of uh, problems uh, and uh, and uh, consequences, economic and uh, human consequences. And uh, international institutions are very aware of, uh, of these problems. Uh, here I, I present only three examples. For instance, the OSC uh, has uh, repeatedly uh, said that it is necessary to strengthen the resilience of communities, states and regions against uh, natural disasters. For instance, the, um, the World Bank has estimated that only during 2023, uh, the cost, you know, the, 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 the economic cost of uh, natural disasters all around the world have been estimated of some 110 billion uh, US dollars. And uh, for instance, the, the uh, European Commission uh, has stated that uh, the most common and most costly natural disaster in Europe are related to floods. So the, the economic losses that floods generate are uh, very, very high, not only uh, because of the flood itself, but also uh, the, the, the fact that uh, a lot of pollutants are stored in the ground and the spread and then so on. So the fact is that let's say international community is very aware about the problem and the consequences, the particular the economic consequence that uh, floods generate. Um, just to, re to remind that um, when a natural disaster happens, uh, there are three uh, has three episodes that, that can, be, uh, can be done. First is the rescue. The rescue uh, is something that has been done by specialized bodies like the Red Cross, or, uh, or, or civil uh, protection institutions, uh, fire uh, men and so on. And this is usually uh, covered through donations from different institutions. The second step is the reconstruction, the reconstruction which is related to the mitigation of the effects of the, of the disaster. And uh, this, of course, is after uh, the, the rescue is done and the, the the effects of the of the disaster are more or less uh, covered. And finally, it's necessary to prepare the uh, the, the different buildings, the, the, the population, etc., to prevent uh, future uh, uh, natural disasters. And this is what is the risk management or the adaptation to to the to the system. But but for for any in any case in any case is necessary to uh, mobilize some funding resources, and the funding resources are channelized through the international financial institutions. And this is the let's say the object of my of my presentation. 
um, just to remind that uh, the donations uh, can, can come from different institutions, for instance, the European Union Solidarity Fund, uh, the Australian and New South Wales uh, government, the USA uh, administration, and so on. But, uh, but donations that IFIs, the national financial institutions, do not give grants, do not give donations. They give usually the most common uh, for in, um, product is loan, is uh, loans. What is an, an international financial institution? It's a multilateral institution that has been created by different uh, governments. Uh, the shareholders and the owners are usually national governments, uh, although some other institutions can be also part of the shareholders of these international institutions, financial institutions. Um, most of them uh, have been created by, by multiple nations and multilateral, but there are some examples of bilateral institutions. That is, this means that it's an institution that belongs to a certain country and uh, works uh, in, in collaboration with, with, the, with the recipients of the, of the loans. Uh, the best known uh, IFI is the World Bank and the uh, uh, international um, uh, <coughs> funding in, uh, institution, but there are many other institutions around the world. This is a list of, let's say, the most uh, the most known: um, uh, the European Investment Bank, the uh, the World Bank, the, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the Inter-American Development Bank, the African Development Bank, the Asian Development Bank. The Banco de Desarrollo de América Latina, the Council of Europe Development Bank, the Bank of Central America and Interaction Economic, and many others. Uh, let's say smaller. The biggest uh, one is the uh, European Investment Bank and the World Bank. Uh, but the others, are, but, but the list here is uh, are the most uh, significant ones. And also, there are some uh, international bilateral agencies that I mentioned before, like the Agencia Española de Cooperación Internacional, or the Agence Française de Diplomat, or the uh, KFW from Germany, but uh, there are also other uh, bilateral institutions that also work in, uh, in this field. Uh, when dealing with uh, an international financial institution, it's important to understand what is called the project side. A project uh, comes to the to, to, to institution through a proposal, a proposal from somebody that wants to finance a certain project, either for the reconstruction or for the uh, um, adaptation of uh, certain areas, certain buildings, certain uh, whatever, uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to prevent the effects of the, uh, or to mitigate the effects of the natural disaster. So when the proposal is, is let's say, accepted by the, by the bank, then it's carried out an appraisal, an appraisal that uh, uh, considers a lot of different aspects related to the proposal. After this, uh, the, the proposal is approved by the different mem uh, uh, decision-taking uh, committees uh, in the bank, and then a signature uh, for the for the for giving the loan is is signed between the bank uh, and the, the corresponding uh, recipient, the borrower. Afterward, uh, afterwards, uh, the disbursements of the, the money uh, are according to the necessities of the of the project, and and of course, it's necessary to carry out some monitoring and, and regular reporting about the uh, progress of the works. And finally, when the uh, the project is completely is completely finished uh, in a successful way, the repayments of the loan have to be done over over the years, um, usually long term uh, periods, uh, twenty or even thirty years. Um, it is important to understand that the, because projects are very very different and uh, the needs of for the projects are also very different. The uh, the uh, international financial institutions uh, 
need to receive a comprehensive uh, study with uh, all the different elements that that uh, completes the, the, the project. So the project, the project promoter, at the end of the day, is the day, uh, is the borrower of the, to the institution, should provide sufficient information to allow the, the, uh, the bank to, to assess to whether the project adheres to these lending objectives and uh, is, is, is acceptable uh, under uh, its uh, business plan. So at the end of the day, the uh, the 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 appraisal uh, process has to look at many different aspects, as I said before. For first of all, uh, the technical aspects: uh, what is the solution that is proposed? Is this solution acceptable? Is it reasonable? It uh, is according to international practice, etc. Of course, what is the impact on the environment that the solution will have? Uh, looking at uh, different uh, elements that uh, conform the environmental impact of the project. Uh, of course, the social and gender impact is, is, is very important. In particular, in, uh, let's say, developing countries, this is an element that is uh, absolutely crucial in order to prevent uh, bad, bad practices uh, and so on. Uh, the sustainability and the risk of, uh, of, of the project. So to what extent the project uh, has some, uh, let's say, technical or financial risk that has to be tackled. Uh, of course, the, uh, the project has to be economically viable in terms that, uh, that uh, the investment that is, uh, is uh, related to the project has to provide some benefits uh, to the to the society. So, society. so in this case, uh, the typical uh, tool that is used uh, for evaluating this uh, viability is a cost-benefit analysis. But there, but there, but there are other tools like uh, multi-criteria analysis and so on. Uh, another aspect that has to be uh, analyzed is the financial viability of the projects. So this is not only the benefits that the that the project will give to the to the society, but also to what extent uh, the project can generate enough uh, incomes or revenues to repay the loan uh, for the bank. And, uh, and there are also some other institutional elements uh, in order to, uh, to understand to what extent the promoter is, uh, is, is uh, capable to implement the project and so on, what are the, the the plans for, for the implementation in terms of time and so on. And uh, on the other hand, it's also necessary to understand what should be the, uh, the production, uh, uh, the outcomes and so on. And finally, it is uh, also important to look at the political environment of the project in order to be sure that uh, it will be successful and not subject to, let's say, political uh, hazards. So just to, to give you a very short uh, uh, view of the uh, European Investment Bank, which is the, the biggest multilateral lender in the world, even more, even bigger than the, the, the World Bank. Uh, the, the EIB is an in European institution in which I've been uh, working for 20 years just uh, let's say appraising projects in many different many different sectors the uh, DIB usually appraise uh, some uh, 400 year projects per year in many countries even the uh, 90 percent of uh, its activity is in Europe geographically uh, uh, understood it's not only the European uh, members of the European Union but also the Balkans and so on um so the uh, total lending in 22 was around 65 billion euros and this is the more or less the standard uh, level of activity that the bank maintains uh, over the last uh, last years so um actions that uh, have been related to 
natural disaster projects, for, 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 of course. Uh, there are projects that deal with post-disaster reconstruction, this means mitigation, uh, flood risk, afforestation, erosion control, earthquake, risk mitigation, prevention of forest wind or wind fires, droughts, and coastal protection, broad uh, climate change. This means at the end of the day, adaptation to the to the uh, to the climate change through resilience actions. So the types of projects that are dealt by uh, by IFIs, not only the IB, but uh, the most of the IFIs I mentioned before, are uh, related to this kind of uh, action. So, in terms of uh, the pro the the products that IFIs offer, uh, and they are very different and very variated. So, uh, that can uh, comprise technical assistance, technical assistance related both to the preparation of the project and, all, and for the, the implementation of the project, helping uh, the authorities or the promoters uh, in order to uh, be successful during the implementation of the project, having uh, reaching a uh, quite quality at the end of the day. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a strategic development, project development, et cetera, et cetera. The main or the most uh, common product is uh, are loans, but the loans are many, uh, can have very different uh, uh, ways. Uh, loans for the public sector, uh, for, the, for the private sector, uh, what is called framework loans of the public sector, which are loans that uh, gather uh, small projects uh, in, a, in a in a in a big uh, in, in, uh, participation, or even intermediate loans for SMEs and mid caps, which uh, are uh, not uh, let's say capable to access directly uh, the finance uh, from a, from a big bank. On the other hand, uh, another product, financial product, uh, which is uh, uh, gaining a lot of uh, relevance in recent years are warranties. Of course, every loan needs to, to have a certain warranty depending on the nature of the borrower, on the nature of the project and so on. The, the, the warranties are, are different, but uh, there are some instruments that uh, help in the obtention and the uh, guarantee uh, the, uh, the, the loan for the project. And finally, there are other possibilities like participation in the equity of a certain project, which, which is uh, the common case in, uh, in SMEs or in uh, investment funds. Uh, so uh, when, when an investment fund is created, uh, a bank can participate uh, in, the, in, the, in the equity of this investment fund. So there are Again, a lot of different uh, products and a lot of different financial uh, instruments that can be used uh, and are tailored to the needs of every other project. Just to give you some, uh, some examples of recent projects uh, related to floods and in general natural disasters uh, by the uh, DIB, uh, this is a list, uh, it's just an example, it's not is not comprehensive, but uh, it just gives you the idea that uh, that uh, the uh, the bank is uh, financing a lot of projects in this in this area. So the, the fruit prevention and protection in Turkey, Rio Salado fruit protection in uh, in uh, in Argentina, fruit protection in uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, post disasters and climate change resilience in the Dominican Republic. Post disaster and reconstruction prevention in Valencia, in Spain. So, as you see, uh, they cover from uh, re from reconstruction to uh, prevention. Uh, other uh, other IFIs, not not necessarily the IB, also have uh, other projects uh, underway, like the hand and flood emergency rehabilitation uh, and recovery in China. Flood resilience and risk management in Indonesia, post flood reconstruction and building climate resilience uh, in Pakistan, um, 
public private partnership launch to develop an uh, urban risk urban flood risk uh, in uh, in Nigeria so um, again the uh, the, uh, the recipients of the of the of this uh, loans or these uh, financial institutions are not necessarily governments or let's say public institutions but also private institutions and even as you see in the last case uh, public private partnerships which i didn't mention before but uh, is also something that is coming uh, very very important in the in the uh, let's say in the financial uh, in the financial world as i said before uh, ifis also uh, give uh, technical assistance for the preparation of uh, risk strategies, risk assessment. So at the end of the, of the day, technical assistance for the preparation and the management of, of, of uh, uh, projects related to, to floods or, in this, or natural disasters in general. Uh, an example of this is this, uh, this uh, technical uh, assistance that is, is given uh, to prevent um, uh, water, uh, sea water uh, level uh, um, growth in, uh, in, uh, in, in Africa, in, in different uh, coastal cities in, uh, in different uh, countries in Africa. So it's not only a, a matter of uh, preventing the damages that can be, uh, can be done on the houses, but also to prevent um, uh, the uh, the, the, the expansion of uh, diseases like cholera or other uh, consequences uh, related to the inappropriate hygiene and sanitation um, uh, elements. So, um, also, it's uh, some uh, some actions are related to pure research. Uh, the fact is that uh, this is an, an example of a project that is carried out, is being carried out by the University of, of Connecticut, and is related to the uh, uh, problem of uh, sea level rise uh, in, the, in, the, in the coastal of, uh, of uh, Connecticut. And then uh, the, the, the purpose is to develop some tools for, uh, for the municipalities to prevent and to assess vulnerable infrastructure to inundation by the river flow. So, so uh, for instance, uh, the, uh, the European Investment Bank has an institute that is also financing research uh, in different in different areas, and also it has an agreement with uh, Europa Nostra uh, under a program which is called the Seven Most Endangered Sites in Europe that uh, try to uh, uh, praise uh, sites which are in danger. And for instance, two years ago, one of these uh, sites was Stolberg, a city in, uh, in Germany that was uh, uh, suffering a, 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 a flood. And now uh, the report is, is being prepared in order to explain what have been the consequences and how, how uh, these consequences can be can be uh, mitigated and, um, and repaired. And then, um, again, the, the last part of the report comprises uh, the identification of, so, of some uh, financial instruments that can be applied uh, for, the, uh, for this uh, concrete uh, project. So with this, I think that I have very, very briefly given you an idea about uh, what the international financial institutions can do in order to uh, mitigate and adapt uh, situations related to not only floods, but in general, uh, natural disasters. And uh, remember that, that uh, as you say, uh, looking at this uh, map, uh, the entire world is uh, in danger to be uh, affected by, by a flood. So uh, thank you very much for, for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Aymerich. Uh, it was a very useful presentation, especially for our members who have a 
uh, projects and looking for funding. And those who are interested can uh, get the detailed information from the chat box that Dr. Imerich provided. Thank you very much. So uh, I would like to uh, move to the next uh, colleagues, Victoria Pierce. Uh, she's from ECOMOS ECORP, International Scientific Committee on Risk Preparedness. Uh, place is yours, Victoria. Thank you, Zena. Uh, I'm still seeing the previous. Yeah, I think yeah, I think Mario, Mario, if you can stop sharing, and Victoria can start to share her screen. Thank you. Yeah, I'm trying. There we go. So uh, I'd like to thank everyone for the opportunity to present today. Um, I'm going to uh, look a little bit more closely at who the disaster stakeholders are. We often tend to gloss over this a little bit by, um, you know, recommending everyone engage with stakeholder engagement communities but we don't really often give good detailed advice about um, where one starts and how one proceeds with that. There's been some interesting lessons learned in the last couple of flood events out of Australia, uh, and especially for custodians of heritage households and sites, listed properties, and for museums with collections. So obviously for any organization that runs a, a heritage listed site, can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen clearly. Uh, okay. So for anyone who's uh, running an organization, we tend to think about, you know, our in-house team of our staff and maybe our volunteers maybe their extended network of family. And, and, and in the case of our volunteers, sometimes they may be members of other clubs or associations as well and volunteer in two places. It's uh, not uncommon, for example, for volunteers in our museum sector in Australia to also have family members who volunteer with the local fire brigade or community fire service. Um, and of course, there are also organizations with fire pumps, um, which also can double for uh, pumping water and doing drainage. So um, it's really great to be able to, um, important to have a look at what the capacity of your team actually is really very honestly. Um, particularly in terms of uh, what their responsible responsibilities are with their family and their uh, perhaps other caring responsibilities. Because if you're looking at a disaster plan for a site or an institutional museum or getting a site ready, you may need to um, rule some access for staff out because they have perhaps a a high needs, you know, sick person or elderly person at home and actually aren't able to, to help in a disaster response or in getting ready a, a property in an extreme weather event. Um, it's perhaps also what we discovered doing sort of surveys post events here in, in Australia was that um, because of sort of day-to-day -day security maybe one or two people have a key, but then um, in a disaster situation, there was always this really big concern about who could get to the site, who could actually action activities that had been planned or reach out to other staff members who had security codes to access buildings, that sort of thing. And um, mostly people also um, sort of said that they were really um, surprised at how 
you know, in a professional working life, um, all of those sort of uh, confidentiality issues go out the window and some of the questions and some of the things that um, you need to know about your staff and their capacity, their own personal health, et cetera, um, things that you don't normally uh, ask necessarily for privacy concerns suddenly become really important to actually know about. Like if you have a, a, a member on your team who's diabetic, uh, those sorts of things. And so it, it, I guess out of the, the survey, we sort of determined that there are a lot of perhaps difficult conversations that cross the barrier of what we would normally consider um, professional privacy that need to be shared when we're looking at protecting heritage sites because um, we have to be really honest about what people's capacity is. Um, and we need to um, be able to know whether they can, um, you know, uh, attend, whether they've got access to um, uh, transport, uh, certainly um, in fires and, and certainly some of the more remote areas, there are areas and bridges and, and places that we know are going to perhaps become impassable for first. And so you've got to be very honest about those staff members with the best of intentions. Everyone sort of says, oh, yes, I'll be here at the museum. I'll help protect it. I'll help, you know, put everything up on higher shelves, et cetera. But actually between where they live and where the museum is, we know that there's, you know, maybe waterways or bridges and, they, and they're not really able to. Um, and so that, you know, everyone says, yes, we want to be there. But then when the chips are down, sometimes it's just not possible. So um, the other thing that came up was uh, issues around the site. We often talk very broad brush about, uh, you know, uh, our heritage sites and our collections. But when it comes to an actual disaster, particularly flooding, there are things that become real hazards around the exterior of buildings, waste paper bins, solvent sheds, leakage of chemicals that may be in, in garden sheds, um, equipment that may be just left out that's not even a problem when you are um, on dry land, but when all of those things are immersed underwater, they become quite dangerous trip hazards or sharps or other um, problems that can cause injury. So um, things that perhaps have storage fuel, even fuel tanks that are may maybe even used for lawn mowers and things, those sort of leakages across water can become then a fire hazard and um, materials that are stored around the property can become very problematic when, when flooding occurs. Um, and so what we uh, really wanted to stress with our custodians of our museums and our uh, heritage sites is that a lot of those um, issues that might be around the site or building um, and even some areas of buildings, things like cellars, um, wells, other things that might become um, obscured if water level rise, uh, water levels rise may actually need to be checked with structural engineers now while everything's dry and that there are markers or at least posts and things so that you, you know, you can identify those um, hazards when things are underwater. Um, I just want to spend a little minute uh, talking about medical considerations for your team and your stakeholders. Um, often people uh, can be very, um, uh, you know, blasé about tetanus, for example, or they just assume that tetanus is uh, a anaerobic, you know, a, a bacteria that is just on metals. And I just want to stress that tetanus is an anaerobic bacteria which will flourish in any anaerobic environment. 
obviously corroding metal is anaerobic, but so is soil uh, flood from silt. And any scratch in particular puncture marks must be treated as a potential tetanus exposure. Something that I want to share from my personal experience is post COVID after um, being sick with COVID, um, I actually contracted tetanus, uh, even though I was fully vaccinated because my immune system was not able to um, uh, deal with an exposure event that happened from uh, with tetanus because the, um, the vaccine, just my immune system was not up to scratch because of the COVID. So if you know that you have stakeholders and first responders, it's really essential that uh, everyone has already had that tetanus vaccine. You know, it should be something that's kept in your staffing records. Um, the other thing uh, with first responders is to be very aware if someone has personal risks like asthma or pneumonia vulnerabilities from other uh, lung hazards. And there are a number of other waterborne um, vaccines that can be recommended for uh, high, flood, high flood risk areas, Japanese encephalitis, leprosporosis, which is really rife in flood water, is usually spread from um, fecal matter from rats. Uh, Salmonella and E. coli are also big issues with flood water. So it's really important for everyone to have some training as first responders about washing hands, having access to clean water, particularly cleaning hands and face before eating and drinking. Um, uh, when they are cleaning up sites, folliculitis is also another issue that happens with people who spend a lot of time waiting in floodwaters and often need medical attention and antibiotics. So if you uh, have responders with swelling, redness, or heat emanating from skin. They really need to be outside of the flood water. Um, another support for our responders to our heritage sites is actually teeing up mental health and trauma counselling for responders um, and being able to know that maybe there's even online services or um, phone services that can actually be provided even while an event's taking place, especially because uh, floodwaters in some areas can take a long time to subside. And so the trauma can be quite ongoing. In Australia, we have an additional concern and that is snakes. In actual fact, um, more people were admitted to hospital with snake bites from the floods in New South Wales, uh, in Lismore, than from any um, actual flood related injury because the snakes can pick up the vibrations of an object in the water where the water laps up against a person or a tree and the snake swims straight for it to climb up out of the water, which often means that they climb up on people and bite them, unfortunately, around the neck. So uh, the other stakeholders that can be engaged for uh, the better running of your organisation are community resource resources. As I said, there's a variety of vaccinations and things that might be good to organise before an event for staff, volunteers, and for volunteers' families. You know, if you're asking them to help you, it makes sense as an organisation to help them. Medical centres can provide good quality advice and information and um, provide all of the record keeping that's necessary to know that your responders are up to date. Emergency services, police, fire brigade and ambulance are obvious. But what we have found here is that engaging with those organisations well in advance of an event, they are now all, um, especially in rural and remote areas, having very complex and good digital systems so that if you raise particular vulnerabilities for your site or hazards at your site, um, the first responders and emergency services can be aware of those 
through many of the apps that they run and operate, enabling them to be more effective and more supportive for your organisation and heritage site. Um, we have, even in our business, as a heritage business, uh, got uh, sort of some of the hazards and chemicals that we have on site listed with the fire brigade um, a priori and they recommended uh, a particular um, security system that could be managed remotely that they also have access to so that they can see inside the building before entering and that uh, gives them better ability to respond promptly. Another companies that we found a lot of uh, that we forget as stakeholders can sometimes be local freight companies. They can provide um, vehicles and emergency storage. They can provide seasonal storage in high risk areas. Um, and even uh, for the more common uncommon disaster that people don't we don't tend to talk about very much, but things like um, insect infestations in museum collections. Uh, your local freight company can also provide commercial freezing. Um, in one uh, disaster that we responded to, we actually had insect infestations and the local morgue had a large freezer capacity to treat museum objects to kill all of the insects before they were returned to the building. Um, so engage with your community early and as part of core business and do it regularly. If there really are stakeholders, the relationships that you build in the good times are the investment um, that you have to make for, um, for, the, for them to really be uh, stakeholders and to care about your organisation and the community heritage um, that you care about. There are also a variety of corporate stakeholders and these are becoming quite problematic. Um, so a lot of our heritage, we talk about the heritage values and the community values, but for most of our heritage-based organisations, buildings, assets and collections, they're also businesses and tourism sites. So we engage as businesses with insurance companies and what we have found in some of the larger disasters that have happened uh, here in Australia is the insurance companies are more inclined to now send in teams of responders, excluding custodians and excluding paying any attention to a disaster plan or a triage plan that custodians have developed. And the insurance companies are here in Australia indicating more a desire to throw everything out because removal and disposal is cheaper than remediation, conservation and recovery. And this is becoming a very big obstacle for, um, for communities and for uh, responders, uh, particularly um, from smoke, soot, flood or hail damage. Um, it's really important to have a really good relationship with your insurance broker and insurance company because they are, and especially your broker, they're going to be able to help you go through the fine print and the loopholes that most insurance companies are very capable of wriggling out of. For example, flood may only be defined as water rising from a nearway waterway, but not if it has fallen or flooding has occurred from rain. The specific definitions of floods in policies are very, very slippery and are catching out a lot of heritage custodians who just kind of renew those policies without really staying up to date with what those policies mean for the organisations. And the other thing that we're seeing is, like I said, uh, insurance companies bringing in their own first responders. At the Australian National University, which had a serious flood in uh, 2022, um, 
The insurance companies brought in unskilled labour to clean out buildings and flood damaged collection areas within the university. And those first responders, some of them were 16 and 17. It was their first job. They were given a pair of gum boots and they made decisions about museum collections, Hellenic Roman artefacts, and basically said, if it's in a box, it must be important. We'll keep it. If it's not in a box, it's not important. We'll just throw it out. So these really, really arbitrary decisions were made completely to the exclusion of custodians. Workplace self safe officers um, can be really quite beneficial and run by um, state and city um, uh, councils and um, state governments. They often provide very proactive inspections so that they can help you with signage compliance, safety recommendations and evacuation guidelines. Um, so one of the things I want to sort of stress, stress is that um, as with any business that you are paying for the service, you are the client, find out what it is they d deliver for your fee. Do they send out assessors pre-disaster? Is it better to go through a broker? Is it better to partner with other neighbouring or community organisations to actually broker a bigger contract or a bigger insurance policy that covers a group or collective? Um, do they keep a response file of advice that you can give them so that they can respond if they're not going to allow custodians to respond or partake in the recovery? And will they advise you on the business risks? Because um, it really is in their interest in the good times to help with the training and the support to make sure things run smoothly if there is a disaster. Um, and will they also cover the insurance of artifacts and objects once they've been evacuated? So either moving objects, we found this with some um, museum collections, you know, first responders and custodians manage to box up collections and actually take them to higher ground. But from that point, they were completely outside of the building where they were insured and they no longer had any insurance. So um, those sorts of fine details of what happens when you go to evacuate a collection and um, and even if you are evacuating it to an evacuation centre, which may be the local school, can you put your, um, you know, movable heritage, family and community heritage in one of the classrooms and lock it? Will the policies to keep those things safe? Like if you're doing the responsible thing to prevent a claim, it seems a bit rough that they then don't cover you if something still goes wrong with those objects. So it's really important to have those conversations with the insurance brokers um, and the insurance companies, because if they're not willing to actually help you in the good times, you can guarantee they're not going to in the worst of times. Occasionally there's a need to um, really rely on subcontractors who can be very important uh, and those relationships, again, should be fostered in good times, maybe quarterly or at least every six months, talking with local electricians who may be able to provide emergency power generators, um, IT support very, very early on to make sure that your data, your, inf your, your um, inventories and catalogues and even your staffing records and vaccination records, all of those things that you need about your staff and your insurance policy and contacts, you know, all of those things need to be actually backed up and um, accessible. So having that subcontractor and IT support and those systems in place. And also if you are in the midst of a disaster, who has perhaps extraordinary access to some of those things that they would not normally have. Like they may be 
access to secure staff data, for example, that's only accessible to the director of an organisation normally, but in a disaster, perhaps it's more ne it's necessary to have a sort of a, a chain of custody of people who have access. Plumbers are really, really critical. Plumbers can be fantastic subcontractors to get on side, you know, engaging with your local plumber as a regular supplier and subcontractor um, means that when you give them the call and say, you know, we've got flooding in our museum, they can turn up with sandbags and emergency pumping equipment. And it's amazing how um, that can often prevent a lot of internal damage. Um, roofing contractors are absolutely essential to uh, engage with when things are good. Because if you have flooding as defined by rainfall or hail or snow and roof collapse and your insurer can prove that your roof has not been maintained, there's every possibility you will not have any insurance or any response. So um, having a good relationship with your roofing contractor and making sure that everything is in place is important um, to be able to, to show that you we're carrying out the due diligence to activate your policy. For us in Australia, our roofing contractors are absolutely key to being able to um, block gutters and to fill those gutters with water or sprinkler systems with a reticulation for fire prevention on our heritage sites as well. Um, but they are a contractor that we don't tend to think about um, more than probably every five to eight years. And in actual fact, it's good to probably have someone on the roof once every six months, particularly if your heritage site is mostly run by volunteers who may be elderly and, you know, when or multi-storey building where people are not getting onto the roof regularly. Um, there are regional industry partners such as allied organisations, other, um, other museums, gallery and sector alliances, organising shared community groups and sharing the, if you like, the, the IP and knowledge and preparation and links. Contacting local schools was one that um, was early identified um, because local schools often run fates and partner with fire departments and other stakeholders. And this is a place where you can do more volunteer recruiting. Local schools are often used as um, being the community evacuation center. So actually putting aside a space at a local school and communicating with them and saying, look, we just have one classroom to put our really important iconic community objects and to keep them safe, to have that safekeeping place identified where you know that everyone in the town is going to be evacuated to and therefore these iconic objects um, can also be protected um, is really smart. Scouts and guides and other organisations with, you know, kids can be really fantastic in helping clean up around the exterior of buildings and sites and rubbish removal before a disaster, obviously not during or post, but engaging kids, barbecues, having families come, have open days and activities and organizing those sorts of things has um, the community engaging with your site and then being really concerned about helping to protect that heritage and, um, and do what they can to even fundraise, which is really important. So we do a lot in the heritage sector for training and preparedness. But one of the things that we might not think about is using our skills to help apply those skills in um, preparation, disaster planning to the homes and houses in the region for our staff and volunteers. Because if their homes and houses are safe, they're more likely to be able to leave their home and house knowing that it's secure and to be able to put hands on deck at our heritage sites. 
by running tutorials together with our volunteers and our stakeholders. Um, we can actually also use our locations to bring experts to our museums, to our heritage sites, and bring the community to those sites and, um, and be able to have our uh, responsibilities on the whole community radar um, very, very early and, again, in those good times so that there's um, extra assistance in the bad times. Um, Organising leave and staff availability much earlier than in other industries. So particularly around peak hazard seasons, here in Australia, summer obviously runs over Christmas and that can be a very high risk period for our heritage facilities and historic buildings because everyone's on holiday, everyone's away. If a bushfire comes through, there's no one to prepare the property. Really talking, uh, honestly, I'm it's sorry really to interrupt. Uh, right now we have exceeded your speech time by eight minutes. So Okay, thanks. Thank you. So our next speakers are Aparna Tandon and Mohona Chakrabuti. The floor is yours. Okay. Um, thank you so much. Uh, Mohona, are you ready? Yeah. Yes. So this is a joint presentation from Mohona and myself. Um, we are representing the FAR program. And I'll let Mohana start. And I know everyone is very tired, so we will try to keep it short, just give you the gist of work we are doing. So go on, Mohana, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Panna. Uh, so I will not uh, take a lot of time with the introduction. I think uh, what we will speak about today is the Net Zero Heritage for Climate Action project, which is conceived within the framework of ICROM's flagship program, FAR, which is First Aid and Resilience for Cultural Heritage in Times of Crisis. Uh, very quick introduction to the program. Uh, it is a program which is built to enhance capacities for safeguarding heritage from conflicts, from disasters, and also the climate crisis to build peaceful and disaster resilient communities. Uh, our motto, which is culture cannot wait, uh, is rooted in the idea that culture should be mainstreamed, not only in development and humanitarian aid, uh, aid but also in national and regional climate action and climate adaptation plans. Because when we see culture uh, as a process, when we see it as you know, the lived experiences of people who have been uh, experiences, experiencing such changes in the climate and adapting to it uh, over several years, we can leverage it uh, because it provides a shared source. It, it is a source of shared identity. It is an enabler of peace. It offers pathways for just climate action, and it also builds disaster resilient uh, communities and promotes sustainable development. Therefore, our act actions, uh, our activities uh, are aimed at reducing disaster uh, risk and conflict risk by assessing them and also managing them uh, more specifically. Uh, we also enhance preparedness for the safeguard of cultural heritage and leverage this work to promote peace uh, and contribute to climate action. So we have four main pillars uh, with which we work, which is participation, prevention, forecasting, and coordinated action. Uh, while a lot of work has been done uh, by key agencies to protect heritage in the face of uh, the changing climate, the intensifying disasters and rising conflicts, and today, uh, as a matter of fact, in the COP28, there was a ministerial dialogue which where representatives and world leaders came together and called for action for the inclusion of culture in global climate action and public policy. But FAR has been uh, working over two years in knowledge building initiatives and capacity building initiatives to explore the nexus between cultural heritage and climate change, as well as implementing concrete action on the ground through research and field projects. And one such project is our ongoing initiative, Net Zero Heritage for Climate Action. And I would request Aparna to kindly walk us uh, through this 
project in uh, depth. Yeah, Mona, maybe you can move to the next slide and then I can. <clears throat> so the net zero uh, uh, heritage for climate action actually exemplifies what UN Water has said that uh, <clears throat> climate change is essentially a water crisis. It is affecting water cycle. And we have been hearing all through from the various presentations that I have been uh, listening to, very interesting ones, especially the last one of Victoria. And before that, also other presentations were very uh, interesting. Uh, that uh, the rainfall is being affected, precipitation is being affected. And along with that is coming flooding, is associated flooding. And uh, there are also longer periods of droughts. So we decided to go into five locations which are supposedly climate hotspots. Now climate hotspots are places where bioclimatic hazards more than one. Uh, so like there, and there are also variants of them. So intense rainfall combined with low pressure and uh, you know, the kind of clim climatic variants where they come together to cause maximum damage. Uh, so we we chose a, a place called Ubatuba in Brazil, which is a natural reserve, but there is a community of uh, um, cultural bearers uh, who are called the Kilimbola community, initially slaves brought to this area. Kasese in Uganda, which is uh, at the uh, edge of the Revenzori Mountains. And uh, again, the team here, uh, CCFU, uh, was investigating how people who have been thrown out of the World Heritage Site and have been living on mountain slopes are affected by frequent flooding landslides because of uh, melting of glaciers and how is their life affected. And then the third uh, site was Tuti Island in Sudan, which is a small island between uh, nestled between uh, Omar Durman and uh, um, the um, capital city, uh, and then uh, again, it's uh, it is uh, it has Blue Nile, and uh, it's at the confluence of Blue and White Nile, Tuti Island, and then along the line. So if you see from Uganda, it just happened that it was a coincidence that we had these three uh, along the line uh, Nile kind of uh, uh, sites where starting from the very beginning then in between and then ending with Rosetta, Egypt, where Nile Delta, uh, uh, there is a Delta of the Nile created and uh, it is the point where Nile empties into the Mediterranean Sea. And then the other, our fifth site was Jodhpur, India, which is at the edge of the Thar Desert. And again, uh, we were investigating how uh, traditional architecture, water bodies there, uh, can sustain uh, the communities and how traditional architecture and other cultural elements and traditional knowledge can be part of a heat action plan. So uh, moving to the topic of flood mitigation and uh, mm, uh, uh, in specific sites, I will ask Mohana to uh, explain this slide, uh, which is we are taking you to Rosetta to explain the action there and how we are looking at flood mitigation and early warning there. So Mohana, maybe you want to explain. <clears throat> Thank you, Pana. So uh, I think the key uh, issues that we are <clears throat> dealing with or our key aims and objectives of the Net Zero project is to first assess the climate related risks to cultural heritage. And there were some presentations today as well, which uh, looked into you know, the root causes of such uh, impacts, which are not limited to only the climate change, but also development failures or unplanned developments. So our aim was to assess and uh, understand and reduce these uh, risks to heritage, which might be related to climate or it might be related to some other risk drivers. And the second aspect was to then tap into the local knowledge or the place-based knowledge and the experiences of people to then contribute to a just climate transition. Yeah. Yeah. Go on, Mona, you can, and then I'll take it on this one. So, <laughs> sure. So then, uh, so as Aparna mentioned, uh, in all our fi five sites, uh, water is really a key issue. Uh, and different types, we are dealing with different types of flooding in all these sites. So there are urban floods, which are uh, 
also caused because of droughts where the land does not have enough capacity to soak in the water anymore and that is causing you know further uh, floods there is also also development challenges in most of our sites which is causing again urban floods and as you saw the location of these sites which are along the nile river which are along the sea uh, they are also being affected by river and floods and also because of the sea level rise coastal flooding so some of uh, we are dealing with you know not just the heritage sector but we are also looking at different diverse sectors and trying to uh, use data that is available and again in some of the presentations today it was highlighted that there is a lot of research going on climate models that are available that we really want to use and uh, kind of cross link it with uh, the traditional or the cultural knowledge that we have gathered in these sites okay. so some of the sources are on the screen yes and and so now uh, one of the problems that mohana just mentioned that while there are these uh, you know ipcc also atlas is there and you can get these um, think hazard maps of the world bank these are very good for broad indications and you can actually overlap your you know, understand where is your area, where is your site, and try to understand how climate change is acting as a risk driver. But one of the important aspects is to get that very local data, which weather data, and it's also, as I mentioned before, different bioclimatic hazards together and the variants together. So one should know which type of data to source, uh, to understand the causes of, uh, you know, how uh, climate change might be affecting flooding as a phenomena, and also uh, to how how further back you can go with the data, like what slice of data. So at least for this project, we decided that we will have to go back thirty years back to get the data. And also for each place, we, uh, um, you know, isolated certain bioclimatic hazards and their variants to study across a period of time to understand how the weather might be changing and how some cyclic, uh, you know, impacts like El Nino, El Nina. Besides that, how climate change is, you know, happening. And at the same time, we carried out this seven layer research questionnaire where we tried to understand some of the other drivers of flooding. For example, uh, is a, in, in Tuti Island, it was very clear that an island which was initially meant for uh, just uh, farming became uh, uh, suddenly uh, there was mega development there and uh, bridges, golf courses, uh, high rise buildings. And uh, that caused uh, A, the farmland to shrink, uh, B, there was a, a, a rise in the uh, soil erosion, and also the, um, there were other factors like um, uh, the soil had toxic, uh, because of lack of a proper drainage, drainage system, uh, the soil became to uh, toxic, and um, there's a particular word, it's escaping me right now. And uh, so uh, there were many other factors which were contributing to urban flooding in combination with river and flooding. So it's not like one type of flooding. There were two types of flooding that are happening now because of the development in that area. So it's often we try to say it is climate change, it is climate change, it's climate change. But actually what our research is pointing out that in each and every place, there ha are other risk drivers, such as unsustainable land use or uh, um, uh, unplanned development, which are acting as risk drivers and are interacting to cause further damage. Uh, yes, uh, Zenab says contaminated. Yes, Zenab contaminated. <laughs> okay. Mohana, you can uh, maybe take take over this one. <clears throat> okay, so uh, after phase one, which was the research phase uh, where we tried to gather all these data, uh, in the second phase, which was an in-person hands-on training sort of, it brought together all these teams from the five sites. It is a, um, a multidisciplinary team. There were archaeologists, there were heritage professionals, but there were also ecologists. So we brought them together and we tried to link this data that they gathered 
not just from desk-based research, which was you know collecting scientific data, but also the oral histories of people, of their knowledge and documenting them, their understanding of the climate, their understanding of how it, things have changed over the years. So the idea in this uh, phase was to bring all these data together and sort of cross-link it, make these comprehensive risk assessments to understand what were what are the root causes. And uh, once that was done, we created very solid risk statements, which then helped us to develop with the teams uh, some future scenarios. And there again, we tapped into the shared socioeconomic pathways of IPCC, uh, SSPs 3 and 5 in particular, to develop such scenarios and then see how the knowledge that each of these teams have identified and documented with their local communities, with their source communities, could help in mitigating the prevalent risks. Yeah. This work, yeah, sorry. Go on, go on, go on, go on, go on, sorry. Uh, so just the last point in this space, what was important, and particularly I remember the terraces that were shown in one of the case studies. We also went to Cinque Terre in Italy where they are doing this kind of an action where community is engaged, community-led action uh, in terraced farmings, and they are also very susceptible to floods and uh, that's how we tried to also showcase some real examples of how to implement, uh, you know, projects on the ground. Aparna. Thank you, Mona. So one of the aspects here of our work was that um, until now we have been looking at risk assessments uh, in a way where we have been uh, thinking about, uh, you know, uh, past risks over and then understanding what would be it like, uh, you know, in the next five, 10 years and maybe thinking about extreme risks. But here we were, we used, uh, you know, uh, the SSPs to think about like how in next 50 years and with the, uh, you know, projected uh, climate change in a particular site, how, how this place would look like. And um, in that, we also were very careful to understand what are the capacities uh, um, that exist on the ground uh to adapt and uh, this i think was a, a marked difference where we also had a possibility of conducting vulnerability and capacity assessments after this workshop in the third phase to really understand how our um, uh, the populations in our case study sites and agencies in our case study sites can help uh, us to adapt to a changing uh, climate. Go on, Mona. So I just want to mention that all this work uh, is not possible unless you know there is interagency coordination, unless we share uh, data, unless we share information that we have. And with this idea to promote this kind of, uh, of an exchange of knowledge and to sort of bridge data gaps and knowledge gaps, we brought together almost 25 area specialists from all these fields, which included flood management specialists, which included uh, climate scientists, uh, ecologists, economists, and all of them to work together with the teams. And as a result of uh, this humongous work that was done during the second phase of net zero, uh, it helped us to develop five culture-based climate action plans for our five, what we call the innovation sites. Uh, which then was implemented and you know field tested during the phase three, which was then supported by seed grants, uh, thanks to the Swedish Postcode Foundation. Uh, and I think now we will quickly walk you through some of the key sites and the plans or the actions that have been carried out, uh, especially focusing on flood uh, risk management. So, so then, Aparna. Yeah. I'll, 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 I'll talk about this. So in Tuti Island, Sudan, unfortunately, uh, by the time uh, the project was ready to be rolled out on the ground, uh, they, we had a conflict breakout in, uh, in, in Sudan and Tuti Island was in a way besieged uh, because the, the fighting, as you all know, the conflict broke out in Khartoum. And uh, this, since this, uh, because of its proximity to Khartoum, the island was totally uh, uh, enclosed. Now, what we were looking into it was a, a traditional system 
uh, flood warning system, which was born in the time of the British and out, uh, in a, after a great flood and uh, in the 1940s, and it's called the Taya system. Taya system is a indigenous knowledge system where they have developed a, a way to predict and in a way uh, to look at, uh, understand if the flood is coming in the Nile by the changing colors of the Nile waters, as well as the uh, uh, you know uh, lookout points that they have created which uh, then uh, they use as early warning uh, to um, to warn the communities and they create a human wall. And this is also a system which is for flood distribution, like aid distribution, and they all gather and stand and you know distribute floods and tires are run. Uh, and now they have also adopted uh, modern technology. They're using cell phones to do this. Uh, well, uh, the idea here was that we wanted to first understand if Taya system uh, can really adapt, uh, can be an adaptation measure and can be incorporated in the local, uh, uh, you know, early warning and response system or the national local and, uh, and can be also upscaled nationally. Uh, can it uh, can we add some technology to it? Can we add more scientific, uh, uh, you know, prediction capabilities to this, like GIS, other kinds of technology tools, to make it more robust and uh, um, withstand the kind of flooding patterns which are fast changing, and the uh, you know extreme flood events which are likely to happen, and would the system stand withstand? The, the change. Uh, unfortunately, some of that could not be uh, tested because of the war. So we turned into a school in the clouds kind of a project where the dispersed Taya community, those who remained in the, on the island, plus those who were uh, who are now out of the country, were brought together by our team and a detailed documentation of the system, how it works. Uh, was carried out and it's during this documentation uh, we got to know that the Taya practitioners are actually now helping with conflict uh, and, and, and helping community members uh, saving them uh, from potential dangerous situations as well as are running a relief network. So it came out very clearly that what started as a flood relief system is still working in the conflict situation. Second, um, there were uh, gaps identified on how intergenerational uh, transfer can happen. And uh, third, the, the group has now brought out uh, a small guidance. And at the same time, uh, they have uh, made a, a collaboration with a firm called, a UK-based firm, firm called Daraja uh, to further uh, strengthen this system and 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 uh, make sure that it is uh, mm, it is ready for um, as a as a as a national as well as a perhaps as, as a regional uh, system for early warning as well as flood uh, <clears throat> as, as well as um, uh, flood response. But uh, there is also one thing that came out very clearly that this system has, um, people have knowledge and that knowledge will have to be transferred for this system to sustain across generations. Uh, I'll give the floor to Mohana for the next uh, slide. Thank you. So the next uh, site is in Uganda, in Kasese, which is a site which lies in between the Kororo Sacred Cultural Site and the boundary of the Rwenzuri Mountains National Park. And this site, they have been facing destructive river and flooding for several years, which is not only induced by the you know irregular rainfall patterns as a result of climate change, but also because of the rapidly melting glaciers of the Rwenzuri Mountains. And it has really disrupted lives and livelihoods of the lowland indigenous communities, such as the Bokonzo and the Basongora. So what's interesting now here is that because of this, because of this destruction and the rapid erosion of land, 
these two indigenous communities are now facing a lot of tensions amongst each other because of land sharing and resource sharing. Uh, in close collaboration with the clan and bridge leaders of this community, the Bukonza community, the project team from CCFU, which is Cross Cultural Foundation of Uganda, uh, an NGO based in Uganda, they are now documenting the, all the indigenous knowledge uh, that is in that place uh, regarding reading the weather patterns, uh, communicating, uh, you know, early warnings through playing drums and um, you know, going around the villages by these clan leaders. Uh, and they're also documenting how these indigenous people, they have been managing the natural resources and they have been conserving the forest uh, over so many years. So together with the members of the community, uh, the team has also identified their knowledge about the native species of plants uh, some of them being bamboo and ficus, which uh, they believe, the community believes, has the potential to strengthen soil, uh, the soil quality, and make it uh, better against soil erosion and also prevent, to some extent, landslides. So what they have been doing is they have been engaging these leaders, the indigenous leaders, as well as the youth, again, focusing on the intergenerational uh, knowledge transfer, uh, to identify areas of uh, land which is most exposed to the flooding and to the erosion and planting these bamboo trees and ficus trees uh, together with the community. Uh, and then a second step forward is to then test the soil quality with universities, with their, uh, you know, the uh, forest department to see how these plants are actually making, uh, changing the strength of the soil and uh, like uh, contributing to uh, you know less to lessen the erosion of the land because of these extensive flooding. Here, uh, I'll, and, uh, yes. uh, go on, Mona. No, no, go on, go on, go on. Uh, no, so just the last point. I think one of the very uh, key outcomes of this project have been the formation of a village climate change committee, which has actually brought in representatives from all the different groups of indigenous leaders. Uh, and they are being, you know, uh, brought together to not only enhance their social cohesion and to reduce the tensions that they have between each communities, but they're also invested with the with the responsibility of managing or monitoring these plantations that have taken place so they are sustained. To also monitor now the riverbank restoration, that is a next step for their project safeguarding these sacred sites in the project area and also, uh, you know, to overall uh, amplify and sustain the project that they started with a very small seed grant. Yes, Aparna. I just wanted to add here that in order to understand better the flood risk here and to understand how the glacier, the glaciers, uh, the, the melting of the glacier is uh, affecting uh, the flooding, patterns, uh, we we um, insisted on a GIS mapping of the area and understanding, uh, you know, by engaging hazard specialists on what is the exposure, how many people are exposed. So all that, all those calculations and the aspects of, you know, studying and getting the data uh, were done. One problem we had was to get hyper-localized data weather data, and this remains a challenge, especially in certain places uh, where, uh, you know, either, uh, and also getting social data, socioeconomic data or social development data, for example, uh, com uh, census of the people, number of people, or um, how their income status, because we looked at all those aspects and we brought in elements from human geography to understand why these places were sustainable few years ago and now why these places have become unlivable or are becoming unlivable. Go on, Mohana, next one. <clears throat> uh, the next one is Egypt, if you would like to talk okay. a bit about it. You can start. Okay. okay. Uh, so our next... Uh, the... Mohana, I just want to yes. remind you that you are eight minutes past the time. Oh, uh, yeah. oh sorry. Like it, we really appreciate okay, it. So I... Thank you. Sorry, Zainab. I think we are almost uh, in the end. So just quickly, Rosetta is that city which Aparna was mentioning where it's in the Nile Delta. And uh, there again, because of sea level rise, they're having this issue of soil salinization, while also we have looked into the past and seen how the dam, the high dam that was built, 
has also impacted the you know the river and flooding the nile flooding which actually was helpful for agriculture so uh, the team is now uh, as well identified some of the native trees which is a sycamore tree which uh, has a desalinization uh, character to stick to it so they are planting these trees they're also engaging farmers and fishermen and the youth uh, to raise awareness about climate change and also working on an early warning system uh, using the Coptic, ancient Coptic calendar. Uh, so that's Egypt quickly. And just to finish it off, uh, so all these cases, we say these stories uh, very quickly, but there is so much more to these stories and there is so much research that has gone into it. And to disseminate the key findings of uh, all the projects and of our Net Zero project, we will be having a conference next year in February, and we would invite you all to kindly join. And uh, another product of the Net Zero project is the upcoming climate risk management tool, uh, which if Aparna wants to take two minutes to explain it. Very quickly that it will be for all types of heritage and it will uh, start from the perspective of uh, you have a museum, you have a site, and what is the climate risk to that site, to that museum, but uh, it will also bring in the place-based perspectives. So it really, um, uh, we think, uh, will um, join uh, this idea of uh, heritage, but in the context of a place. <clears throat> Go on. Oh, you didn't mention prevent the next course. Okay. It's okay. Do we have two minutes, Zainab, to quickly show the last slide we wanted to really show? <laughs> you already uh, 10 minutes okay. passed, but uh, yeah, please, okay. uh, because, yeah, yeah, please, we want to hear the okay, last. Okay, no, just, just to show, because this is not where the journey ends, because we do want to have further collaboration and really scale up this work. And we are working on this uh, prevent to a course on flood risk uh, mitigation with uh, the ministry in Croatia. Uh, we also would like to create this co cohort of professionals, heritage professionals who can help mainstream heritage-based climate action and to have a net zero volume two uh, where we can again uh, work on concrete action on the ground. So that's all. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Aparna. Thank you very much, Moana. It's always uh, uh, gr great to hear your inspiring works. What you are doing is great. And uh, so, uh, dear colleagues, we have a 10 minutes break and uh, we are uh, already an hour behind our schedule. Uh, we really like to hear all the things, but uh, after 10 minutes, you can grab your coffee, come back, and if you uh, check your time, 20 minutes time, and we are always sending a, a quite small kind warning message from the chat box you can see from that and see you in 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you.
dear colleagues, welcome back. Uh, now we would like to continue with the Dr. Uh, John Patterson as the president of International Scientific Committee on Archaeological Heritage and Management. And I do not know that Dr. Patterson is here. I think, yeah, I cannot see him. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, then uh, we will continue with the Dr. Uh, Masamitsu Fujimoto. Um, he is from Iconos, Japan. So this is my oh, turn. Okay. 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 So I will share the. Uh... Oh, sorry. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes, perfect. Yeah, okay. Perfect. Okay. So uh, thank you for introducing me. So my name is Masamitsu Fujimoto, uh, Ritsumika University from Japan. So uh, also thank you for uh, inviting me to speak to you today. So uh, so yeah, I'd like to talk about the climate change and risk prevention to introduce uh, Japanese case. Uh, first topic is uh, uh, visible reality of climate change and the damages. Okay, so sorry about that. So I will check the time. Okay, so. So first of all, so this right indicates the risk area by climate changes. And uh, this, this map shows the elevation map the, around the big city, uh, Tokyo and uh, Osaka. Uh, the blue colored area indicates the lower elevation area. Uh, the elevation level is about uh, plus minus uh, one meter above sea level. Uh, this area is very large and this uh, large area has a high risk of uh, water damages and uh, caused by the bank erosion and also the sea level rising. So also this is the data of the recent sediment disasters. Uh, so as you can see, the uh, uh, dead, missing, and destroyed houses and the flooded houses. And uh, 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 this data is over the past 10 years and uh, in Japan and uh, various uh, countermeasures is um, being taken, but all, also that uh, the number of the flooded house are uh, still large and uh, not changeable. Uh, this indicated that, that there were uh, a lot of damages by uh, the uh, flooding at still now. So uh, this right uh, explained the impact of the uh, global running in the Japanese case and that uh, Left issue is uh, a case of the Miyajima case and uh, running over. Uh, this Miyajima shrine, uh, World Heritage uh, Site and the National Treasure, uh, located in the uh, Hiroshima. And uh, this uh, shrine is uh, built, uh, uh, located in the in front of the uh, sea. So, uh, the main uh, hole, uh, floor uh, is very close to the sea. And then the, when the water level uh, rise, the uh, floor is uh, under the sea level. So in recent years, the more than 10 times has been, uh, 10 times uh, of flooding has been observed. Uh, it's clearly affected by the climate changes, I think so. The latter issue is about the 
Omi Watari phenomena. So this is a very uh, difficult pronunciation. Omi Watari is the uh, natural weather phenomena uh, un very unique to Lake Suba in Nagano Prefecture, uh, central Japan. Uh, the entire surface of the lake uh, freezes over and uh, some parts of it become ridged like that. And uh, it is said that uh, these are the footprints of the gods. Uh, the number of Omiwatari phenomena is clearly decreasing, uh, very clear. And uh, also it is very clear uh, that this was uh, affected the, by the global warming and ice uh, conditions. So next slide, uh, uh, I will show the damage. It's a very, very big damage is caused by Typhoon Taras in 2011. Uh, as you can see, the left, right, uh, left top uh, slide, uh, very uh, over flooding is occurred uh, at the very big river, uh, Kumanogawa River. So in this Typhoon Taras, so there are very some places and uh, uh, in some area, uh, total rainfall amount uh, uh, during the several days, four or five days, and uh, total rainfall amount exceeded 2,000 millimeter uh, for one event. Uh, this uh, large amount of heavy rainfall uh, yields a lot of type of sediment disasters and the landslide and debris straw and the shallow landslide and the deep landslide and the uh, uh, channel uh, blockages or something. And uh, these all types uh, have occurred and causes uh, very much damages. And uh, also, this damage is occurred in the World Heritage Site uh, in southern central Japan. So this one is a damage uh, at the Kumano Kodo Pass. Uh, Kumano uh, Kodo, uh, Kumano Old Road, uh, has been used to visit the temples and the shrines. And this road is very, very too long. And uh, this photo is a, a light photo is uh, uh, original uh, conditions of the Kumano Kodo. Uh, this is a kind of the uh, step. Uh, after the landslide, uh, every, uh, everything was lost by the deep landslide in here. And uh, we are uh, we are considered and thinking about how to recover or something, but uh, it is too difficult to uh, recover the original conditions in here. So also I will uh, uh, show the, the other places damages. Uh, this one is the World HD site, uh, Nachitaisha Shrine. As you can see, is uh, uh, a large amount of the mud pro uh, was flowing down over the uh, ground and the uh, steps uh, like a river. Uh, uh, this sedimentation uh, is very uh, difficult to recover the, after the uh, typhoon. And also in the Kumano Natutasha Shrine, uh, main uh, shrine area is uh, affected by the debris flow at the mountainous area. Uh, several landslide occurred, and the several landslide uh, sediment and the flow like uh, debris flow and flowing down and uh, with uh, much uh, uh, volume of water. And then so such sedimentations occurred and it attacked the main shrine area, uh, but. Uh, Fortunately, the damage of the main building is uh, was minor, but uh, the other fence or something uh, were broken. So next example is the Kyoto uh, area in 2013. Uh, this one is a photo of the Togetsukyo in Arashiyama area in Kyoto. So uh, this one is a very uh, famous place 
for the tourist and uh, by the typhoon so this area is uh, flooded by the overflowing uh, from the this uh, Katsuragawa river but the damages and the flooded area was uh, so not so large and uh, because uh, uh, upstream dam uh, controls a lot of volume of the river water uh, at the maximum time uh, and upstream dam can reduce the water flowing water uh, about uh, nine percent uh, this one is uh, very effective uh, by the uh, Okay, uh, effect of the dam control at the upstream dams. So at the same time in Kyoto, so uh, Kiyomizura Temple, uh, at the Kiyomizura Temple, uh, slope failure occurred. As you can see it in the middle of the hotel, uh, small area collapsed and down to the uh, houses and uh, near the Ottawa waterfall uh, for the very, uh, sorry about that, uh, very famous uh, place for the tourist. And in uh, 1999, the neighboring uh, swamp uh, was collapsed and uh, this one is uh, fixed and stable and the neighboring uh, swamp was, uh, uh, has uh, broken and in addition the slope failure uh, have occurred in the five locations in the Kiyomisa temple and the nearest temple uh, also various size in here so this year uh, heavy rainfall disaster occurred but at the same time so the at the many large uh, river experienced the water shortage uh very large river cross a river uh, occurred uh, of the water shortage in 18 river system and 23 rivers and so at a mini was uh, sorry there were also such uh so this uh another and uh, the uh, climate change conditions and at uh, some extreme conditions and uh, made uh, such uh, potential risk uh, of the damage of the dry condition of the river. This one is also uh, important for the uh, river controls. So next topic is the prediction of the future uh, climate change and uh, its effects. Okay. So, uh, under the global warming uh, conditions, uh, government need to consider and decide the response of the flood control. And the uh, ministry evaluated of the, uh, a lot of scenario of climate changes of the global, global warming. And uh, finally, ministry uh, categorized the risk of the global warming issue into the four uh, whole types, storm surges and uh, uh, coast erosion, increases of floods and intensification of landslide diseases, increased risk of water shortage. And uh, we targeted the uh, four uh, categories. Uh, So also uh, Japan Meteorology, uh, the Meteorology Agency, uh, to improve the detailed prediction, create a detailed projection of the global warming. Uh, in Japan, uh, latest uh, prediction by the JMA are calculated in the five kilometer square grids. Uh, this one is uh, uh, very small, that the past one is a 20 kilometer resolution. And the uh, Resolution change uh, will uh, yield a high prediction of the uh, meteorological condition, as you know. 
So then, so also the uh, Japan Meteorology Agency uh, summarizes uh, Japanese detailed predictions of heavy rainfall at the end of this uh, centuries. Uh, these graphs indicate uh, heavy rainfall uh, frequency uh, uh, 30 millimeter per hour, 5 millimeter per hour, uh, 100 millimeter per 200 millimeter per, per hour, and uh, uh, x axis uh, indicates the location of the location of Japan. So, as you can see, is a uh, frequency of the short time heavy rainfall and heavy rainfall and uh, we are more frequently and uh, especially in the south and japan okinawa or something so this report was a uh, little bit old and uh, was uh, comprised in 2013 but now 10 years later the report will be accurate because heavy rainfall uh, occurring more frequently than 10 years ago. Okay, so uh, next topic is the stage of policy for responding to climate changes in the field of uh, flood damages. Uh, so in Japan, so a lot of counter measurement and 40% of counter measurements uh, were built over 40 years ago. So then, because of this, uh, many of them require the inspection and also the uh, reinforcement are needed. Uh, this is a current ongoing issue for Japan. This is a very uh, big problem. And But uh, we have to do a lot of things. And uh, this slide explains the large-scale flood control uh, by improvement of existing dams and et cetera, and the uh, rising of the top level of the dam, and also the adding the speed rates to existing dam make it possible uh, to enlarge the water, uh, water storage volume of the dam. And also in, in addition to the, we create a new underground res reservoir uh, near the river, so we, uh, these kind of new countermeasures that we control the flood. And also, a small scale of the flood controls were uh, implemented. Uh, this right explains the countermeasures to slow down the rapid increase water table in the river during the heavy rainfall. Uh, as you can see, the playground and uh, Schoolyard will be able to uh, store the rainfall water uh, during the heavy rainfall. Uh, this read uh, the preven prevention of the rapid rainfall to rainwater movement to the river. And uh, also, the, we made uh, the other systems to promote the rainwater pre uh, penetration to the ground, not to the river, uh, to control the Water river rising uh, of the river. So I will uh, introduce example of the counter measurement based on the land use. Upper one uh, explains the uh, uh, embankment. Uh, the past embankment is being strengthened uh, around the river line, but in the future, uh, we consider the different type of embankment setting, but uh, this one is uh, uh, quite not quite new. This is an old traditional style uh, to protect the houses, uh, like a border type, and also the land uh, rising. And the below one uh, shows the area with the potential risk of the flood uh, classified into the level. Uh, in addition, uh, based on the evaluated risk levels, uh, construction restriction, and that set, this is a very uh, reasonable strategy for the land use management and uh, to reduce the risk of the flood. And also the for the area, 
uh, with a high potential risk of the flood, uh, we create specially high resolution hazard map. At the same time, so we will share the risk information to show the sign or symbol at the input point in the field, uh, right? Uh, Photo uh, is an example of the sign uh, indicates the esti estimated high water level. Uh, this make it possible for the living people, also the visitors, to imagine the broad risk levels. So time is coming. So uh, the the one uh, is uh, the kind of the uh, combined new techniques to uh, prevent the to evaluate the risk of the flood and the river controls. And uh, we combine the high prediction uh, in iteration in the high uh, lane observation uh, using X-ray, the LiDAR networks, and also the uh, high prediction, elevation, uh, terrain elevation data, and uh, distribution type flood prediction or something. And we combined a lot of new techniques in here. So finally, uh, I will introduce the practical guidelines regarding the flood disasters were already established in Japan. In here, we, you, uh, we, you can check the Japanese uh, cases guideline here. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fujimoto, for a very informative presentation and also uh, keeping the time on. And thank you. Uh, I continue with the Dr. Mengyuan Jia from China. Screen is yours, Dr. Jia. Uh, sorry, the, uh, it's my turn. I can. can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, so I, I share my Yes, yes, that's your turn. Screen. Yeah. Oh. oh, sorry, sorry. It's a moment. Okay, uh, can you see my PowerPoint? Uh, we can see your screen. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, you, you can see, okay. So uh and I will share my study. Uh it's about uh we are doing uh I have a co-author who is hurting and we do a study on the uh, methods to explore how urban how how the climate change would have impact on flood risk at high uh, cultural heritage sites. And we take a case study of the Shanxi province in China. Oh, so, oh, so I heard, uh, oh. Maybe uh, I just use this print. I'll make, make, make it bigger. Okay. Uh, so the background of this study is uh, we the, the cultural heritage is in China and also in uh, all over the world they are facing a green challenge from the flood. And uh, uh, in 2020, more than 500 cultural heritage sites was damaged by floods in China, and they are including about 76 national protected sites. Uh, like this photo, it shows a very famous bridge in uh, Zhang Jiajie, uh, one uh, like a city in, in the Northeast China. And this bridge was built in, uh, in about uh, 
uh, the the Song Song Dynasty, and but it was destroyed by flood in two thousand and twenty. So uh, this is the the photo shows this problem. And as we know, the climate change would change our weather, and so the uh overall the weather is getting uh wetter and more variable, and so. We are facing more increasingly extreme uh, pre precipitation patterns, uh, and more uh, uh, and more more accidents like the flood would happen in the future. Uh, so all the immobile cultural heritages they are facing uh, increasing challenges from this flooding. And uh, we. Now, currently, there are some uh, studies they focused on this topic, yeah, such as uh, some studies try to assess the flood risk at cultural heritage sites. Uh, this this assessing methods they are reading from the regional scale, uh, like for a country or all over the world, and also some studies they focused on the uh, single or. Uh, uh, the specific the uh, the specific site scale site scale uh cultural heritages, mm. and a growing body of literature studied about the framework and methods used to predict in uh, the future flood risk, uh, like how the climate change would uh, bring the the future uh, bring the risk to heritages in the future. Uh, and these studies, they usually use some uh, index they can calculate it from the uh, climate scenarios, such as the ratios uh, related to daily precipitation and the number of uh, consecutively dry or extremely warm days. It, but the limitation we think is, oh, the first one is, uh, Currently, these methods they hardly to uh, produce a high resolution risk map to show like which area would be at risk. And another limitation is, uh, the this methods partly overlook the relationship between the flood risk and the land cover change. And as we know, the in the future, like the climate change would also cause. Uh, cause the land cover change, like uh, there will be more and a little fewer uh, fewer grass or fewer uh fewer bushes like things like this. So th this land cover changes would also cause the uh would also impact on the flood flood risk. So uh. This has some some studies we 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 do the literatures, uh, lit literature review and we found some studies use the uh, hydrological models and the GIS techniques to simulate the flood prone area, and then they can use this uh, the based on the flood prone areas to access the risk of flooding, uh, in the future, and so. Uh, the first study is uh, focused on one area in Taiwan. Uh, it used uh, a method to, to produce um, like a higher resolution of the risk map. And th this, this study is focused on the, uh, on the uh, Mediterranean regions uh, to see how the sea level rise would Caused a, a greater of flooding or uh, erosion hazards of the heritage. And the third one is uh, about studying the Africa heritage. It's also uh, focused on the uh, like the, the, the sea level rise and how it's caused the risk change to the heritage. Uh, and in, ten, in context of China, there are uh, fewer uh, studies to focus on this part. 
and like we we found one study is used uh, uh based on the climbing scenarios and uh, uh, calculated some index to evaluate the risk of all the cultural cultural heritages uh, in China. Uh, they value the, so the results could show which province would have higher risk. And uh, there are also one literature was published in, in Chinese. It, it focused on the Shanxi province. Uh, it's evaluated about uh, 422 national level heritage sites and to show which, which sites would be at higher risk in the future. And uh, also there are some studies, uh, they studied the uh, different climate scenarios to, to identify the area who will facing higher risk in the future. Uh, so based on these studies and uh, uh, the the research gap we found, so we try to uh, explore one new method to do the uh, risk assessment. Uh, we based on a hydrological model whose name is uh, SCSC methods. Uh, based on these methods, we could simulate the flood prone area. Uh, for the different climate scenarios. And we established a index system to assessment, to do the assessment of flood risk. Uh, the index including uh, hazards, exposure, and the vulnerability, the three aspects. And so we calculated uh, four, four scenarios. One is for baseline is uh, about the, the in the past 100 years, we used the uh, uh, weather da data and uh, its land cover data to do this calculation. And we also do a prediction for the future in the, in, in the next 100 years. And there are three different scenarios to see the difference. In uh, the study area is, uh, one province in China is Shanxi province. Uh, Shanxi has the largest number of national, historical, and the cultural sites among all Chinese provinces. Uh, so th this province is uh, is uh, like full uh, how a lot of cultural heritage. Is. So the protection of this heritage is, is very important for this province. And it's, uh, this province is also a continental uh, monsoon climate with annual precipitation averaging around 315 to uh, 700 uh, millimeters. Uh, however, 60% of this pre precipitation is concentrated in the summer uh, between June and August. So flooding is also a great risk for this, uh, for this province. Uh, we evaluated 2,956 uh, existing immobile cultural heritage sites in this province. And this cultural heritage uh, belongs to different protection levels from national level to provincial levels and uh, prefectural level. Uh, so the method is we, we calculate the flood risk uh, R uh, by uh, considering the hazard exposure and the vulnerability. Uh, we built a uh, 10 indexes to do this calculation and considering the uh, if this heritage uh, located in the flood prone area of different recurrent um, periods like from two, 20 years flood, 50 years flood and 100 years flood. Uh, the exposure was, uh, was evaluated by the elevation slope and its distance to stream and uh, 
the percentage of impervious uh, surface in the watershed. So this index would considering the land cover change uh, in, in evaluating, in assessing the flood risk of these cultural heritages. And the third dimension is the vulnerability. We considered the level of protection uh, the construction date and the heritage type, this three part, the three three uh, types of the uh, cultural heritages. And uh, the flood prone area was simulated from a GIS based method. And this this photo, this figure shows the uh, flood prone area for different scenarios from baseline. Uh, to SSP 119, uh, 245, and 585. Uh, so the results, we, we come to the results. The results shows uh, about the flood pro areas. We can see the uh, difference between baseline scenario and the three future scenario. Uh, and we can see in the SSP 119, uh, the largest 100 year storm have a uh, greatest flood prone area. And also we comparing the uh, number of cultural heritages who's located in the flood prone area. We can see uh, that for the 100 year storm, uh, the, the he cultural heritages, is uh, uh, for SSP 245 and 585 have largest number of the uh, cultural heritage is located in the flood prone area. And for other, like the more frequently uh, facing the flood at the 50 year storm and 20 year storm, uh, the cultural heritage is protected at provincial level would have a greater risk than other uh, cultural heritages. And uh, we also do the, some statistic of the R value, and we can see that uh, in the future, maybe impacted by the climate change, uh, the R value of cultural heritages would increase. And especially for this part, this R value from uh, 0 0.1 to 0 0.2, it, it means uh, the cultural heritages with lower risk level, uh, its number will be increased in the future. So more heritages would face in the risk of, of flood in the future. And we also do some comparison of the uh, different cultural heritages. We can see uh, one thing like the uh, heritage they are protected at lower level, uh, the prefecture level heritages, they are facing a relatively greater risk in the future. And the cultural heritages uh, dates from Qin Dynasty to to the South and North Dynasty is a relatively uh, old or, or historical uh, the heritage. They are facing greater uh, greater risk than other type of cultural heritage. And uh, about the heritage type, uh, for the different type, we find. Uh, the relic bridge and dock because they are more uh, close or, or near to the stream uh, or the lake. So they are facing greater uh, risk in the future. And uh, the results can also show the, some spatial difference of different uh, provinces, uh, different cities in this province. Uh, for some cities like this, this three, uh, like the Changzhi, uh, we can see at car, uh, in the future three scenarios, its risk would increase than uh, the risk at baseline scenario. 
but for other cities like the Linfen, this would be decreased in the future. So it shows some uh, spatial difference and we could uh, pay attention to this difference to make uh, future uh, policy, uh, uh, to make future adaptive policies. Uh, so uh, based on this method, we also draw a detailed risk map of all these uh, cultural heritages. And we only presented the heritages with risk uh, here. Uh, so we can see uh, the, the heritages located along the Fen River and uh, uh, Zhang River, some, some rivers. Uh, they are facing greater uh, greater risk. And uh, so uh, my presentation or, or my sh I'm sharing is part of our study and is a published paper now. Uh, it, so from this study, we can see that uh, GIS-based hydrological uh, model uh, is a uh, it, it, it can be used to assess in the blood risk of cultural heritage. And it also supports us to do some prediction of the uh, blood risk in the future. And from the results, we can see uh, currently 268 sites are at risk. Uh, but by uh, in the next few uh, 100 years. By 2099, uh, there will be 100 more heritages uh, to be threatened by flooding in Shanxi province. Uh, so, uh, so flooding uh, for the cultural heritages is, uh, uh, should be focused and uh, we can, based on this method and based on this study, to pre prevent to provide some policy advices, such as for some uh, cultural heritages, uh, they constructed before the Qin Dynasty and uh, its type of relics, a bridge and dock, they would facing greater flood risk in the future. And for some cities, uh, the cultural heritage in these cities uh, would be have relatively higher flood risk than others. And also we can know uh, along some rivers, uh, the, the cultural heritage would have greater, uh, greater risks. Uh, so uh, that's all my uh, study and my presentation. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much, okay. Yai, for your uh, presentation. And uh, 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 can take uh, so I need to stop. Mm. Sorry, Can I, I didn't know how to stop my you. free sharing. <laughs> yeah, yes, I, I hear now. Uh, but I'm not sure how to close it. Oh, I see. <laughs> Great. Thanks. <laughs> Hello everyone, I'm Jis Kim and uh, with Dr. Sang Sun Cho, uh, we prepared the presentation on the damages of cultural heritage caused by unexpected flood and accelerated by climate change, especially focused on the Korean case. So Korea has 
a climate pattern in which annual precipitation is concentrated in summer due to two rainy seasons and typhoons. And over the past uh, 100 years, total summer precipitation and extreme pre precipitation have increased to significant levels. Increasing intensity of typhoons affecting the Korean Peninsula, especially the average annual value of the typhoon's central atmospheric pressure and maximum wind speed just before landing has increased since 2000. And what is more concerning is that due to climate change, ext extreme precipitation in Korea is expected to increase by at least 30% in the future, even under the low CO2 uh, emission scenario. So due to the climate change, the pattern and characteristics of the rainy season are changing. And total precipitation during the rainy seasons is increasing. And over the past uh, 10 years, the duration of the two rainy seasons and precipitation characteristics have changed significantly this year. And Actually, the flood damage, such as flooded areas, casualties, and damage amounts throughout Korean society has gradually decreased since 2000s. However, uh, in the, on the opposite side, the damage to cultural heritage is showing an increasing trend. Based on data reporting damage to cultural properties over the past 16 years, the overall damage from storms and floods to cultural properties is showing an increasing trend. Korea, 70% of the country is mountainous and may, many cultural assets are located on or along slopes. As a result, uh, many cultural properties located on slopes are often damaged due to weakening of the ground rather than the damage caused by floodings. However, recent damage cases suggest that it is necessary to prepare for heavy rainfalls and subsequent floodings due to climate change. One of the recent cases of flood damage of cultural heritage could be the flooding of Gongsansong Fortress. And this fortress is an important component of the Baekje uh, the historic site registered on the World Heritage List. The fortress is made of earth and stone built in the 5th century on a hill 110 meters above a sea level next to a river. But in last July, an extreme rainfall event uh, between two days occurred nationwide during the rainy season called Changma and cumulative uh, precipitation was twice the normal amount, and, uh, in, and it was the third highest since 1970s. And due to the climate change, the return period of this kind of extreme values is expected to become shorter. This torrential rain event caused flooding in many areas across the country and caused damages to unusually large number of cultural heritage sites, including 75 cases of, natural, uh, of uh, nationally designated heritage across the country. In particular, heritage assets in villages located along the river, such as Peryongpo village in the photo you see now, suffered flooding. In the case of, uh, in the case of this, uh, village. Fortunately, the trees surrounding the outskirts of the village played a role in reducing significant physical damage. And as, as I mentioned before, many cultural heritage assets are located on or adjacent to slopes. In particular, Buddhist uh, cultural assets such as temples and stone pagodas are often located in the mountains. As a result, when heavy rainfall occurs, 
Slope collapse and debris flows often cause damage to coastal, her coastal heritage. In this process, temporary structures installed to confirm temple functions, as shown in the photo above, may become a factor, another factor that can cause damage to cultural heritage due to unexpected heavy rain. In order to reduce these damages, the question of how to expect these damages can be asked first. So to answer this, the National Research Institute of Cultural Heritage in Korea, where I belong, is developing a web-based hazard mapping system which aims for proactive preparation for hazards and emergency response. This system is equipped with existing hazard maps such as blood and landslide made by other ministries and receives real-time weather information such as typhoons and precipitation from the Korea Meteorological Administration. By overlaying the location of cultural heritage, the system visualized the map of cultural heritage expected to be exposed to hazards. And as a second question, we can ask what resources are currently available to for response? The Korean government, especially the Korean Cultural Heritage Administration, regularly inspects nationally designated cultural properties every three to five years and rates their preservation status. In the case of architectural cultural assets, the Safety and Disaster Prevention Division of the National Research Institute is in charge. And two to three researchers investigate approximately, approximately 200 cultural properties every year and grade their preser preservation status from A to F and suggest measures to address them. As a result of regular surveys, in the case of 26 important architectural heritage assets with low preservation status and high public interest, three researchers are conducting detailed safety inspections one to four times a year. We perform precise measurements in the areas of structural safety, conservation materials, and biological damage. We are also building a real-time monitoring system. And among the cultural properties for which real-time automatic measurement is being implemented, there is an example of Pangude petroglyphs, which are the only petroglyph on, glyphs on Earth depicting a prehistoric whaling scene. And these petroglyphs are the only, uh, since a dam uh, that supplies drinking water to Ulsan metropolitan city downstream was built in 1960s, these petroglyphs have suffered rapid weathering damage due to frequent rise and falls in water levels. And weathering patterns are being monitored through precise measurements. And there has been a long standing conflict, especially between the Cultural Heritage Administration and the Ulsan Metropolitan Government, among various stakeholders related to the conservation of petroglyphs and securing drinking water. And last year, as a result of a study involving the following stakeholders, it was concluded that include uh, installing a floodgate will be most appropriate to control the dam's water to an appropriate level, leading to a dramatic agreement on uh, cooperation with between these organizations. And as a result, it is expected that a number of days submerged in petroglyphs will be significantly reduced from 2000 25 and the drinking water problem will be completely re resolved. 
So Korea's recent heavy rains and flood damage of cultural heritage are expected to occur more frequently uh, in the future due to climate change. So accordingly, the following points can be considered to be supplemented in the future DRM cycle of cultural heritage. For the pre-disaster phase, many things will be needed such as hazard mapping and vulnerability analysis, inspection of identified vulnerable properties, implementing proactive measures, preparing uh, many equipments for ready to use, and starting contact with DRM authorities. Among these, one that is uh, currently being implemented thoroughly in Korea is preparing preventive measures. When heavy rainfall or typhoons are forecasted, it is necessary to prepare drainage ditches in the heritage sites in advance and to remove trees and leaves that may affect structures such as stonework in advance. Currently, local governments and cultural heritage care centers, which is assigned to the central government, are carrying out such works for state-designated cultural heritage. But further training is needed to, in the long run for site managers and local residents. And for the during disaster phase, Korea has a relative good first aid and emergency measures system. To add one point to supplement, rapid assessment of damage and cause, and decisions of re recovery and engineering with professionals are required immediately after disaster while reviewing the process of disaster. So for example, this photo shows a traditional house of upper class in the mid uh, uh, Joseon dynasty, which is uh, about uh, 18th century. And although the other parts were relatively well equipped with drainage system, there was there were no drainage channels at the foot of the mountains here, uh, which was the easiest for water to gather and was the most vulnerable to flooding and landslides. As a result, every time there was heavy rainfall, uh, floodings in the backyard happened very often and result resulting a lot of damage to the backyard walls and, and many parts here. And for the post-disaster phase, Korea has focused on implement, implementing mitigation measures. A point that has been recently emphasized is to strictly comply the uh, comply with the standards spe uh, specification for repairing cultural heritage. For example, as you see here, uh, these are the uh, surrounding walls of a traditional house in Taejeon. But as you see here, the quality of the uh, repair, uh, repairing quality of these walls are all different. Uh, after a heavy rainfall in this year, an accident occurred uh, where the walls collapsed in the section with poor construction quality. So to uh, comply with this kind of standard uh, is very emphasized recently. Also, it should be uh, be required to uh, first prioritize short and long-term recovery measures needed and update the DRM plan and raise awareness. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh...
So CP and San Sinjo for a very uh, informative uh, presentation. And uh, I would like to invite the dear Hataya uh, Strakantu, uh, our dear friends, uh, for giving her presentations. Great to see you, Hataya, again. Yes, uh, thank you, Sena. And uh, I'm also very nice to meet all of you once again. Uh, okay, let me share uh, the script. Um, And I think you can can you see the screen, right? Is that all right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, first, I um may I ask that I'm going to turn off my camera, so the uh for a better the internet signal. Okay, uh, once again, good evening and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Mm, today, I'm going to share with you about a uh, flood risk situation in Southeast Asia in overview, but uh, we'll focus on some heritage sites in Thailand as a case studies. And uh, the lesson which uh, perhaps learned or never learned, you can say uh, at the end of my presentation. So, uh, here is uh, Southeast Asia for geopolitical context. Southeast Asia includes 11 countries as seen on the map on your right and uh, on your right hand side in the red color. Half of the region is situated on the Indochina Peninsula, while others are uh, the archipelago in the South Pacific and Indian Oceans. In fact, the, uh, this peninsula is a result of a water recession around 1,000 years ago. Uh, for for the date, it's still argued. Uh, so uh, I'm, I don't want to specify, but it's around one uh, 10,000 to 20,000 years uh, ago. Let's see. And I point out this map because uh, the area which is now always uh, flooded uh, is the area which supposed to be under the uh, water in this period. Okay. Uh, and also, as we are aware, the natural uh, hazards don't have borders or politics. So for Southeast Asia, it covers nearly half of the ring of fire in the Pacific Ocean, where uh, various natural hazards causing by geological conditions often and severely uh, occur. Uh, and it's uh, whenever the uh, disaster or uh, natural hazards occur in, in uh, anywhere in this ring, it will also affect to the other uh, areas connecting to uh, this area. This region is also uh, where several tectonic plates meet. Their movement or changes can cause tremendous hazards, such as earthquake, tsunami, and storm surge. Uh, the consequences are factors or catalysts of water-related disaster that bring loss and damage to mainly coastal areas and islands in this region. As you can see here. Besides, Southeast Asia is also a prone area of destructive weather phenomena like typhoon in Western Pacific Ocean, and uh, cyclone or tropical cyclone in South Pacific and Indian Oceans. The cyclone and typhoon originate over warm tropical oceans as seen in this map, like you can see here. As a result, the, the Philippines is always so awful front uh, to be impacted by these crazy uh, winds. However, most damage to life property and heritage is not from the wind, but from secondary events or the consequences or the impact of the events such as storm surge, flooding and landslides. As mentioned, uh, 
Due to its natural setting, this region cannot avoid being affected by these natural hazards, especially floods and other water-related hazards. So in this map, I would like to show you the uh, recent history of typhoon and flooding events in Southeast Asia, which you can see here. I will uh, share more detail in the next few slides. And obviously, the frequency of flooding and its impacts has increased around the region. So from now uh, for the few uh, slides, I'm going to show you the examples of the water-related hazards occur in this region and uh, give an impact to our heritage. Starting from uh, this one, the uh, 2004 tsunami that uh, affect Phuket, a province in Thailand. I picked up this example as it is an unexpected disaster that Thai people cannot imagine they would experience in their lives, and uh, including me. As we ever told that tsunami does not exist in Thailand, uh, we can go to Japan to experience, but not in Thailand. That's what we ever believed, but it does. Phuket, uh, as I mentioned, the country's most known island and one of the most popular tourist destinations of the country, was surprisingly attacked by tsunami in 2004. Together with other countries located in the tropical oceanic areas from the, the US to uh, Sri Lanka. So the impact of this uh, tsunami is really, really tremendous uh, and cover from the Pacific Ocean to the Indian Ocean. And uh, for certainly for Thai people who never been uh, affected, it cannot imagine how it's going to be. And it's still one of the most tragic of the country. And another uh, unforgettable disaster in the region is uh, Cyclone Nakis in Myanmar. Why uh, the population was suffering from the impacts of this cyclone, um, the uh, authority of the country was requested to accept the humanitarian assistance from international society. I'm not sure if uh, uh, you are still a uh, remember you are from who are from Southeast Asia or from uh, the neighboring uh, region that uh, people at that time are really suffer. So uh, it's even worse for the heritage uh, sites. It was really difficult and limited to know how much heritage was affected uh, due to the uh, political situation in, in the country at that time. Uh, for uh, my own organization, which I'm working for, Simo Spafa, we uh, had a colleagues who are uh, Myanmar people, and he could get the information from uh, the country at that time. So he wrote an article for our journal, uh, which was published uh, uh, a few years after, what hap uh, after it's happened. So uh, for uh, some of you who may be interested in what happened in, in that, uh, at that time, uh, this journal can be downloaded for free uh, at the most powerful journal website. It's uh, really welcome. You can also explore other uh, journal as well. And uh, anyway, this happened in 2008, but uh, it is like a deja vu. A similar circumstances happen again this year, according to Cyclone Mocha, my uh, colleagues who will be a next speaker, I think will give you an updated information. With uh, this natural disaster under the, uh, the, uh, the, how can I say, the political pressure in the countries, it's really difficult for both people and uh, heritage. So uh, we are really pray for uh, Myanmar. And the next uh, devastating disaster uh, in the region is the uh, flood in Ayutthaya as known 2011 flood. The most devastating flood in the history of the country occurred in 2011. And Ayutthaya, which is uh, one of our World Heritage property, was severely uh, affected. On one side, it helped alert the involving organizations like UNESCO and World Heritage Centers, as well as the Thai Authority to take action in order to prevent or protect this World Heritage property from the future threat list uh, or other disaster. Uh, but the constant last only a few years. In fact, after 2011, there 
had been uh, many attempts to uh, try to develop the disaster risk management plan uh, for uh, Ayutthaya World Heritage property, as well as many mitigation measures also uh, uh, implement, uh, try to be implemented. Uh, unfortunately, as I mentioned, this concern lasted only a few years. So uh, many measures and attempts has never been uh, uh, conducted or uh, adopted. Uh, we will talk more about this later. And uh, for the other uh, example from Southeast Asia, uh, in 2013, uh, what happened in the Philippines due to its location? The Philippines is always affected by natural disasters. And in, in 2013, there was one of the most tragic phenomena for the country when uh, it was attacked by an earthquake, then swept out by Typhoon Haiyan, uh, follow uh, back to back the earthquake. So uh, it's like a double hazard that hit the country uh, nearly uh, uh, really, really close, uh, not actually the same time, but just uh, back to back. So uh, this ex example uh, for this uh, event is this picture, which is a shirt in uh, Boho, I think. Uh, this was, was uh, damaged by Haiyan uh, Typhoon, and it was restored and completely uh, in 2021. And just a few months after that, it was uh, exploded again by another cyclone. So uh, this is uh, the situation happened in uh, Philippines, not even for the water-related hazards, but also for the other kind of hazards. And uh, another uh, example is the uh, tsunami that hit uh, Indonesia, particularly uh, at Sulawesi province. It seems to be expected for Indonesia to be hit by tsunami as it is an uh, archipelago amid the oceans where the sources of typhoon and cyclone are, why the area is part of the ring of fire as well. So it can be said that the country is a big competitor to the Philippines. Actually, my Filipino friend ever told me, if the Philippines is a motherland of disasters, Indonesia is a market that you can uh, expect to meet a variety of them. But for a tsunami in 2018, it was uh, a bit uh, surprising. Due to the quake from tectonic plates movement, it was expected and warned for a tsunami Certainly. However, the tsunami was supposed to be uh, at a low height and no more than about two meters. Since the earthquake was a strike slip earthquake, which usually does not have enough vertical movement to create large tsunamis, but it was later explained that the earthquake may trigger underwater landslides causing the tsunami. As such, uh, a harbor which should have been safe was also affected. That's why the damage and uh, loss in uh, this tragic event is uh, much higher than it should be. And uh, the last example for uh, Southeast Asia is uh, Hoi An, which is also the World Heritage uh, property. It's a historic town uh, located along a river. It's uh, actually, the picture I show you is the flood, uh, the flooding season in 2022. But in fact, uh, if you are going to uh, search for the event for Hoi An in uh, Google search, you will see the flood, uh, the flooding season happen every year. So um, it's happened too often. So it's called like a season uh, for uh, many people. And uh, for for some uh, aspect, it's also uh, op op how can I say op optimistically uh, considered as a kind of uh, tourist opportunity. So they uh, organize uh, a guide tour uh, to bring people to see Hoi An during the flooding season by boat, as you can see in in the right pictures. But certainly, it's it's not our main purpose uh, for tourist. Uh, Purposes it should be all right, but for cons heritage conservation, I still uh, suspicious 
is that uh, a, a proper to let it be this uh, condition every year? So we have many lessons that we uh, can learn, but I'm still wondering if it's really learned or it's never been learned. Uh, I'm going to take some examples from uh, what I uh, the issues I raised. This is an information about floods occurring in uh, Ayutthaya, the uh, heritage uh, property uh, in Thailand. From this chart, uh, it can be seen that there have been a major flood in uh, many years in uh, since 1931. Uh, 1831, 1942, 1945, and 2011. Actually, this is uh, about a uh, 200-year history of uh, Ayutthaya. And so uh, you can uh, notice from around the mid of the 20th centuries, uh, the uh, flood have happened more frequent and also uh, more severe. What happened uh, from that period? Uh, so I uh, searched back into the history of the country around that period and found that it's the period that Thailand started implementing the National Social and Economic Development Plan, which was a result to a big leap in urbanization, industrialization, and infrastructure con uh, construction, particularly in the central plain of the country where it is a floodplain area by nature, and now has been suffering from floods nearly every year. So even it is aware and still memorable that 2011 flooding is the most tragic disaster for UTR. Uh, with assistance and support from several countries, various mitigation measures have been proposed, such as building and encircled dike around most individual industrial estates uh, in Ayutthaya by the uh, investor from the other countries, and the attempt to escalate an embankment along the river as well as around the city island where this World Heritage property is located. The, the mitigation measures can be considered that uh, some measures may uh, make another impact to uh, the value of the World heritage properties and other heritage sites uh, other than the direct impact from the flood. Fortunately, after a few years, they, uh, these measures were neglected because of the occurrence of drought instead. And But there was also the other side of uh, what, what happened. Uh, people forgot and believed that Ayutthaya would not be flooded like in 2011 again. But it did. As you can see uh, in this slide, I'm showing the pictures from 2017, 2021, 2022. So actually, it's always happened and happened. And uh, uh, the response from the authority uh, or involving organization uh, has never been changed. Another example I picked up uh, is what happened in what we call the Old Town Phuket in Thailand, which can be a uh, reflection to the other historic cities in Southeast Asia as well. So for Phuket, it is weird that the city located on an island is flooded. Why uh, the water should be drained to the sea, in fact. This problem happens in most historical areas or towns in Southeast Asia, where are under development pressures and urbanization. This is not actually a flood as it is, but uh, it's likely a water block due to the failures of irrigation system of the city. But certainly, uh, the uh, the level of uh, rainfall is also very high uh, in some season. That's why the uh, irrigation system, the drainage system, is not uh, does not work. But look at this uh, map. It's the historical map of Phuket in the early 20th century. I'm not sure if if uh, you can see, I use the uh, the circle from my mouth. Uh, this is a big river, and this is the, the area which was the history uh, town of uh, Phuket. 
and it's still it's still there and uh yeah uh it's now it's the heart of the uh old town of this uh province and here there is a, a big uh tunnel running uh through uh the city and uh go to the the sea And uh, the canal uh, was used for transportation of minerals for process and also helped uh, to uh, drain the water into the sea, as I mentioned. And this slide showing the uh, present day Phuket. And uh, from uh, this uh, map, you can still see the canal is still here. And this is the uh, the historic area of uh, Phuket. The water, uh, the canal is still here, but uh, Obviously, it was it is much uh smaller. Uh, it was outside somehow. Uh, I don't know why. And once ever disconnected with the sea. And uh, this is also showing you the pictures of Phuket. Uh, in the early twentieth centuries and in the recent years in two thousand seventeen. On uh the left hand side in the picture. If you look at this, you can see there's the on uh along the uh, road you can see a big gutter, which actually uh, this gutter can uh, also see in many the street uh, town uh, the 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 town of the state of Malacca, like in Penang or in uh, Malacca in Malaysia. Uh, I'm not sure even in Singapore there's still some trash. I I I think. But uh, in, in Phuket, in the old picture, you can also see, but look at uh, your right uh, pictures. It's already gone. Uh, the gutters disappear from the pictures. Uh, I'm not sure uh, if there's still underground uh, water uh, drainage system, but perhaps as the other city in the country, if there is, it will be a really small uh, a, a group. And uh, this perhaps a like, clearer picture, you can see there's there's only a uh, a small hole to drain uh, water from from the road, but uh in many uh in the other pictures on your right hand side, the big gutter is also disappear, and in uh your bottom uh left, you can see. Uh, the canal which I mentioned, it's uh, smaller, it's narrow, it's very really narrow. Comparing to the old pictures uh, in the past, it's wide enough uh, for the ship to access to this city. Uh, so I think uh, I'm going to conclude in uh, these two slides. We can see that uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, from the beginning of my presentation, uh, we, we you can see that we live by the river and uh the sea and we ever know how to live with them in fact mm, according to our natural settings water related settlements was one of our main living patterns and now today there are only a few a very few settlements uh in the region and this slide uh you can see some examples of these water related settlement in vietnam Myanmar, Cambodia, and Thailand, but are they're still in the other countries in the region, like in Brunei, Indonesia, and also in the Philippines. And but today, climate change is a big uh, global issue. Uh, however, I would like to add that we also change. Uh, the way of uh, the way we live has changed. While our towns and cities have also been trans transformed over time. Uh, certainly for us. We can't stop change. Our way of life must have evolved. Our cities need to be reshaped and redeveloped for better living conditions. But we need to learn from the past, the good lessons, as well as the failures, and act with respect for our uh, nature. Don't forget what happened in the past. It should be a lesson that we should learn. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Ataya. Uh a very interesting presentation. Yes, I think we never learn. <laughs> I have to say that uh, there, for me, uh, for 15 years, nothing changed from the, yes. the beginning. <laughs> I think so.
I hope then this, this can be a good uh, lesson then we, we can uh, not continue to do the same mistakes in the future. So uh, thank you very much again. And I would like to invite the, uh, Omar Mio from Ikomos Myanmar. Thank you, Omar. Space is yours. So greetings to you all and uh, thank you Zineb and uh, Veronica for the inviting for inviting me to do the presentation here and thank you Hataya to recommend me to do the presentation. So today I like to present about the uh, challenges which Myanmar heritage is facing after the cyclone Mocha which struck in May of this year. Broadly speaking, numerous heritage sites across Myanmar are grappling with survival in conflicts, climate change and insufficient management, uh, and then conflicts are the real uh, problems having uh, Myanmar heritage is now facing. So, in, but in this presentation, I focus on how the weather changes are harming the numerous uh, monuments and heritage sites. So many heritage sites in Myanmar have this um, pervasive uh, challenges related to the conservation of monuments and landscape management and the lack of disaster risk reduction. And these issues primarily stemmed on factors such as floods, unusually heavy rainfall, insufficient adherence to rules and regulations, and safety concerns. The cumulative effect of these challenges poses significant obstacles to the proper maintenance of the site. So in the Erawadi uh, Basin, let me talk about the few ancient cities first. The three ancient cities of Hanlin in Sagan region, Baitano in Magui region, and Sri Kisra in Bago region are remnants of the few kingdoms that spent 11 centuries from 200 BC to 980 with various ruins from raw religious and protection, protection buildings and remnants of an irrigation system, they display a rich Buddhist culture. The serial, the serial nomination of these three sites was inscribed on the World Heritage List in 2014. During Cyclone Mocha, Sri Kisra and Begno sites did not sustain any damages as the cyclone hit the west and the north of Myanmar. However, the information from Harlin site could not be received due, the, due to the conflicts in that region, unfortunately. After Cyclone Mocha, the town closest to the Bethano, it's called Downwenji, which is located approximately 11 miles away and housing the Department of Archaeology office, experienced severe flooding during the same period. The heavy rain uh, caused um, the water levels to rise significantly, reaching up to five feet above the ground level in the town. So despite the flattening in the vicinity, the monuments at Bay the Nopu ancient city remained unharmed, showcasing their resilience against natural elements. Nevertheless, the safety issues arising from the regional conflicts pose significant, pose significant challenges to ensuring the protection and preservation of its historical site. And for Sri Kisra site, as less important to the heavy rain in the property zone, only the building from the colonial period had the roof damage. However, the damage to colonial era buildings, particularly their roofs, highlights the vulnerability of more recent structures to heavy rain. This leads to the consideration of necessary repairs, improvements to ensure conservation and preservation of these later historical buildings within the site. So now I would like to talk about the Bakan which is the most important heritage sites in Myanmar, as well as which is the, the most uh, challenges facing area. So Bagan Cultural Heritage Sites is at a bend in the Ayawri River between the hill of Tanji Down uh, and Tuyin Down in central Myanmar. The site is located in the Nyaung district of the Mandali region and the Pakoku district of the Magui region. 
The property covers 50 square kilometers and the buffer zone has 180 square kilometers. The landscape covers over 3,000 monuments, along with two towns and over 40 villages. Bagan is an ancient capital city of the First Union of Myanmar, and uh, which was founded in 1044 AD and went through a major building spree during the 11th to 13th centuries. So at Category 5, very severe cyclone Mocha directly hit the west coast of Myanmar from May 14 to 16 in 2023. As a result, Bagan, a region characterized by minimal rainfall, despite being in the central dry zone for three consecutive days of heavy rain, experienced flash floods and heavy rainfall exceeded the ground's ability to absorb it. So these are the rainfall, uh, uh, daily rainfall in Bagan in during these three days, like 6.34 inches, 4.33 inches, and 5.08 inches. So it makes uh, damage 59 monuments with the floods in the presence of the 15 monuments, including the four monuments of the grade one category. So floods can render certain areas of the Bakan Warhead site temporarily inaccessible. Roads, pathways, and bridges become submerged or washed away, making it a challenge to visitors to reach specific temples or navigate the sites. And uh, flat waters carry sediment and debris and which accumulate around the base of temples and pagodas. The deposition of sediment can affect the stability of the structures and necessitate subsequent cleaning and maintenance efforts. So these are the pictures of the floods in, in Bakan. In during because of these uh, heavy rainfall during three days, and then Bakan was flooded for like two weeks. So these are the maps showing the flooded area. So the green one are the the one to dip this the the earth, uh, to what you call it? yeah, um, uh, to make it lower, in lieu of the culvert for water to pass over and drain off, and that the right triangles are the monuments, and the long yellow line here is the moat, and the red lines are the creeks. So to mitigate the impact of floods, various measures have been implemented. These include the construction of embankments, levees, drainage systems to manage water flow and prevent excessive flooding. That, so the uh, Department of Archaeology urgently uh, respond to these floods by uh, constructing, uh, constructing those kind of drainage. So, but uh, we are not very sure whether these uh, drainage have impacts to the monuments or not, because uh, they cannot follow any guidelines to protect the monuments at that time. So their own uh, ambition is to just uh, water uh, can uh, flow to the Aari River. So when they are assessing the site to find the natural waterways and ancient waterways, so these kinds of like ancient drainage are also found, but unfortunately, most of them are in the uh, private property area, so it cannot be revived again. So challenges have emerged regarding subsurface archaeology during the drainage construction because the lack of appropriate technology or the proper archeological risk map and skills have hindered efforts to identify and preserve ancient objects located beneath the surface. So when they uh, uh, dig the soil and then they found like this uh, terracotta pipes from the ancient Bagan period, and also they found like, like terracotta tablets 
the knee. So it means that maybe this area, it used to uh, have the ancient pagoda or some religious monument. It is because in Bagan, uh, we don't have any protection for the subsurface archaeology till now. So uh, most of this, this uh, subsurface uh, objects are destroyed by the development projects and, and constructing new buildings. Of course, the, some of the uh, parts of the monuments are damaged because of the heavy rain. And most of the damaged parts are the newly reconstructed parts, like this photo. And then also we have like a newly constructed new monuments because Pagan is a living heritage site. So we can also see the newly constructed uh, monuments. And this is the, the real ancient um, enclosure walls of the monuments. It, also it was also damaged due to the heavy rain. Again, according to the government policy, they don't want to see any damages for long. So the Department of Archaeology was forced to renovate all those damaged monuments very fast. So it is very doubtful that uh, they can follow all the rehabilitation guidelines and conservation guidelines mentioned and approved in the uh, integrated management framework, which was uh, also endorsed by the government when uh, we submitted the nomination dossier to get the World Heritage in 2019. So in this picture, you can see the Damat Yasaka uh, photo taken in 1980s, and then nowadays Damat Yasaka. Pagoda. So now this Tamayasaga Pagoda was struck by a thunderbolt on the 17th September 2023. And the assumption is that the electrical charge from the from the thunderstorm affected the metals, especially the gold-plated bronze plates leading to this impact. So originally the stupa was the brick structure with no gilded things, but now the for the renovation, for doing uh, making merits and then the whole stupa has been now uh, covered with gold plates and then maybe this is the a kind of a challenges one of the challenges to have the impacts to the monuments in Bagan because of uh, merit making uh, traditions and the surplus rain fosters the growth of weeds on the monuments, posing threats to their structural integrity and aesthetics as well. Uh, because in Bagan, there are more than 3,000 monuments, and then there's not enough uh, staff to look after all these monuments. And because of the rain and because of more uh, uh, plantation, so these weeds are always grown, overly grown on the monuments. And this is the, one of the challenges facing in Pekan right now. So the please look at the photo of the ancient monuments with the over, overgrown and then the, the landscape, the view of the this landscape nowadays, and the view of Bakan in this photo was taken in 1970. So actually, Bakan monuments are brick monuments, and they have been existed uh, existed for like uh, 900 years now because of. They have been there for in the dry zone with only a little rain. But now, nowadays, more trees, more rains, and they have the very, uh, they give the negative impact. And then another challenge is for the Buddhist people, they want to grow the trees in the religious land, thinking that, believing that 
this is a kind of merit making. So you can see the si different sizes of trees here. And also you can see this uh, green boxes, which is also grown the young trees to be grown. So different sizes, different heights of trees. You can see, although the gun is already overgrown and overgreen with many trees, but they are still doing plantation. So because of this uh, over more moisture, because of over plantation and more rain, you can see the molded uh, bricks outside and then brick layers are separated inside. And then there's a, a problem with this murals and terracotta plaques. So a lot of uh, this uh, kind of impacts you can see in the monuments, both outside and inside. And then after finishing Bagan, and then I, I want to talk a little bit about the Mandalay. So Mandalay is the second largest city, and then it was the capital of the last capital of Burmese king, and it is regarded as a cultural center. So it was founded in, in 1857 by King Mindo. So Mandalay, we can still see the brick monuments like Mandalay Palace walls and Mandalay Moat, and also the brick monastery with the uh, colonial architectural style mixed with the uh, uh, Burmese style and as well as with the Western style. And also we can see the vernacular architecture with a very big monasteries and uh, with mosaics, the in, uh, interior decorations. But some of the mo wooden monasteries from these 19th centuries are not maintained properly. So they have survived the wear and tear of this time. And also now they are now threatened by the unusual rains and floods in Mandalay region. So another uh, significant event happened in 29th October this year again. This is Upain Bridge. This is a wooden bridge about uh, 200 years old. During this festival day on the 29th October, the two segments of the bridge collapsed due to the high volume of people and resulting 15 injuries. So this subsequent repair work involved the use of new wood and the replacement was done without following any conservation guidelines. So these uh, wooden structures are losing their authenticities as well as their strength. So another uh, heritage site is Inwa. So Inwa is the Inwa was the significant Myanmar capital for almost 360 years from 1365 to 1842. So it is situated at the confluence of, confluence of two rivers, Erawadi and Dotawadi. The city faces always heightening susceptibility to seasonal and irregular floods exacerbated by climate change. So this area has over 400 monuments and encompassing city walls, semi-functional modes, and palace sites too. But unfortunately, many of these structures are currently in dear need of restoration and maintenance. So when we classify the damage and we can see all kinds of the structural damage and non-constructive damage in those heritage sites. Sorry. So it is evident that uh, the significant heritage sites in Myanmar require technical support from the international community because since 2021, due to the political instability, the uh, international heritage organization like UNESCO and Getty Conservation Institute left uh, Myanmar since then. And then now this uh, Myanmar heritage uh, severely needs the international community to give the technical support. So now Simio Spaffer has started the initial project to give the technical support to Myanmar. And this, uh, the emergency response and risk preparedness plan must be updated 
with these international standards and applicable guidelines for with the community engagement too. And conducting further research to properly address and repair damaged segments of monuments following the conservation guideline mentioned in the integrated management framework. It is also important to consider reviewing the government's policy regarding the repair and restri restoration of damaged monuments, especially with a focus on avoiding the pressure to expedite these processes within a short time frame. Because of this hastening time frames, this historic significant structures and monuments can potentially lead to se several issues such as sustainability, longevity, authenticity, and cultural value. So development of plans and guidelines to prevent adverse impacts on subsurface archaeology, particularly regarding drainage systems, should be considered. Enhancement of site management through increased train staffing, improved coordination, and stricter enforcement of relevant laws and regulations are needed. So these revisions will be made to enhance the effectiveness and com comprehensiveness of the plan in addressing potential risks and emergencies related to the heritage sites in Myanmar. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Omar, uh, for giving us a little first-hand information that we always uh, wonder what is the situation related to flood in Myanmar. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, I would like to invite the next speaker, Claude Arnold uh, C. Sambu uh, from International Scientific Committee on Water and Heritage. Stage is your cloud. Uh, Omar, is it possible to stop your presentation? Hello? Stop the presentation, sharing the presentation. My presentation. Okay. You see my, pre my presentation? Yeah, uh, I think, yeah, you can share now, Cloud. This is okay. Uh, we did not see yet. Uh, ah, yes, it's coming. Yes, we can see it. Thank you. Okay. I can't, I can't. I think uh, is, is it possible to change the mode of presentation because we can use your private screen part. I don't I don't change my, my presentation. You don't see the, the presentation? No, we see the presentation, but we see the presentation with the notes, but I think uh I don't know how to. Um, just as. Uh, Claude, is it possible to stop sharing for a second because it's freezing our screen? If if you go to the presentation mode now, I think you won't have any problem, which is the little uh, screen icon on the right bottom of your window. I don't understand. Claude, on the very bottom, you see where there's like and a little gray a, square? Um, no. Could you, back could you click more. on the icon that looks like a computer screen, which is right next to the three dots? Mm 
Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, okay, please give me five, five minutes. Huh? I want to, okay, I, I can go. Go to Kiza. You don't see uh, my, my presentation? We see it, Claude, you can go. Oh, he's on that speed that- I can begin. I can begin. I mean, it's okay. We can continue like that. I think it's, it's a difficult to change the uh, mode of the presentation. Yes, please, you can start. I can start. Yeah. I'm uh, happy to be uh, able to give this presentation today uh, on the climatic context and source of uh, food risk for heritage in Burkina Faso. My subject uh, is the climate and urban context source of risk of. Uh, flooding of cultural heritage. In a uh, well situation in Burkina Faso, case of the National Museum uh, you know, of the Society of World War II. To begin with, uh, the main point to be discussed will be a flooding factor in Society of World War II. Flood wakes uh, the museum's situation in the first uh, in the face of flow to extra proposed solutions. My, present, my presentation is as follows. Introduction, floats a uh, factor and fluid works. Uh, a story uh, and situation of the museum facing fluid works. Proposal for a solution and a conclusion. By uh, way of introduction, uh, we would just like to, to point out uh, that African societies have undergoing perpetual urban, urbanization due to a large population and poor lands used for housing drainage channel. As there's factors, more the effect of uh, climate change, uh, such as uh, the heavy rains in Wagodobo can cause major damage to people and cultural property. We can mention three types of factors. Uh, there are natural factors, climatic, um, impermeable soils, heavy rains, and poor sanitation. Demographic factors, repeat uh, population growth, and uh, repeat uh, urbanization and poor pipeline. In these pictures, you will uh, notice that the site of Ouagadougou is floating. This happened on 1st September 2009 during a heavy rainstorm. Women and children as well as vulnerable people moving around which risking their lives. Cloach pipes caused by plastic waste prevent weather from uh, driving her away quickly in the heaven of uh, heavy winds. This grief shows a study of the increase in the population of uh, Burkina Faso over a five year period. This growing population also has an impact on in the heaven of heavy rainfall due to the effect of climate change. This demographic requires a much large, larger evacuation channel. 
the risk of flooding are the nature of the soils who are the urban uh, planning in the site of Wadibu in adequate uh, maintenance of drainage or network and uh, a rapidly grow growing population in order to access the potential risk in certain areas of the city of Wadibu. A study was carried out by Metrology and showed in the graph below. Uh, this is a blue zones. Zones have fluid zones. Rich areas are very fluid prone areas. What about the National Museum? The National Museum was uh, established in uh, 1962, the measure has been distinct, distinguished by a slow evolution due to the occupation of inadequate permits, lack of permanent occupation site. And 2004, after uh, 40 years of existence, uh, the measure obtained a definitive site, but the lack uh, of qualification of caliph stay for the conservation and enhancement of cultural property is still wearing, especially in case of natural disasters, knowing uh, that the risk of flooding in the society of Wadibu are enormous. Uh, there is also the case of the Wadibu cinematic, which represents a cultural heritage for us. Uh, this is an uh, anterior of the cinematic in February 2009. Uh, the African Farm Library was set up in 1989 in response to a call from the Pan African Federation of uh, Filmmakers to make copies of a film available to Facebook. Subsequently, we were able to collect many files. In 2009, we had already had almost 2,000 copies of film at the Cinematic African in Wadabugu from the archives of Burkina Faso. However, images are part of Burkina Faso's cultural heritage as we use of them to educate and inform our different generation in Burkina Faso. Unfortunately, in September uh, 2009, a flu desktop film la library. To my right, uh, you can see uh, notice the interior of the cinematic uh, content the film, Hell Chasen, uh, 1960. To my left, you can see the desolation caused by uh, the flooding of the cinematic. Uh, we forced we forced uh, the technician to uh, move the equipment uh, out of the building. What lesson uh, did uh, the workers have the work to go cinematic land from the world? The cinematic as uh, digital is a harmless form and I play over process. However, overall, we propose uh, the following recommendation for the major and a friend library. This is uh, the construction of a new building incorporating an effective emergency plan and training fund digitization professional for the cinematic. Proposal of solution ensure the presence of the well-constructed reserve room. In order to collect the various cultural assets, there are home display at the National Museum. In case of the natural disasters, integrate the digitization of film content in the reels and adapt to the evolution of technology for the cinematic. From groups of experts in conservation and restoration and many others exclusively for unexpected flooding. Increase the number of scale works, uh, workers in case of uh, natural disasters uh, for the National Museum.
integrate all stake holders in society, community involvement and administrative authorities for the rapid security of cultural property. Establish an adequate safeguarding plan for the National Museum in the heaven of a flood emergency. Perform flood simulation in practice and theory, computer simulation. As a conclusion, flood can cause irreparable in irreparable damage to various cultural property. Geospedia is in the preservation of collective memory. The fragility of cultural heritage in the, in the face of a strict underline the crucial importance of identifying adaptation and mitigation strategy. And so the involvement of the community authorities and scientists in the development of an emergency plan to safeguard cultural property in the case of unexpected flooding due to hearing winds. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Kambu, for uh, giving us a chance to understand uh, a bit more about the flood problem in Burkina Faso. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh -huh. You can stop the, uh, sharing your screen. And uh, I think the next presenter uh, will, be a, will be a video presentation that our colleague will not be able to have a, a connection from internet and uh, he will share his presentation with you. Mm. Okay. And the uh, next presenter, uh, the video presentation will belongs to Dr. John Peterson, president of International Scientific Community on Archaeological Heritage Management. So I thought you can stop the sharing. Uh, Claude, there is an uh, icon on top of your screen that says stop share. Could you please stop sharing your screen with us? Claude, c'est dans la partie d'en haut. Pardon. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm John Peterson. I'm with the, uh, I'm the president, in fact, of the International Committee for Archaeology. Of the effects of those earlier flood disasters, and also looking at how in the present. Good afternoon. I'm John Peterson. I'm with the uh, I'm the president, in fact, of the International Committee for Archaeological Heritage Management. Today, how archaeology can be used as a tool for discerning past disasters, looking at some of the causes and some of the effects of those earlier flood disasters, and also looking at how in the present and for the future we might be able to use some of that knowledge to look forward at issues like uh, how climate change will impact the landscape in the future. I'm talking mostly from the point of view of uh, Cebu in the uh, central Visayas of the Philippines. Here you see the Philippines, Cebu, Cebu City here, and the region generally here, although we'll talk briefly about something in Butuan as well. In the downtown area of Cebu, uh, in in uh, Cebu City and Cebu, we've been working now for almost 20 years gathering data and using that of other previous researchers to look at how this landform here, this coastal plain emerged since the last glaciation 
and then also how the Spanish who came and found some raised land with soils and native settlements took advantage of those stable landscapes and began to develop uh, plazas, presidio, and ecclesiastical structures. Uh, they also then gradually expanded into the rest of the flood, uh, coastal floodplain, and uh, that influenced and impacted how river channels that had formed there over actually millennia uh, then began to conform to some of the changes. Some of the areas we'll look at is the, are this Tenago Marsh, the Parion Church here, uh, and then these esteros that impacted a lot of the changes along the shoreline. We used also modern uh, hazard mapping done by uh, uh, some of the uh, urban uh, planners in the Cebu area. And they note that even today, these are problems for flooding uh, that you'll see as we go along. Back to the 1873 map of the area, uh, what, what we see is an emergent landscape that probably wasn't really there. It was probably underwater 2,000 years ago, and we'll look at that in a minute. But these esteros became very important uh, uh, nodes for commerce. Uh, boats uh, were carried, carrying goods up and down the, the, the esteros, uh, but also draining some areas that uh, had probably been in floodplain for quite a long time. The uh, highland here, which is quite a, easily a foot or two higher, will show up in some of the LIDAR mapping we'll look at later, uh, actually had been stable enough for soils to form on, as had some other areas, for example, up here in the Paria. We'll look at that too. The uh, city, as we then began to map it, included areas where we had soil profiles taken by Masao Nishimura in the, uh, uh, 18, in the 1990s, uh, showed some areas. He, he described soils forming in some areas. He described overbank flooding deposits in other areas. And the Tanago Marsh, of course, we'll look at relative to some archeological work later. Uh, but the marsh actually, it turns out to have been a, uh, a a very unstable element in the landscape. You see it here relative to that Parion church that I mentioned earlier. Uh, but it had an opening to the sea probably around uh, 2,000 or more years ago. Uh, gradually that filled in. Now it's completely built over by urban by an urban imprint, urban landscape. Uh, but the opening to the sea uh, was a huge. Um, uh, in, inlet for, for marine uh, waters that created a mangrove swamp, a brackish water swamp back in this area. Gradually, though, as that inlet was closed off, and the reason for that, of course, was lowering sea level, that I'll get to in a minute, uh, as, that, as that opening was closed off, sediments began to form, uh, freshwater sediments began to form in the, in the uh, marsh. Uh, we see that changing environment in archaeological studies that we've done. Then finally it was closed over and then ultimately uh, by actually the last uh, 50 years or so, it has completely been filled in um, and uh, an urban landscape built over it. The, uh, the Parion, which is here, was a church that was built in around a little bit after the first part of the 17th century in the early 1600s. Uh, it was a magnificent church. You can see the structure here. Unfortunately, it ran afoul of ecclesiastical history, and uh, it was forced to be torn down in the late 1800s by uh, the bishop of Cebu, who felt that it was competing too much for uh, tithes and revenues from burial grounds and so forth with the uh, dominant uh, Augustinian church. This was more of a uh, a church of, uh, of, of people, native native peoples in the in in the region who were coming to this church, it was torn down, and uh, now it's a, it's a pretty much a, a kind of a conglomerate of housing in the area. But we did some excavation because during a development project for a uh, for a gymnasium. Um, portions of the earlier church walls were found. And we went in to explore that and also then to look at the relationship of that church walls with the present landscape and with the building of the Parion Church above it. What we found was really, uh, uh, really interesting because at the bottom we found an unconsolidated gravels. 
we found uh, an area where there was a sort of a, a gradual uh, evidence for soil formation and a BT horizon, as they're called, uh, in the upper level, and a stable soil over the top of that. We did radiocarbon dating, and the stable soil dated uh, to around calendar years 16th century, up to maybe as late as the very end of the 16th century. But the two lower levels are almost identical, even though one was a meter above the other. And we attribute to this to a, probably a very rapid flood episode here early on that led to uh, aggradation, buildup of soils. But then on top of that landscape, uh, finally a, a period of, of uh, slower sedimentation allowed a soil to form that was stable and permanent and gradually permanent enough or perceived to be permanent enough that a church was built on top. But uh, if you'll recall that earlier picture of the uh, Esteros here, that would have been right between them. So these two drainages here were contributing a lot of, of water uh, for these channels that were used for commerce, but also a lot of soils during overbank flooding. Uh, the uh, Probably the oldest uh, drainage in the region, in the in the area there in the coastal plain, was this one here, uh, and these then changed over time. We could see evidence by combining this different imagery that these these channels actually changed. And there's a model of uh, river uh, channel formation that shows generally it it flows uh, coast uh, co uh, along a coast. Uh, parallel with the onshore current, which is would have been to this direction, and these channels would then would then fill until would would flow until they were filled, and then overbank flooding would lead to probably the creation of another channel, and so on, and then sometimes they would revert back to older drainages depending on the elevation of the sediments during particular times and different flood events. Um, so doing all this research, combining pro uh, pro profiles from uh, earlier work. Uh, contemporary archaeological work and uh, stratigraphic analysis, we kind of began to come up with a picture of what was happening along the floodplain. Another element of this that's important to note is the blue area here in this LIDAR imagery uh, shows a lower elevation than the yellow and then of the orange. You can see this over here. And we interpret this whole area to have been underwater uh, as late as 2,000 years ago when sea levels would have been about two meters higher than today, maybe receding a little by then, but between 2,000 and 6,000 years ago, sea levels in the Western Pacific were about two meters higher than today because of a very warm period when glaciers were melting. And that was a very brief period. Uh, we'll be looking at that relative to future predictions, uh, but a very brief period that uh, actually uh, we need to be aware of for uh, future uh, uh, lifeways along the coast. Um, we can see that the the, uh, the dynamics the, the dynamic of sea level change in this model uh, from Guam, where the present sea level uh, is at the, this level here, this elevation here, and it shows a, a large uh, lagoonal, uh, a, a coral reef lagoon here, right off the area of Tumon in Guam, and uh, when sea level was two meters higher, it would have been at this elevation here. That was pretty recent, and that's significant because that's about the same level that we're anticipating sea levels to rise in the next uh, few decades to several decades, uh, a very, very significant difference in elevation, as you can see, and that's going to have an enormous impact. But also, going back to the other map, we can see that that area was probably within that uh, zone of two meter higher sea, sea level uh, uh, 2000 plus years ago. And this coastal plain here would not have been formed yet. These river channels probably all formed after that. We have other data from the interior of the uh, marsh uh, that shows uh, at, at this level here, at the deepest level, a date of about uh, 4,000 years ago. 4,000 to 4,500 years ago as calibrated. And in this zone, as well as in some the higher zones, which also appear to have been deposited relatively quickly, uh, around 600, 500 to 600 AD in this zone here. Uh, and you can see the difference in, in uh, lithography here too, very different kinds of sediments. But we get a consistent story of uh, 
uh, brackish water or, or uh, onshore marshes with the uh, mangroves and such plants, but also a lot of other kinds of species uh, probably that would have been used by people living near this area uh, that were washed in. And from the very bottom, we get evidence for rice starch all the way up from the top. So some of the oldest rice here in the Philippines uh, was probably in areas like this as old as 4,500 years ago. Uh, and we think it probably was an upland Sweden rice. And this shows how those landscapes were uh, already being disturbed enough that sediments were flowing into areas like this coast and marsh along the uh, shoreline. So here we see again how this uh, various kinds of data can be drawn together to get a picture of what was happening on the uh, uh, coastal plain. Uh, if we look at this image here, if we think of this as being probably around the limit of the higher sea stand, this is a rather pronounced escarpment. Uh, and 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 it's fairly level below that, so we're thinking that probably this whole area was part of that, and these river channels were forming and meandering, uh, but leaving exposed some high ground as interfluves, they're called, or areas between drainages that uh, stayed high and dry and that supported the development of soils. There's another element of what we've learned along the shore there in the Cebu City. Uh, if we look at a uh, uh, a curve of the uh, uh, sea levels based on global data, uh, we see that in the last glacial, full glacial period, about 20,000 years ago, sea level was about 140 meters lower than today. That's stunning, and it's an incredible story to tell to people in Cebu City who feel quite comfortable uh, at the edge of the sea today. But the edge of the sea was out in a much more narrow canyon than today, and the sea level is much, much lower than today. And we see an enormously uh, rapid up uh, turn of sea level from that period. Uh, and you can see by about uh, eight or 10,000 years ago, it's already up to 40 meters below uh, present. Uh, but as we get up to uh, this elevation, well, in relatively and very ra rapid growth of uh, sea level or, uh, in this period here, and then up toward the present, and we just barely show that blip over the two meters here. This 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 chart didn't really. Uh, this was done before, but we had a lot of information on the higher sea stand. But you can see that's an incredibly rapid change, and we were able to discern this in a project we did on an area called the Patria, which was a residential uh, commercial structure built uh, just south of that Parion district. And from the geotechnical coring, you can see a zone of very dense clay down around 10 to 15 meters below surface. And if we look at the clay that came out, you see this formation here. And this is really good evidence for a long-term stable marsh environment would have been right along the, the, the then coastline, which was out from today by probably about 50 to, a, to 60 meters. Uh, we did radiocarbon dating and what we found was that the clays closer to the present uh, shoreline would have been about 5,000 years ago, but as it was deeper and closer and farther from the present shore, uh, those clays dated 7,000 uh, years ago and shows that there was actually uh, an, in, an, in, uh, an increasing area of marsh formation as sea level rose, and that this was an area of a coastal marsh, probably uh, marine, probably brackish, uh, probably something like a mangrove swamp. We have that data out currently for pollen and phytolith analysis, uh, but this is probably some of the earlier evidence of how the uh, how sea level has has significantly impacted coastal regions, and then later continued to through uh, the stranding of that uh, uh, old carbonate plat platform that became a stable level area uh, un underneath the sea, but later supporting uh, landscape formation. At the edge of that sea, in some other areas of Cebu, we see the present sea, but in this area here, which we can see exposed here, and with these artifacts, we get evidence from about 2,000 to 3,000 years ago of people living right at the edge of the sea. Uh, they used stone tools, they made pottery, uh, they exploited uh, shellfish and other uh, items from both the interior of the lagoon and from the marshes nearby that would have been mangroves. But it was a dynamic environment where these kinds of environments were, were incredibly important to local uh, uh, 
uh, subsistence and local settlement. Uh, the changes in river histories and flooding uh, had probably very significant impacts on the environment. You, here you can see a satellite imagery in Vigan, uh, which is in uh, northern Luzon, actually, stepping away from the Visayas briefly. But this was an early Spanish settlement. It's a beautiful uh, rectilinear uh, urban Spanish landscape uh, there in northern Philippines, one of the earliest major settlements. Uh, and it's interesting because it's a World Heritage Site, actually. It's interesting because you can see relic channels. And if you kind of extend this, you can see that probably this uh, channel from the old Abra River was probably a significant builder of this entire landscape, much like we were showing there in downtown Cebu. Uh, at some point, it was cut off. Probably this is slightly higher land. We haven't really ground truthed this. But the concern here is for the World Heritage Site. The Abra River is expected to be more, more and more in flood stage due to changes in uh, uh, the climate along the coast. We expect uh, periods of drought uh, punctuated by intense rainfall, which we're seeing already throughout the Philippines. And there's a significant danger that this could break through to those old channels. So we really need to be keeping an alert eye toward these channel formations, these channel histories, and look to where we need to possibly be doing some remediation, uh, but also look to where these might have originally formed because of changes in those uh, river channel histories. And now another area in the southern part of uh, the Visayas in Butuan in uh, Mindanao, very northern uh, part of Mindanao. Uh, there's an area that, that uh, was probably impacted very, very significantly by sea level change and also intense flooding and possibly other environmental hazards like possibly typhoons or earthquakes, landslides and so forth. But in Bhutan is an area, in Butuan is an area where, and we see it here, you can see the, the relic channels of the river. Uh, and then here where there was a map made that shows uh, boats that were found in the old meander scar of the river. And here in this, uh, LIDAR image, you can see them uh, also in the old meander scar. And the significance of this is that a number of boats, now I think there are 10 or 11, there were nine at that time, uh, have been excavated. And the dates on these all very closely, uh, they don't exactly overlap, but they're very close. And those of you that know about radiocarbon dating know it's not a particularly precise science, but within the ballpark, these boats look like they may have all sunk actually in one particular flood event. If we look at the boats themselves that were emerged, uh, that were that are now emergent, they were discovered through some construction projects and now more and more are being found. You can see it's within about uh, uh, two meters of the surface. We've done uh, pollen and phytolith analysis of this that show it's almost identical, uh, the uh, makeup of the uh, uh, floral environment uh, throughout the formation of this, suggesting a rather even but a rapid uh, uh, sedimentation. And it looks like the boats, at least in my interpretation, were probably all uh, buried in a single event. Uh, this would show a tremendous amount of uh, uh, impact from possibly a single storm that led to the channel avulsion into what's now a modern channel and uh, the stranding of those boats in a channel here that may have even uh, been been completely inundated and completely buried uh, in, in that single storm or in relatively short order with a number of smaller events, uh, but within a short period of time. So we see the power of these storms, we see the power of flooding, and we see the recurrence of it through uh, various kinds of geological uh, formations on floodplains. Uh, rivers are predictable, at least generally they're predictable. Specifically, they may not be. But I think for the future, we're going to be looking at more and more of these kinds of uh, channel uh, filling, channel evolutions, uh, meandering of channels. And as much as urban landscapes have, have uh, impacted them and attempted to direct them and change them, they haven't completely uh, removed the threats to sites and they are both a source of archaeological knowledge, uh, but also a danger 
to archaeological sites, as I've shown in this presentation. So with that, I will end. And uh, thank you very much for your uh, uh, attention. Thank you. Thank you. Uh... Thank you all presenters for your uh, presentation today and a great session. Now we have a 10 minutes coffee break and then uh, we will be meeting again for our third and final session today. We are continuing our third session with uh, Patricia Green and Jenna Blackwood. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much. I'm going to share. Okay. Yes, we can. We can see it. All right, thank you so much. Um, so here we are from the Caribbean, um, Patricia and myself. Patricia, would you like to start? Thank you so much. Um, just want to say thanks again to everyone. It's been a great session so far, and we are very happy to be here. Um, I would like to just extend uh, thanks to Ecomals and through the International Scientific Committee on Cultural Landscapes. We are going to be presenting on some of the issues in our cultural landscape here in the Caribbean region. So, um, Jenna, is the presentation up? Go ahead, yes. please. It's on the screen. I believe everyone is seeing it. Oh, yes, I can see it now. Thank you so much. Um, so I go ahead. We have had a number of issues in our region with regard to flooding, because as I think the whole world knows that the Caribbean region is filled with hurricanes and so on. Um, in our environment, we also have earthquakes. And I know the last session was on earthquake. Um, but what happens in the case of Haiti, which has a World Heritage Site, and we're looking at the cultural heritage. And in this presentation, we're kind of focusing on um, the Greater Antilles in the Caribbean and also the Lesser Antilles. And these images are from the Greater Antilles. And we see Haiti that had a hurricane, an earthquake. And two days after, it had a tropical storm. And as a result of that, it recorded over 4,000 landslides. So we have situations where we not only have um, natural disasters like earthquakes, volcanoes, but then we also have the weather systems which create extensive flooding and hardship within the region. Next, please, Jenna. Um, so we, uh, one of the things I want to mention is that I am uh, an architect and a, a restoration architect. And also- I'm sorry, I'm sorry Pat, I'm going to, to, to share another. Um, I don't think this is the correct one. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to quickly switch. No problem, Jenna. But in the meantime, I was just saying that I am also part of a research fellow at the University of the West Indies here at the Mona campus in Jamaica, part of the Department of Geography and Geology. And in this context, we do have the capacity within the Caribbean and have been looking at and monitoring earthquake um, floods as well as earthquakes, but flooding and developing the systems and the databases. Some of the information we're sharing here um, actually came out of the university. And um, so, you know, we are very interested in building capacity. And this is one of the key things about making this presentation here. So we can have within the Caribbean region, the capacity to monitor these things and to give national and local informed um, responses, especially at a, at a community based level. We're looking at Cuba and um, Camagüey, which uh, is also a World Heritage Site. And they too have suffered. You can see the intensity of flooding. Just keep going, Jenna, please. Thank you. And um, another area, San Juan, is another World Heritage Site in Puerto Rico. And Puerto Rico, um, we know what happened in the when they had two hurricanes that actually came on recently. So um, we are looking at 
uh, the various issues within the Caribbean of the flooding. Keep going, Jenna, please. <laughs> and um, this is very interesting because it was only in November that we actually had a system that passed through the Caribbean region and it went through Jamaica and into Santo Domingo after it left Jamaica, it went, it started just below Jamaica, went up north and hit Santo Domingo. And we have these incredible videos of extensive flooding and it could only be through climate change where the waters actually came in and ripped up even the asphalt from off the streets. Thank you, Jenna, keep going. <laughs> so we are looking now at, um, here is a system, just a map to show, give us a location of the Caribbean. Um, there's Kingston, Jamaica, Port-au-Prince, Haiti, and Camagüey, which I mentioned earlier, and the hurricane went up. So um, um, if you could just go back, Jen, I want to point out something very important because you can see there, there's a chart which actually shows the amount of rainfall in meters. On the 18th of November, um, Dia um, Ochente Ocho, and you can see the amount of rainfall that took place on that day. I mean, that's just so incredible. The next day it went to 9.4 in the number of regions. It was over 400, between over 300 to over 400 on the day that we had that massive flooding and the next day it was down to nine and so forth, millimeters. Thank you, Jenna, go ahead. Okay, thank you. I'll just jump in here. Um, so my name is Jenna Blackwood. I'm a practicing landscape architect uh, between Jamaica and Barbados. And so I can share with you some of the other issues. Climate change is one thing, but there are other um, issues that exacerbate that situation. Um, here, we, some of them social, some of them governments. Um, here we're showing you now some of the, 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 the images in our major drainage network. This is in Jamaica. Um, and as you can see, um, gar solid waste is a major issue. And this ob obviously contributes to the flooding that we often have. Um, even though the government has instituted a ban on plastic bags a couple of years ago, the people have been very um, innovative and creative. And so they have found other types of plastic that they could use um, as an alternative to the bags that were banned. And so the issue has not been fully resolved, even with that. Um, looking here now at another um, area, because we're speaking about cultural heritage, um, it is interesting to note, this is our King's House, which is where the Governor General resides. So from a cultural perspective, this is an important property. It's in the center of our city. Uh, and this property became the Governor General's residence when the British moved our original capital from Spanish town when the Spanish were in control and they moved it um, into Kingston. Um, and then they built this in the 1800s and there was a great fire and this was rebuilt in, I think it was 1907. One of the significant things about this property is that it is a huge piece of land, which is in the center of the city, of the city and it is largely inaccessible to the public. However, we have major drainage problems along this route, which is called Hope Road. This is a major spine that runs through the city. Um, and there are um, plans, or there is a proposal, I wouldn't say plans, but there is a proposal to utilize a space like this for green infrastructure in order to help to alleviate floods by diverting some of the water that is now coming down the Hope Road, taking it onto the property, creating a huge um, retention pond, and then outletting it into one of those gullies, similar to what I showed you before, um, so that there would be an overflow, but it would help to start to alleviate th that kind of problem. Uh, I also wanted to mention uh, in Barbados, um, their approach, they have a, a, a national um, pro a program project, it's called the Roof to Reef Program. And this is their major climate resilience um, project that they've received funding for in, in recent years. And this is a cross-cutting um, project. So it's not only focusing on floods and so on, as you can see, it's looking at livelihoods and shelter, water, energy, 
and it cuts across all of the different challenges that a small island developing state like Barbados has. Um, if you know Barbados, it's really small. It's 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 a hundred and forty square feet um, square miles, sorry, and it's about a thousand, um, a little over a thousand feet high. So it's really really very um, vulnerable and susceptible to climate change and all the things that come by. One of the, the key things about that project is that it's looking at communities and, and beginning at the community level by um, building, constructing some of these. There's On your left, you'll see this structure. It's called a suck well in Barbados. Because of the geology of Barbados, they have a, it's a coral stone island. This is a, 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 it's, it's, it's a, um, like a, a pit really that 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 is um a number of feet of hundreds actually up to a hundred and so feet deep and it allows water to to filter down into the aquifers below um so they've been putting you know some of these these structures within different communities um there's a major drainage canal that runs through another large built up area um they've done a lot of um you know, construction. This is um another major drainage spine. Actually, it's a, a little lower from what you saw before, where they're now combining this flood control with beautification. So now it becomes an accessible um space, a public space. So it's not just for the control, but they're trying to combine these things. And if you look even further down, it becomes more naturalized as it gets closer to the sea, and it includes reestablishing mangroves, et cetera, so that it also um, is a natural system. So when we're speaking about nature-based solutions, which is you know, now a buzzword, this is a kind of example of something like that. And um, Jenna, I'd like to just add that Barbados, for everyone's um, knowledge, is a world heritage city. Correct. And so it's very important that um, all these mitigation strategies are in place and um, there are some natural formations around it is a port city around the coastline that help to control flooding. So it's very important that whatever intervention is being made in the city is being done naturally and mangroves in the context of the islands are one of the key things that are important in terms of flood mitigation. So when development happens and the mangroves are removed, then um, the, the entire coastline is open for flooding. And so this replanting and re um, generating the coastlines with natural vegetation is one of the community base and, and solutions. Thank you, Jenna. Thank you, Pat. Very critical. So we've looked at here, we're looking at a, a, a combination of different approaches. So we have the public and the you know national approach, but there's also the source control approach, um, which is being promoted. Um, because as we know, one of the other factors for flooding is urbanization and, and, and creating um, hard surfaces. Um, and this just is an example of in another community in Jamaica, which is uh, uh, just down the road actually from the prime minister's official residence. So it's quite a significant community uh, where a, a new entity, a new uh, building was constructed and the community members actually um, became very vocal about what would be put in their space. Uh, and, and as a result, this building was constructed to one, try to fit into the community, the character of the community, because it is a residential community. So even though it is an office building, you can see the character of it remains. And also secondly, um, the whole idea of utilizing a number of different methods to try to control the runoff that would come from a building like this. So they have different things, the grasscrete. There's also what is called reinforced grass. It actually has some structure so that they can park on it, but it looks natural and it's permeable. And then the actual natural lawn behind it. They have rainwater harvesting. They have an, uh, more of those, you know, grasscrete pavers. So there are a number of different components that have to come together. And I think that is one of the things that we need to also be aware of, that it is not a one fit uh, that, that is applicable. Sometimes we need the entire, the combination of things um, to make it effective. Because in the grand scheme of things, when there is significant um, rainfall, um, one element 
would not really control some of what we are seeing because as we all know it's we're getting more and more rainfall um we're getting the downpours you know as and as it was mentioned this morning there is that balance between sometimes it's a drought but when it does rain all the rain for the year comes in one torrential downpour so it's really trying these initiatives and the thing about the source control is that you try to have um if everyone was doing the same thing then you could start to mitigate and have an impact but if it is just one and two then it's probably not as effective. And this is where policies come in, regulations come in, and these are the things that as landscape architects and as um, building practitioners like Pat, we need to lobby for to ensure that these things are, are, are put in place. This is another example. This one is in Barbados where a, 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 a significant, a, an infiltration bed, they call it, was created below this lawn. And actually, it actually has um, there are other components, as I said, that go along with this because just one element um, would not be sufficient. And this is another idea because for myself also, as a landscape architect, I try to, um, you know, suggest these things to persons. So on a building like this, instead of the regular paving that they would use for a driveway, we look to softer solutions and incorporating a number of different solutions that um, on this property, and I can attest to this because I've seen it, when it does rain, there is literally no runoff off of this property. Thank you, Jenna. And as we close, we just want to really emphasize that um, the historic urban landscape, and we're looking at an image of downtown Kingston, and when we look at the historic urban landscape, um, the, the fact that the Caribbean has had serious flooding, a number of hurricanes, and over the years, and this is an 18th century building, and this is a 19th century drawing on the left of it, um, they actually came up with um, flood mitigation strategies. And one of the key things is, if you notice that the building is actually raised above the ground. And that's a very common traditional way of building in small island developing states. And I heard some of our presenters mentioning this, especially in um, the Asia Pacific area. And so you see here is a large mansion of a wealthy merchant from the 18th century. And here it is built, it is elevated. It, it, this building actually became the House of Parliament. And here's a photograph of it still existing from 1755. And um, Jenna, you could just show the, um, the site. This is what happened in we in November here in Kingston, Jamaica. It was at the night, so it's a little dark, but you can see the extent of water. So when buildings are naturally elevated, when the streets are, are designed in such a way that they run off because there's a central spine in Jamaica, in Kingston, in the cross the island. And so water runs from the mountains and heads to the sea. And what is happening with a lot of development project, as um, Jenna has mentioned, that they are dealing with development, hard surfaces, where the intensity of runoff is increasing. And so this is one of the things that we as technocrats are looking at developing a whole cadre of, of, of thinkers and persons with the technical competence as we're, as we're doing at the University of the West Indies to begin to increase the number of persons who will be able to benefit. This presentation um, is through the ECOMAS, International Scientific Committee on Cultural Landscape. So we are looking at the cultural landscape, the historic cultural landscape and the current one and how we can mitigate disasters in the areas of climate change. And so in this presentation, I've actually invited to share with me some of the IFLA persons from the Caribbean. And there's the association of, um, of, of Asociación of the Americas of, and the Central America and the Caribbean. So um, the next presentation, and I think that they're ready, we could just move straight on to them. And um, we invite you to ask any questions and we'll be happy to address them in the chat. We really appreciate this. Thank you so much, Jenna. And I also will just close to just, as you mentioned that, 
this group is a is it, it it represents a number of the different small island developing states. So here we are trying to 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 show the the the, the um the issues in a number of states: Barbados, Jamaica, uh, Trinidad and Tobago, and some of the other smaller islands, which are not usually on the world scene. But we are we are trying to showcase some of the issues that we do have. Thank you so much. And one of the key about this, Jenna, as um, we asked Dan and Ryan to put up their presentation, the next presentation from the Caribbean on the screen, and I will continue talking because I'll also be interfacing with them in this presentation as, um, as they come on, is that um, the Asia Pacific Caribbean and um, Africa, since small island developing states are some of the most vulnerable in the world. And so it is critical that we address these issues, especially at a local community based level. And so, you know, we are excited about what is happening and this, this conversation that is taking place. And as we have said, we're really looking forward to um, the capacity increase to, to be mapping some of these studies. We've started it and we intend to go further. And we, we would love to be able to compare notes with other islands and especially in the Pacific, as well as the Caribbean and Africa of what is happening so we can network and begin to have effective responses. Not just, um, not just mop up after the flood, but preventative and adaptations um, situations. Thank you, Dan and Ran. Yes, okay, wonderful. Um, I will just introduce here Barbados, as I mentioned earlier, has a World Heritage Site. And um, this particular presentation that um, Ryan and Diane have enjoined me with on our scientific committee on cultural landscape is really looking at the impacts of the two hurricanes. And at whereas earlier we spoke about community base and other kind of strategies, we are now looking at a governmental intervention. Dan, are you ready? Uh, I believe so. Is is my screen cheering up? Sorry. Yes, but it you need up. to go to presentation mode. Hang on. <laughs> um, slideshow. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. Let me know when you want me to jump in, Dan. Go ahead. You can go ahead and start. I have the. I'll, I'll give you the first slide. Okay, wonderful. We so we're looking at, at um, here we are. This is part of the World Heritage Site in Barbados, and they just finished celebrating independence. So you can see the flags all over the building. So it's the historic um, ur urban landscape in Barbados. And Dan, you can comment on the importance of Barbados siting with regard to flood mitigation. Go ahead in the natural context. Barbados is... Uh... We have a series of plateaus. So for uh, Bridgetown, um, once we had dredged for the deep water harbor and the careenage was already in effect, we had a situation where water would still flood over the side of the um, over the banks of the canal, which is not seen on this particular slide. But this slide shows you the Parliament building, which is the second oldest Parliament building in the Commonwealth, I believe. And so Barbados really was in a position even for tidal changes before climate change had such a massive impact to create havoc in the in the area and uh as a result of climate change we've had to make a lot of diff a lot of changes we've had um storm surges along the, the wharf road which had to be we had to do a revetment with it and we have created a coastal zone management unit which has a policy for dealing with the direct interface between the built and, and human settlement environment and the, the ocean. And as a result of that, they have been slowly, steadily working on these areas around here. So for us in Bridgetown, there's a lot of flooding. Um, Jenna mentioned a lot of the issues that we had with community interfacing. Um, in Barbados, we have a problem with litter, if I can be honest. Um, and as a result of that, we have a lot of clogged drains. We have people who are not necessarily taking care of their um, of their green spaces as they should. So litter falls, debris falls. The addition of wa of of waste is added to that, and then we have a drainage problem. The the penultimate slide, I think, that 
Jenna showed was of a section coming into the Constitution River that fills, filters into Bridgetown and filters out to sea. That particular area will back up. And in a, in a tidal surge, we have the water coming inland as well as water trying to come out. And then it, there's an overflow section to that as a result. So we really have to work with our community effort in Barbados to make sure that we keep those areas clear. And that's where policies are going to come in. Uh, more interactive policies need to be instituted around the rest of the region. I will give next slide to Pat. So go ahead, continue, Dan. Continue. Okay. What, we, okay. what we want to really emphasize in terms of the Caribbean area and especially small island that this these levels of mitigation really are operating at a community based level. Thank you, Dan. Keep going. So this is the clock tower. This, these are just a couple of pictures of the heritage site. So this is a map of the Caribbean, which I presume everybody knows at this point. We have the Greater Antilles and Lesser Antilles. We're looking at the mitigation issues today that deal with the Lesser Antilles, and we're showing two contrasting islands within the Lesser Antilles. One, that, as Jenna mentioned, has a coralline cap. Therefore, it has a filtration system that deals with fissures and sinkholes. Um, our coralline cap tends to be a minimum of 320 in the in the urbanized section and 390 feet in the on the ridges and the slopes as we go along until we hit water again underneath there um, as a result of that barbados technically should not have the drainage problems that we have now but because of the hum the drain the the mangroves along the coastline which is where the majority of people settled have been there was attrition where that was concerned as a result of settling we now have a, a huge problem with drainage. Go to the next slide. And Dominica is a volcanic island. So we all know that Dominica has had two hard lashes in the last, uh, in the last, within the last seven years or so. One of them was Erica. This is the modeling that took place. This was a modeling that was used when the storm that was tropical storm Erica intensified in the rain capacity because we speak about the unexpected in this particular forum. And one of the things that we face in the Caribbean are huge impacts from storms that speed up overnight and then lash us in the nighttime where people don't have a chance in certain areas to move. And that's what happened with Erica. Erica hit Dominica at 1.15 a.m. on the 27th of August. And as a result, there was horrific flooding that came along. As you can see from the hazard map that's laid out here, um, with the nine active volcanoes that they have, and they're also in a subduction zone, they have an issue with coastal flooding. They definitely have an issue with flooding across the land because Dominica, previous to the impact of Erica, had 365 active rivers, not streams, 365 active rivers. It meant that when the flooding hit over that island, which is just seven miles longer than Barbados, but it is double the size um, because of the, the volcanic, the area of the, that the volcanoes give it. They had a situation of tremendous flooding with water trying to get back in to the areas where it was accustomed to running. Now, because it is a, because in the Caribbean on small islands, we tend to build our, our cells out around the coastal margins. We have this huge settlement that then impacts um, impacts if, impedes the flow of water and creates huge issues where flooding is concerned. Unfortunately, and you want to add, you want to add, Dan, that um, in Dominica, Montois Piton is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and and it's very important in terms of the Caribbean and right. uh, um, with the volcanic activities and for water. And Dominica is one of the, we would call it the breadbasket of the Eastern Caribbean. Um, because right. of all of what is happening there. Thank you. Yeah. So previous to this, Dominica was the breadbasket. As a result of Erica, a lot of the crops were, were washed away because there was huge, huge flooding. If you look at the slide on the left, top left hand corner, this area was completely covered with vegetation. There was no, there was nowhere for the water to go in spite of the fact that there is some arable, um, arable works going on there. So the aeration of the soil should have allowed a level of porosity that we wouldn't have seen this. They should not have had a one in 100 flood event taking place on that particular hillside. Nevertheless, it did. And then you see this, the scenes of other devastation. 
we had 300, sorry, I moved this slide, my apology. We had 320.4 millimeters of rainfall in a, in a short period of time. People died, communities had to be moved, other communities had to be rebuilt. The overall effect was that more than a quarter of the island's population, because the whole population is around 71,000 people, over a quarter of that population, just about a third, had to be relocated or were impacted as a result of this. Now, the UNESCO World Heritage Site sits just behind this area that you're seeing. As a result of this tropical storm, the, the physiological responses and the ecological sphere sped up, and there was a dying, so you were basically seeing the dying of a rainforest. That's a Mesolithic stand. It's one of the few stands in the Caribbean. And the oxygenation level that Dominica gave off to its neighbors is important, particularly when we think of the carbon loading that goes on around the rest of the Caribbean. As a result of this, Dominica had to change a number of the policies. On the left-hand side of this screen, of the top slide, it shows what happened after the impact of Erica. On the right-hand side, sorry, after the impact of Maria, which was a, which was a hurricane that hit on September the 18th, 2017, two years later, whilst Dominica was in the process of recovering. So the agricultural industry never got back up to par where it was, and suddenly they were hit by a Category 5 hurricane that once again developed within 24 hours. Because of Erica, there were certain policies that had been put in place by the government, and they worked in conjunction with the communities to get, the, to get these policies effected. Within each community in Dominica, they used every particular method. The church bells were rung, the conch shells were, were blown, the government had people driving with speakers, and they went from door to door. Every person had a section that they went from door to door to knock to say, a hurricane is coming. And then they moved people who were in desperate situations, they had identified them from Erica, moved them into shelters. Despite those actions, it was still a problem. At, up to this point, they had only two hydromet um, services in place, one at the airport on the east, the other one at the airport on the west. It was not enough to inform what was about to happen. They had no bathymetric data to tell them what the temperature was so that they could understand that because of the temperature fluctuations, the storm was going to be building to a higher capacity than it did. When this storm hit again, it struck at nighttime. Those are mitigating factors for us in this region and any small island archipelago or, or, or um, community that is coastal. <clears throat> they faced both the floodwaters coming down the mountain sides and they faced the storm surge that was horrific. They nevertheless decided to rebuild. Dominica's proposals for rebuilding now are different. They have a huge hydromet system. Um, they have 44, so they've added 22 new systems to it, and it does inform them very well. And they can feed back information to both Martinique and Guadeloupe, who have feeding systems, um, hydromet feeding systems that come from, from France. But they are still able, their, their capacity now is so, so good, their build out was so good that they're able to inform them. The only problem that has taken place with Dominica is Dominica has now turned and galloped in the direction of all that all of the small island developing states in the Caribbean have galloped down. We will become a tourism, a tourism, um, a primary tourism uh, exercise, a, a income earner as a result of seeing what neighbors have done. But they had an, they had an ecology that they could offer, especially in their heritage site that was second to none in just about half of this region that we live in, the Western Hemisphere. That will be, that will be impacted. And so as landscape architects, we have to be moving forward. Reports were written to them about a number of issues that were going to happen, but it was difficult to see in the process of trying to make the country climate resilient. And so now there is a movement to try to incorporate the two across the board. They will be no longer de dependent on fossil fuels within the next three to five years because they've just struck a geothermal contract that's going to take care of all of that. So Dominica is lifting off their carbon footprint, but it is not enough. Where people are planting trees quite often to green a space and to get an oxygen load, one of the things that Dominica has to teach us is it's not enough to change the tide of climate, of, of the climate um, movement, of the, of the race and the pace that it's moving at. 
because they had all of the oxygen that was required. And then we look at Barbados. We spoke about the plateaus just now. So in the in the slide to the left, you see the where the plateaus are. We've got um, marine classic rocks and um, upper coral terraces. Those terraces keep Barbados safe from some of the coastal surges, and they keep us safe from tsunamis of certain energy volumes when they do hit, because Barbados has been hit by tsunamis in living history. We have also been hit, although people say that we are not an island that's been hit by hurricanes. In the history of record keeping for Barbados, there is data to indicate in the archives that Barbados has been hit by a hurricane in every single month of living history. So when the hurricane season ends on the 30th of November, it is still prudent for Barbadians to monitor. We have not had to do that because we have had all of our storms within the last 50, 60 years hitting within the hurricane season. But outside of the season, we have dreadful flooding that takes place, absolutely dreadful flooding. And because our gullies are part of that network that feeds water out, it becomes a huge problem for us. Again, Barbados has several hydromet services um, in place, and we also have policy here that governs a number of the entities. However, the cohesion that was seen in Dominica when, when Hurricane Maria hit was, is something that has now been incorporated in most of the small islands and certainly for the lesser Antilles, hopefully for the greater Antilles as well, which is when you notice that a system is coming, whether you have the hydromet services or not, and the impact is clear that it's going to happen, you move and utilize your equipment to the positions that needed are needed one on one side of a water course and the other on the other side of a water course because your first resource i usually say is the ecology but the one that is primary is human life so you must be able to safeguard that and moving the equipment into those positions has been one of the things that dominica taught us can work similarly the on the ground policy of having people who go from one particular area to the next they knew the houses that they had to knock on they knew where to tell the people to go and it was a part of their job. They were trained repeatedly throughout the year for this. That is a system that each island needs to undertake to do. It's our neighborly response. And it's something that in the old time days, the conch shell would blow and you would know that there was something happening um, when there was a climactic factor happening. We have to go back to all methodologies. It is not enough to assume that systems going out on the radio or on a cell phone will work because sometimes they fail us. Um, and Dan, I just want to add one of the things I was actually in Grenada, one of the islands in the archipelago at the Southern Caribbean. And um, I was with a, an engineer and he looked up and he said, oh, my God, we're going to be having a hurricane soon, a storm. And I said, how do you know? He said the trumpet tree, when you see the leaves of the trumpet tree curling, then you know a hurricane is coming. Oh, and that's yes. some of the old time traditions. And it's very important to understand that in small island developing states where we are in the Caribbean, that, um, you know, there is nowhere else to run. It's a small island, a small space. So all the traditional techniques of managing the, the environment and looking at nature and seeing the systems, you know, when the wind begins to feel a certain way, you know, our grandmother used to say, oh, my goodness, it's going to rain. My arthritis is acting up. This is what happens in our environment. It may sound funny, but it works. Thank yeah. you, Dan. Yeah. And one of the other points to note is that the there is a way to, to look at the sea. The tide changes when weather is coming. In 1979, when David was going to pass by, Dominica, gonna come back to Dominica in a minute, Dominica had not been hit by a hurricane for 72 years. In 1979, when Hurricane David was passing, was going to pass by Barbados, our, our hydromet data was not as good as it is now, obviously. And our information was passed us from first world entities. Before, the day before Hurricane David hit, my grandfather, who was a geographer, a uh, university trained geographer and a uh, headmaster, took myself, my, took myself and my sister down to the sea and he showed us certain signs in the ocean and then he showed us the clouds. Um, Pat makes a really interesting point about making sure that you know what your historical issues are in, in the West Indies as well, if you see ants moving on the inside, it means rain is coming, there will be a flood. And they move within 20 hours of the flood actually hitting. 
that's a study that's currently being that's currently being done. Hopefully, it will be published sometime with the university. I think the um, the youngsters here in Barbados are doing that. So th that's one of the things. Now, for Barbados, we have the coastal zone management unit that acts as the buffer. It's the interface between the built environment, like I said, and the sea. Here we have a picture of a boardwalk, the South Coast boardwalk. We're doing one on the on the uh, on the, the West Coast has done a part of theirs, and they're going to continue it. But it acts as a buffer so that the water does not come in and create havoc because here we have a buffer zone that is now created their buffer is about 20 feet to 80 to 20 to 25 feet wide and beyond that buffer zone um the buildings themselves give you another zone of about 70 feet until you hit the until you hit the road in times gone by the entire south coast would be would be on the areas that were open to the sea would be would have sand and salt water flowing across it and it was hazardous um we have flood risk damage so i am now interfacing for ryan this is his part of the of, of the uh of the presentation so barbados has ninety thousand people give or take in the capital city it is one of the most densely we are one of the most densely populated islands in the world um our population density is pretty pretty horrific um however bridgetown has ninety thousand inhabitants in saint michael that's a high density it means that drainage is important they're complete they're always affected by the runoff coming down the plateaus don't mind we're flat coming down the plateaus coming past the constitution river constantly affected by it salt water is also a huge damaging factor for people living in not so uh, affluent circumstances we suffer with that in barbados it's one of the one of the issues with flooding in barbados as soon as you have flooding on on the land side we have the storm surge on the other side and the mix into the atmosphere creates a, a, a situation where people's electronics go down and it is a problem and we have Dan, as part of that mitigation strategy the traditional Caribbean vernacular architecture actually has the buildings elevated and so they're built high so water runs through. So we saw the situation in Jamaica where the, um, the buildings were built above the street level and the architecture of the traditional areas would be elevated because they would be expecting floods. Now the floods have intensified with climate change so maybe we need to go a little higher. Thank you, Dan. Is Ryan already? No, Ryan's not here. So I'm taking over for Ryan. So okay. we, we don't have we don't have that in Barbados. We don't have that occurring in we have them on a block structure, but that's for the that's the foundation so that they don't sink. It doesn't mitigate the issue of water running and sometimes people's houses flooding, to be honest with you. Um, in the developments that were built outside of Barbados, they built them on tall columns so that they could develop them underneath. And I, I take what you're saying, it's similar in Jamaica in Guyana for the for that flooding. And it does work. So we have areas, they're knock-on effects of, of flooding. We've got the risk of huge landslides. We've got um, the accumulation of, of muck. It affects agriculture. There are now policies in place for Barbados and they, they fed off of some of the ones that Dominica had come up with, where we are looking at creating, we use the detention ponds that are available in the areas and so that we can have water to water the crops in the drought season because we have a very bad drought season where we are in Barbados. Dominica doesn't suffer with that. But what we have done is they have still created catchment pits on the land um, using the clay lining so that you can you can have water, access to water, which is still necessary in that building in that built environment. Um, but we are very much at risk of flooding, bad flooding issues. These are this is a, a picture here in Barbados where it shows the level of sediment that comes off when we are dealing with our flooding. And this is a revetment that's being made um, at this point in time. I think this is a this is another slide of another location. This is not Barbados, but um, you do have an idea of what we are doing with our revetment. Our coastal zone management unit tends not to use concrete, so they do not add to the carbon load. In their, in their mitigation, but they use a massive boulders, which we import from the other volcanic islands. And they have a, they have a resting, um, they have a resting geological hub that fits into the nook and they sit there in times of storms, they don't move. 
So we are we are quite blessed to be able to have that available to us. We have we need to have upgrades and improvements for stormwater management, and there must be more analysis of the of the threats. What happens in Barbados, and it seems to happen in Dominica, is that people don't necessarily you plan for it, but you don't take the actual threat of the flooding seriously until you are in the season or the or it is um, or the threat is impending. A storm is actually on the way. We build, we say for climate change, but we do not take into account where we are building. Land use patterns are important. So landscape architects need to get into the land use pattern factor where we are called, when town country planning is sitting down, where we are called, where houses are being positioned. If we look at a couple of sites, in, we were, if we were to look at a couple of sites in Nigeria, I had the, the, the chance to work on a couple of them. We went in, the architect had done the, the design, it was 257 hectares. I got to position the buildings on it. And as a result, where he had put a couple of the buildings, there was huge flooding, which he had not anticipated. In Barbados, our issue is making sure that we leave our wells open, our, our natural wells open, and those fissures that collect water because of the density of our population and because of the concrete footprint, a lot of them have been covered up and it poses a problem. We need to look at the, in, we need to look at the intersection between the hard and the, and the soft landscape. Solutions, Jenna raised quite a few of those just now when she talked about the property in Barbados that uh, she had had a chance to see. The environmental restoration and protection, we have to be, we have to make more of an effort as a body, as a landscape architectural body to be in the consulting and advisory positions. It is not, it is not normal in Barbados for the landscape architect to be called into certain situations. It is beginning to change and we are beginning to drive processes rather than have it uh, rather than have it be driven by the architect from start to finish, the landscape architectural hub is slowly beginning to make that change. Um, that would be in part led by Jeff Ramsey and Kevin Talma, who have worked assiduously in the in the in the industry, um, making those changes. Me, I tend to not go with the flow. So if it doesn't make sense to me, and people don't understand. I'm not helping them out in that particular area because I'm not going to do what is not right because generations that follow will have to live with it. And this is what we have to make the change for. We can no longer plan for 20 years or 30 years or 40 years. A generational span of 15 to 20 years is not enough. We have to be planning for the next 100 years, for the next 200 years, for the next 1,000 years. The Chinese have a master plan that they use, which I think is amazing, and theirs is a 1,000 years. Where in our archipelago have we ever said that our history will, will portend beyond the next 1,000 years? Nowhere, because we do not design and build for that. Until we look further into the future, the solutions that we have within us are not going to come to fruition. We will have them, we will write them down, but we have to see the future 500 years from now. We are given that particular mandate within our profession and the other professions, most of them, Pat will have it as an architect because buildings will stand up, but concrete has a particular shelf life. As landscape architects, we can ask for those, for those materials to be changed. We can ask to use the sargasso that has taken over in, in and created a problem of it in and of itself when flooding is coming because it's blocking the, the 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 sea channels to get for the water to get out we can make the effort to utilize those things within the landscape and within the built landscape by using bricks um using them to be um, a component in bricks and taking away the issue at one point and also reducing the issue on the other on the other side so that our landscapes are protected and we have a way of going forward. Policies will have to change. We have to work with the engineers. I, I have been working with a group of them now. Now they call. <clears throat> Before they make certain decisions, they will call. They're asked to do calculations. But when, you, when, when we speak to them, if we speak to someone like Dr. Granville Phillips, and we ask him a question, he works throughout the entire region. Now that he has been interfacing with me, he asks more questions. <clears throat> so do a number of the engineers around but they won't ask the questions if we don't dare to stand up and tell them it doesn't make sense. Go head to head with them sometimes. Don't be contentious, but go head to head with them because they need to understand what they are building for. An engineer will tell you that a number, a number of the issues where it will stand up today, they have no way of knowing if it can stand up tomorrow. 
we do know that there's an ecological sphere. We do know that there's climate change. We do know that we're working with, it, with a, a module that is an, uh, an ecological niche set within an ecosystem that is part of a regional ecosystem and part of a world ecosystem. What happens in one square mile of any of our islands has the capacity to affect everyone in the region. The region then has the capacity to affect every one of their near neighbors, and so it continues. We have to make the stand and the time to make the stand for flood mitigation passed 30 years ago, but we can start now. We've started with this forum, but we can start with a driving factor that says, from now on, we will change every single process. Our policy changes start with us because we hold the sway to change policy. We hold the sway to agitate to some extent without being aggressive and to make sure that all of the professions out there understand what a landscape architect does. What thank you, Dan. We have thank to you. say goodbye now. Thank, thank you so yes. much for everything. And we look forward to capacity building within our Caribbean region. Thank you so much, everyone, thank for you. such a wonderful session. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much, Dr. Green, Dr. Blackwood, Dr. Clark. And it's really a great uh, opportunity for us to understand more from the island states how they are dealing with the disaster risk management issues, and I hope we have a chance to hear more. So uh, I would like to continue with the, uh, Mr. Nizar Abdul-Jabbar from uh, Economist Jordan. Thank you very much. Uh, can you see the screen here? Yes, you can share your screen. Yeah, we see your screen. Okay, uh, let's see. Good afternoon, uh, good morning for the people in the Far East and good afternoon for the people in the Far West. Uh, thank you for uh, ICOMAS uh, for uh, setting up this meeting. Uh, I'm learning very much from all of these uh, different uh, experiences and perspectives. And today I want to uh, share with you uh, mine and my colleagues' uh, uh, experience working in Petra. Uh, so which uh, I think many of you know about. You know about Petra, maybe you don't know about what we've been doing there. So basically the idea is that we want, we were looking at the efforts of the Nabataeans in uh, mitigating floods 2000 years ago and how we might learn from that experience and revive that tradition. So, um, uh, these, uh, this is a collage of different, uh, uh, let's see. This is a collage of different uh, media reports and photographs showing these uh, various uh, flooding events going back to the 1960s. Obviously, the area is prone to flooding. Uh, many uh, disasters and tragedies have happened there due to the frequent flooding that uh, occurs there. And so, uh, unfortunately, that includes uh, loss of life, as this uh, banner headline has, that uh, 23 people died uh, in a flooding there in the 1963. So, uh, let's see. so the uh, site, uh, if you look at the photograph on the left, you can see that uh, this is an old photograph of Petra showing uh, the rubble and uh, sediment that's accumulated at the base of the treasury, 
in the Treasury Plaza. And uh, recently we found out that money, um, a lot of this is sediment is actually buried uh, a lower chamber underneath the base of the Treasury. So the pre Treasury actually went uh, significantly deeper and uh, so all of this sediment that has accumulated there is a result of frequent flooding. And this is what uh, encouraged the Nabataeans to try to stop this problem uh, through their various interventions, as we'll see. So uh, uh, clearly we have issue with erosion, uh, with uh, flooding, with sedimentation. Uh, so the idea is that we need to uh, uh, kind of uh, control this flooding or mitigate it as best we can, because as we can see, there's a lot of evidence of continuous erosion and obviously the sandstone uh, uh, facades that are there are vulnerable to this type of uh, water uh, erosion. And so uh, this is one of the uh, interventions that's needed in order to, uh, to stop uh, or at least uh, minimize this problem. So if we look at the uh, drainage basin of uh, Petra, uh, the core area, as you see uh, here, uh, is uh, actually uh, composed of a number of small sub-basins. And uh, we've uh, gone through and uh, mapped uh, this particular one here, which actually is... Uh, the one that flows right into the treasury. So uh, if anybody has been to Petra, you know that there's various uh, ways that water can get in from the south and from the north and from the west. Uh, from the west is through the sea and from the south is from this uh, uh, valley here and from the north is from uh, this uh, area of uh, Turkmenia. So, uh, so this is a key uh, part of the drainage basin in that it flows right to uh, where the treasury is. And this is what it looks like. And as you can see, uh, you have this uh, uh, gully, and then we have these uh, abandoned check dams here. And actually, there's more than these check dams that have been built to control the uh, the water flow, as we'll uh, see in a moment. This is a geological map of, uh, of Petra. And what's uh, of uh, key interest is that we have a graben, which is a fault-defined uh, uh, downthrust uh, basin. And uh, towards the west and towards the east, it's uplifted. Uh, towards the east, it's mostly Precambrian basement. And towards the west, it's mostly uh, upper Cretaceous uh, limestone. So if we uh, look at it through Google Earth, we can see the, the basin again. And this basin is bound in this uh, scene uh, by uh, the sandstone uh, outcrops, the, the Cambrian in age. And uh, so the water actually flows from uh, the sea through the Treasury Plaza, and the, then down out towards Wadi uh, Arabo. So if we look at uh, uh, the scene from a different perspective, we see that uh, this is Wadi Musa, which is the main town in the area. This is the upper Cretaceous limestone in the upper reaches, and this is the Cambrian and Ordovician sandstone down where the basin is. And all of these areas are areas where we've uh, mapped and looked at the various terrace systems that have been uh, built to uh, control water flowing into the basin. But what we're going to uh, concentrate on uh, in this uh, talk is this one here in Wadi Hremiya, which, as I mentioned, flows uh, directly into the Treasury Plaza. So uh, we've done uh, this uh, study of the sediments in the area. And the idea is that we wanted to understand the uh, 
Uh, first of all, we wanted to understand uh, the rain runoff response within the drainage area. And second, we wanted to understand how terracing changes that rain runoff response. Uh, and as you can see uh, here, we uh, the, uh, in both cases, uh, we see that the terraced uh, uh, soils, which are basically sediments that have accumulated behind these barriers that we'll talk about uh, soon, are uh, very, uh, much uh, more coarse grain than the uh, unterraced areas. And so we can see that, uh, and we've done these experiments where we uh, looked at uh, the rain runoff relationship. And so what we did is we used a rain, uh, rainfall simulator to see what will happen as we uh, spray water onto the surface and uh, see how long it takes for it to become uh, saturated and how, uh, how much water will uh, run off after this uh, saturation occurs. So this basically tells us that even after uh, about seven or eight minutes of rainfall, uh, the terrace surface uh, is absorbing about, uh, instead of uh, uh, basically uh, running off two liters a minute, a minute, which was what the sprinkler was uh, doing, uh, it was absorbing about, uh, let's say, 30% uh, of that water. The terrace surface uh, uh, was behaving uh, in a uh, in a, 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 let's say it was uh, soaking up uh, less water. So the drainage basin uh, for Petra is about 50 square kilometers. Uh, the average rainfall in the area is about 100 millimeters a year. So uh, this is uh, this average uh, is simply an average, and we have a lot of extremes. So for example, in 2004. Uh, we had uh, a rainfall event which was 131 millimeter in a single day. And so that resulted in uh, obviously in flesh flooding throughout the region. So uh, generally uh, we're getting about uh, 9 million cubic meters of water falling on the basin every year. Uh, so this is Wadi Hremi again. And uh, if you look closely, there's many of these old uh, dams that have been built throughout this area. And I'll show you a clearer uh, representation of that, which is on this map, which shows that we have uh, over 110 uh, barrages and uh, check dams and uh, various other installations to control uh, water within this uh, part of the drainage basin. And this is a 3D representation of the, of the drainage basin with all of, not all of, but most of these terraces uh, showing. And we have still have more upstream. Uh, so we have uh, gabions uh, more close to the headwater. We have check dams uh, downstream. We have the barrages diverting water throughout. And so the aim of the, of the system was to minimize the runoff and uh, uh, both uh, lower the amount of water and to slow it down. So there was a, a it wasn't 100% for stopping the water, but it was to kind of uh, moderate the, the water flow when, when, uh, uh, when a uh, flash flood was about to occur. So, of course, these uh, installations are over 2,000 years old. Uh, so they, well, they stopped functionally uh, clearly because of uh, um, lack of maintenance, neglect. Uh, in some places, they were breached, as you can see here. So basically, the water uh, simply will uh, throw, flow through these uh, dams after they've been breached. Uh, a lot of sedimentation occurred uh, behind these uh, terraces, which also uh, clearly uh, uh, damaged or lowered their effectiveness. 
that is also damage caused by vegetation growth uh, behind these uh, terrace walls. And so uh, the idea was that we wanted to uh, try to revive the system and to see if uh, how that would work uh, in real life. So the uh, plan was to uh, go and rebuild these uh, terraces. Uh, obviously, we couldn't rebuild uh, 110 of them. Uh, we weren't even convinced that all 110 of them were in operation at a single time. Uh, the, what happened probably was that dams were continuously being built as older ones became uh, silted. So uh, there was that element. Uh, plus, our budget didn't allow us to revive 110 dams, so that's not what we did. We chose uh, about five or six of them, and we uh, went uh, about trying to to uh, reconstruct them and rehabilitate them. Uh, of course, this was done based on a stakeholders' meeting, which include representatives from the local community, uh, from the Petra National, uh, the Petra uh, Development Authority, and uh, from the Department of Antiquities. So we uh, we invited them over to the university, and we uh, offered them different options as to what might be done, and this included uh, simple cleaning or reconstruction or anastylosis. Uh, and uh, so what we agreed uh, upon was to uh, do this uh, restoration. Conservation was conducted in accordance with the Venice Charter. We used local materials. Uh, the uh, interventions were uh, reversible. And uh, we uh, made uh, sure that uh, people can visually distinguish between what's old and what's uh, what's new. And so uh, we, uh, you can see these two uh, rehabilitated dams. We've been monitoring them to see how effective they are. Um, but uh, so far so good, they've uh, been, uh, they seem to be mitigating, uh, if not uh, completely uh, preventing flooding in the Sikh area, or the Khazna area, sorry. So uh, uh, that's uh, what we did. And we'd like to thank you for listening and to thank our various uh, funding agencies for their kind uh, support of this project. And thank you very much. Um. Thank you very much for your very important contribution um, to Nizara Bujarabe. And our next presentation will be again on video. And uh, Dr. Ricardo Alberto uh, Coelho from Economic Colombia will uh, share his presentation. Good morning, cordial greetings on behalf of the Mayor University Institution of Cartagena, U Mayor, the architect Ricardo Zabaleta Puello greets you. In this opportunity, I bring to you to this conference a topic named Cartagena de Indias Colombia, a constant fight to safeguard its cultural heritage in the face of climate change. The territorial context of Cartagena de Indias. Cartagena de Indias, Colombia, cultural and historical heritage of humanity, located north of the Colombian Atlantic coast facing the Caribbean Sea, a city of islands origin, has always suffered from the onslaught of the sea, in a constant fight against flooding and coastal erosion, all plants record it, it as such. We deserve one of those plants that shows the geomorph 
or logical characteristic of the city compared to an, an image today completely surrounded by bodies of water, which generates flooding due to high tide. The problem, the risk Cartagena Arevalo's proposal 18th century. Plan and profiles of the wall destroyed by the North Sea, prepared by the military engineering Antonio de Arevalo. It can be seen on the plan before construction to where the flood reached due to high tide. For this reason, Antonio de Arevalo designed and built the famous Marina Breakwater, which we see in the present plan, which made it possible to gain ground from the sea. Removing the possibilities of flooding, allowing the construction of the entire world front of the northern sector. The following two images allow us to see from the air the existence of safe breakwater, which is still working, keeping the walls and bastions of the northern sector intact. High tide levels in rainy seasons continue to strongly affect Cartagena de Indias, generating flooding in this historic center, squares and streets. This is the appearance they present in the face of this climatic phenomenon. Even the northern sector that Arevalo worked with his marina breakwater continues to be affected as the image shows. A map of Cartagena shows in blue the flooding scenario of the city in the near future, if not, if not corrective measures are taken for both the historic center and the continental area. For the island area, the San Jose de Boca Chica Fort is becoming the first heritage victim of the effects of the climate emergency, which we observe in this area. Fortifications such as the Bastion of Santo Domingo in the historic center located in the northern sector could, will be the, at the mercy of the waters of the Caribbean Sea. If the phenomenon of climate change are not addressed in, the, in time, they could be affected, as we illustrate in the next image. The great room that welcomes Cartagena with its historic clock towers, Martis, rich, rich centenary park and convention centers could well become an aquatic stage if we do not add in time. Coastal protection project. For this reason, the mayor of Cartagena has developed the 4C plan. Cartagena competitive and compatible with the climate being the first comprehensive climate change plan for a coastal city in Colombia and of which the coastal protection project is currently being executed at a cost of 35 million dollars. Images that illustrate the actions to be carried out in the tourist sector of Boca Grande and the northern front of the historic center that involve the construction of six pools. 80 meters of beach field, three brick breakwaters, uh, decorative works, etc. Over a duration of 18 months. The project seeks to mi mitigate the erosion process along the entire coastal edge of the tourist center of Boca Grande to the historic center. The image illustrates the three breakwaters that will be located in the Caribbean Sea in front of the northern sector of the historic center. Work that has not yet been executed and that must comply with various requirements. Among others, recognize the existence and heritage value of the old marina breakwater as designated and built by Antonio de Arevalo II Respect the area of influence of the breakwater as a submerged archaeological heritage 100 meters apart from its location in relation to the three new proposed breakwaters. S 
Since its origins, Cartagena de Indias a completely island territory, given its geomorphological characteristics, has always suffered from issues of coastal erosion and floods of its urban ter territory. Before those circumstances, Antonio de Arevalo designed between 1765 and between 1771 a coastal protection called marine spray, which allowed not only to protect the coast from the own ship of the sea, but to build the front of walls on the north side facing the sea, Caribbean Sea. Today, 490 years later, uh, the city continues to suffer from the issue of floods and evil that has been during its entire existence and which is uh, expected with the coastal prote protection project to overcome the impassment of floods that put our architectural and heritage at risk. Okay, good time. Thank you, thank you everyone for the kind attention provided from Cartagena de India, Colombia. Receive a cordial greetings with my best wishes for a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. A special thanks to Veronica Casanova for all her support. Hugs. So would like to thank you uh, for uh, very bravely uh, because uh, as far as I know that he doesn't know English and because we really like to hear uh, the case from Colombia and uh, he gave us the presentation in English and uh, the video. Thank you very much. So I would like to uh, move to a second uh, colleague, Roshwan Abbasu, but I cannot see his a name in here. I wonder if he is in here. I think he's not. Then uh, we are moving to our next colleagues, Fadis Salaria uh, from International Scientific Committee on Water and Heritage. Floor is yours, dear Fadis. I can see for this, but I think he is away from. Hello, can you hear me? Hi, hi, hi. 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 Yes, yes, I can hear you. How are you? you? Okay, I'm fine. Thank you, thank you. So, the uh, floor is yours, buddy. Yeah, thank you. Mm. Sorry, can you see the screen? Yes. Yeah. Yes. You can. It's okay? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, at first, I would like to apologize uh, because it's around uh, 11 p.m. in my country, and uh, with my illness, may, uh, uh, this will uh, affect the, uh, my presentation. Sorry, at first. Well, um, if the growing trend of uh, urban and regional development in the developing uh, countries happened unplanned, it will increase the damage caused by uh, natural disaster and especially floods. Uh, this process will uh, further destroy urban and regional lands if there is no suitable method for, uh, for uh, preventation exposure and management. <clears throat> uh, one of the uh, current challenges of urban development in Iran is to adopt the correct urban planning and management approach uh, in the event of floods, especially unexpected floods. 
which is uh, which in the past uh, decades I'm, artist, it, uh, I'm sorry to it, interrupt your speech uh, yeah. your slides are not moving should they be or yeah yeah okay okay sure um it's okay we are still seeing the opening page of your presentation okay okay um well let me if you start the presentation in yeah what the bottom stop sharing and join it again uh, let me do it again sorry um, Can you see it now? We can see uh, the screen, but can you try to move the slide so we can see if it does? Does it move it? Does it move it? Uh, how about now? Can you, uh, no, can you display your presentation in uh, presentation mode, which is uh, yeah, at the right it, button? It yeah, it is at the presentation mode. Okay. Maybe it's because of bad connection in my country. Sorry. Um, maybe, can you try uh, clicking on uh, another slide so I can see? Yeah, it. I'm clicking right now and... Okay, uh, we can see it. Oh, uh, so sorry. Uh, now, now, now we can. Yeah, it's okay. Yes, I I, I think so. Yes, oh, yes, yes. Good. Now it's working. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Um, I would like to say, uh, my presentation in my country is uh, today's necessity and tomorrow's need, because the cause of floods um, is very important issue, and. Um, Mm, flooding is a natural process that that uh, threatens population center and human activities. Um, if I, um, we can divide the reason for its formation into um, two categories. First of all, uh, natural factors such as climate change, uh, physiographic conditions, soil type, uh, geology, drought, and vegetation and unnatural factors uh, such as uh, population growth and population density, land use change, construction in the riverbed, and deforestation. Um, but Iran, my country, um, also known as Persia, uh, is a country in, based, uh, in West Asia. Uh, in the last 50 years, 2,000 and 1,400 uh, severe floods uh, happened in my country, and contrary to facing floods in large numbers, uh, floods have always occurred unexpectedly, and uh, as a result, have caused uh, numerous uh, human and financial loss. Um, if I had to summarize the causes of um, floods in Iran, I can choose uh, this uh, four main uh, subject, uh, such as uh, several years of uh, drought without any long-term management and planning dry soil in most parts of the country as a nature of uh, environmental system, uh, lack or absence of uh, um, suitable vegetation in large amount of land use change, especially in high value soil and agricultural land, <clears throat> lack of proper infra uh, infrastructure in cities, uh, and especially not paying attention to the importance of preparation to face the, uh, you know, this uh, natural process. <clears throat> um, recent example of uh, floods in Iran um, have always been in the summer or season uh, when floods were not expected. Uh, and as a result, uh, floods have occurred in large uh, numbers uh, and have, uh, have so many uh, damages. In late July 2022, Iran was uh, hit by historic floods and uh, mass slide, uh, which affect 400 towns and villages. Um, 
at least 95 uh, people uh, have been reported dead and uh, over 200 dozen uh, uh, are missing. <clears throat> For example, uh, in Tehran, uh, uh, you can see the damage of flood in the right uh, part of the uh, screen. Uh, in this case, uh, unexpected flood uh, mm, uh, caused by illegal construction and uh, encouragement on the riverbed with failure to pay attention to the flooding of the area and the impact of heavy rainfall on it were the cause of uh, this flood and uh, had so many damages. Uh, these following pictures are related to the Tehran flood experience. In Fars, um, uh, sorry, um, in Tehran, uh, 43 people have been reported dead. In Fars, uh, 24 people, uh, we lost 24 people. In this case, in just 10 minutes, heavy rainfall uh, caused the flood. Uh, because of the tourism function of this area, uh, unfortunately, a number of um, people had stayed on the riverbed and uh, because they want to enjoy the natural view and uh, there, therefore there was um, a huge um, loss of missing people and financial loss in uh, this province. As you can see, the damage of this flood. In Sistan, Balochistan, uh, this flood happened because of monsoon season and uh, not paying attention to the destruct destructive uh, consequences of it. As you can see, awareness of uh, natural context and a sense uh, can lead us to better understanding and planning, which unfortunately, we don't have such this thing. <clears throat> And the last one, in Mazandaran, this case happened less than two months ago uh, in uh, one of the major transportation network in Iran, which connect Tehran, the capital of the Iran, to uh, one of the northern province. People were stuck between flood and mountain fall. It was a disaster and it was um, so horrible. <clears throat> What's the solution? And uh, as urban planner, what should we do? Um, uh, when I um, I want to say that uh, in this process, I heard very interesting articles and projects uh, were presented in uh, this uh, meeting, but uh, which made me jealous because we don't have uh, such detailed research in our country related to floods. And I hope that um, in the future, I can have same experience such um, last project that were, uh, were presented. Um, first of all, um, taking advantage of new methods and construction co uh, compatible uh, with floods, safe construction uh, and um, in buildings and a transportation network would be really good. Um, this subject is really essential because in addition to uh, in addition of flood challenges, several uh, construction in our country are not safe in the face of earthquake either and other uh, natural disasters. Uh, update laws are related to natural disasters. First, paying serious attention to commitment to the implementation of the law is uh, crucial. Another weakness um, is in making law regardless of their implementation uh, in my country, including uh, <clears throat> sorry, increasing public awareness, um, which is obvious, improving forecasting and warning system. In our country, there is a background of uh, this system, but unfortunately, uh, it has not been implemented. Flood, uh, flood risk management, the first step in the direction of reducing the damaging, uh, damaging effect of floods is to know the high risk uh, 
high risk flood areas so that based on the result obtained uh, with integrated management and comprehensive uh, urban planning, the adverse effect of urban floods uh, can be prevented as much as possible. And um, the last one, prevention strategies in management and planning, urban planning. Uh, smart Using a smart management and technology, especially in urban planning about crisis adjustment and optimizing of the reconstruction. Res uh, re um, resilience approach uh, containing sustainability, flexibility, compatibility, preparation, efficiency, and legality. Um, facing with floods as uh, one of the layers of um, urban planning at different special level and uh, planning corresponding to climate change, uh, which is really important at uh, this moment of time. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Fadi, for uh, staying late and uh, even your health is not so good. I, I hope you get well soon and thank you for your presentation. Uh, our next presenter is Jean Raisen Kerime Danish uh, from Australia Ecomos uh, and the uh, National Scientific Committee on Energy and Sustainability. The floor is yours. Thank you, Zainab. Um, hello, everyone from wherever you are in the world. Um, and thank you for the opportunity of uh, to share our, um, I think, um, yeah, okay. I just was seeing the uh, uh, other screen. Um, so Jean will be sharing the screen for us uh, in order to prevent any swap over in the middle. Uh, so thank you again for the opportunity for us to share our Australian uh, experience of a catastrophic flood event. Uh, I will provide the overall um, context and the setting the scene uh, for the um, geography, place, uh, uh, the place's geography, history, and heritage context, and then hand over to Jean. I would like to, uh, Jean, can you share the screen? It's a, yeah, thank you. So I would like to start by acknowledging the country. Um, the next slides, G. Um, we are presenting this paper from Aboriginal country in Australia. Jean is on Gadigal country in the Eora Nation, and I am on the central coast land of the Darkinyang people. Lismore, our subject uh, for this presentation, is in Vijabal Wayabal country in the Banjalung Nation. We acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and waters where we live and work and their respect for an attachment to country. We pay our deepest respect to the continuing con connection, knowledge and leadership of First Nations people. By setting the scene uh, for the 2022 flood across large areas of Northern New South Wales and Southeast Queensland, uh, which is north of uh, Sydney um, in Australia, following La Nina climate event in the Pacific. Major cut catchments affected in New South Wales were the Clarence, Richmond, Tweed, and Brunswick river basins in the northern, uh, northeastern end of New South Wales state. This paper will focus on the town of Lismore in the upper Richmond river basin. Lismore is sited at the junction of two rivers, Leicester Creek and the Wilsons River and its many tributaries, including Cooper's Creek. Next slide. Um, the map uh, shows uh, Lismore as a red dot, you can see at the Northern and its relationship in the inset um, map uh, to, within the New South Wales, uh, Sydney is just towards the south 
end of that on the eastern coast. Uh, Lismore city is surrounded by hills in a basin locally known as the Wok. The river rises in the Great Dividing Range to the west and steep volcanic country to the north, the caldera of an ancient volcano. Mountain streams in deep incised valleys feed the creek and river valleys with meandering winding streams in flat valley bottoms with the flood plains. Before clearing the forestry and agriculture, the valley is supported by subtropical rainforest and evergreen forest on ridges. Next. So the town, as you will see at the background in the watermark, is set in the grid pattern of roads with the town center uh, dominated and characterized by masonry, high quality 19 and early century uh, buildings. Mostly, obviously at the beginning of, are the government buildings and public uh, community buildings. Residential suburbs outskirts of beyond the town center are timber houses elevated on stilts and piers known as Queenslanders, uh, taking their clues from the Queensland just adjacent to the north of Lismore. Rural valleys with cattle grazing, dairy farms and other organic produce with timber homesteads dominates the rural landscape of the Lismore. The hills with macadamia and avocado plantations and small rural villages with timber community halls um, sets the characteristics and landscape uh, of Lismore region. Long established farming co communities in the area and then um, alternate uh, lifestyle communities established after the 1923 Aquarius Festival in the region. The population largely uh, in comparison to uh, New South Wales, wider New South Wales, mostly dominated by children and young people of age five to 12, and then uh, five to 19 and aged uh, beyond 45 and 64. Laborers and community and lower income uh, workers and sales, sales workers are dominate the population in this region. Yep. Yeah. So uh, looking into the um, heritage and historical context of Lismore, you can see the three um, rivers with the town center on the east of that uh, river basin is uh, characterized by, there are many heritage buildings within just the town center. We have like four conservation areas that gives the character and the uh, large uh, dominance of the historic mm -hmm. buildings that we can see examples of here uh, with the former post office and telegraph building, the church, uh, parish, and the um, municipal uh, baths. Um, and then the all historic buildings within the town center and wider uh, Lismore region are protected by the legislation under the local environmental plan and the maps for the historic uh, heritage is online available for everyone to have a look at. Um, we can see the masonry building are as mentioned previously is uh, in the town center when the other uh, outskirts are with timber uh, housing. The rural landscape that we see on the right uh, bottom is the where the floodplain and the uh, forestry uh, landscape uh, is dominant. The floods in next gene. Um, as uh, mentioned earlier, the Lismore settled by red cedar cutters and farmers looking for fertile land from 1840. Boats used the rivers as the uh, route for trading and the junction of the rivers uh, in Lismore was the limit of that navigation and settlement developing the region uh, regional center. When the rail, uh, 
infrastructure and the road transport came from 1890s day in World War II, made the place to be a major city in the region. From the start, obviously, looking into the landscape and the rivers basin with the walk uh, geographical formation, uh, it was uh, prone to be you know, subject to floods at the junction with the flushed flowing creeks. In 1954 and 1974, there were severe floods with the 1974 followed by studies for options, how we can, how they can prevent the um, damage to population and also the uh, built uh, environment. Council head office was moved to higher location with second commercial center established at that higher position. In the early 20s, a levee and pump system was built to top protect the CBD uh, from 10.5 meter high flood and improve time to available to evacuate in larger floods. But in 2017, a major flood of 11.6 meter breached the levee, the most damaging um, catastrophe or flood event in living memory of Lismore. Council's flood ready project then uh, developed and still in um, developing process. Um, the next uh, slide will show the graph to indicate how the big 2022, regardless the levy was built, uh, even if it was built to do, uh, the levy is the uh, blue wavy line where the levy's uh, level is. Uh, even if it was built to the 100 year design flood level, it wouldn't stand up to 2022 14.4 uh, meter uh, flood uh, disaster. So I'll hand over to Jean now. Thank you, Jean. Uh, thank you, Karame. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Just Great, thanks. So um, Lismore was well prepared for um, floods. Um, the council had um, maps of evacuation routes shown at top right here. Um, and had done work on engineering, planning, property modification and emergency management measures. There's a system of levies, the dark blue lines on the, the plan, a warning system, stream gauges up, upstream to warn of impending floods. Um, there's a state emergency services office. Um, after the 2017 flood, there was a Facebook group established and after the 2017 flood, they combined with council, SES and grassroots activists to form the resilient Lismore Community Group. Um, they established uh, um, what was called the hub um, at this building shown on the right um, to coordinate and provide information, food, cleaning supplies um, in event of future flood. Um, just before, three days, in fact, before the 2022 Flood Council applied for funds to improve the flood warning system um, with new rain and river height gauges, CCTV cameras and a community flood dashboard. But there was catastrophic and major floods in March 2022. Um, there were 670 millimetres of rain in two days in intense bursts with extreme falls in the upper catchment and record high and fast stream floods. In the upper catchment, the falls were um, in the vicinity of um, there were up 800 millimetres in 24 hours. There was a minor flood warning on Saturday 2.15 on Sunday, there was another warning of a 10.6 metre peak the next day. Orders to leave were then issued by 5, to leave by 5 a.m. were issued that late evening. However, by 2.30 a.m., the levee was overtopped um, and subsequently uh, the order was given to leave immediately at 3 a.m. 
course, when everyone was asleep and it was dark. Um, the flood peaked at 2 p.m. on Monday. The height was 14.4 metres, 2.3 metres higher than the previous record floods in 1954 and 74, and 2.8 metres higher than the 2017 flood. Four people died in this incident. A second major flood occurred three weeks later when a further person died. Roads were cut. There were many slams, six villages were isolated um, outside of Lismore in the catchment area. Communications, water and sewer systems, power supply and warning systems failed for prolonged periods. This is a model that shows the um, flooding in Lismore. I'll, I'll do that again, that was very quick. <laughs> These are some photos of the flooding in Lismore. Um, on the right-hand side, we see before and after photos um, showing the depth of the floods in the main street. Um, they were about four metres deep in the main street, going into the second floor of the buildings. You can see on the McDonald's sign in the bottom right how high the floodwaters were. Um, people um, had to retreat to their roofs and onto the awnings of buildings on the street, um, hoping for rescue. Um, the aerial view bottom left shows um, the cathedral, which hasn't never been full flooded, it's on, and it was on a hill. Um, <clears throat> oh, whoops. On the top, top left um, is a community hall. Um, typical of the regional um, areas in the catchment. And you can see underneath that, that the hall has totally washed away. So the, the local SES volunteers <clears throat> that were ready for the flood were overwhelmed. And from dawn on Monday, locals in tinnies and jet skis rescued hundreds. Emergency the emergency management committee set up from council offices and mobilised emergency response, including evacuation and distribution centres. Resilient Lismore community groups and individuals connected victims with volunteer help. Uh, locals held victims and formed a mud army to clean up. The Koori Mail and Aboriginal newspaper lost its premises and so set up Instead, a community hub providing food and goods and operated for many months. The SES Army and Council undertook major waste removal and emergency repairs to the roads. You can see this in the photos on the right. Council's est graphics estimate the impact. Um, in total, five people died and more than 30,000 people were affected. More than 4,000 homes were uninhabitable and nearly every business in town was affected. Um, there was 350 million Australian dollars damage to council assets, including roads and bridges, and um, massive amounts of waste generated. So what went wrong um, in this, what, in a prepared community, why did people die and why did thousands of people have to be rescued? The catchment was saturated um, and this led to fast runoff. Official warnings gave incorrect information about the scale of the event. And instead of people planned for 11 and a half metre flood, not a 14 and a half metre flood, and they evacuated to their upper floors, not out of the area and became trapped in roof spaces of buildings. A lot of the warning systems failed, river gauges failed, um, either because they were washed over or because they hadn't been maintained and weren't functioning. Sirens were not used, um, in part because the power supply failed. People were 
unable to phone emergency because the emergency services were overwhelmed. It was cold, it was night time, and people woke up to find water inside their homes and that they were trapped. The water was contaminated. It was with sewerage, hydrocarbons from a flooded um, industrial site. It was full of hazardous materials um, and floating hazards like um, carts and shipping containers. There were also unexpected impacts, including fire, um, we think linked to solar panels and power storage systems on rooftops. The government of New South Wales told the council that its concerns and proposal for an upgraded warning system were premature. But local politicians also reported inadequate emergency services response, lack of coordination, inadequate training, and lack of local knowledge from flying professional staff. In the cleanup, people with new, no expertise and necessarily removed valuable materials and detail from heritage buildings, especially houses. The recovery was hampered with no accommodation for external volunteers, shortages of supplies, prolonged infrastructure failure, um, including drinking water, sewerage, roads, landslips, power, communications, and airfields. So the recovery um, is proceeding. There's a whole series of scientific reports. Um, there were council reports, which are on the council's website, including um, recovery site information. The background image shows a map from the council's website, which gives detail of progress on recoveries at different sites. Um, there was a whole lot of organisations set up um, in response to the, this event um, with Resilience New South Wales leading response and recovery in the short term. Um, there was establishment of a pod village, a temporary village on the high ground. Um, and there was a Northern Rivers Reconstruction Commission established mid 2022. Council um, is considering increased residential density in flood route free locations, land swaps, buyback schemes, and house raising schemes. Um, a 2022 inquiry suggested relocating people who live in high risk areas and a whole lot of other points, particularly about um, the emergency services coordination and warning systems. Um, the community has criticised the slowness and failure of the bureaucratic response, um, the incorrect information at the time of the flood and post flood. Um, Many are still homeless now, 21 months later. The recovery has also been hindered by a lack of capacity in the construction sector. In all this, heritage is missing. Official documents do not mention heritage. Flood recovery plans do not include strategies for heritage. Regardless, the original fabric of the masonry city centre heritage building survived. A local builder at the top right uh, he reported immediately in social media that the modern linings had failed, revealing sound original materials such as bricks, metal ceilings illustrated to the right, um, and tiles. Um, locals vocally defended their highly valued heritage to prevent its whole or partial demolition. They recognise the value of the irreplaceable timbers cut in the 19th century and no longer available. They understood the resilience of the heritage materials and designs. What we need and what we learned. To expect the unexpected, natural disasters are unpredictable. Lismore thought it was well prepared. But who would have thought that they would be fighting a fire in a flood, that first illustration or experience a major flood three weeks later. Um, there should have been timely cleanup of contaminated sites in the floodplain. Um, to have contaminated materials in the flood waters um, was a, a, a unexpected um, 
We also need to address safety hazards, such as rooftop solar panels and power storage batteries, um, particularly as people were sheltering on roof in roof spaces and escaping in, to rooftops. People need training. Um, networks and communication strategies, particularly when there's systems failing. Um, building and system design um, is under consideration, modifications and equipment for survival. For example, access to the outside from roof spaces. People were trapped in roofs and had to be um, cut out. Um, flotation devices in and battery powered lights in, in, in locations when there's evacuation. The use of flood ready, flood ready materials, details, and design, including to allow post uh, flood cleanup easily. More accurate um, information and uh, warnings, including flood maps, maintenance of infrastructure and buildings, and prioritization prioritisation of land management, um, location of emergency and social services out of the floodplain, and local response and preparedness, adaptable organisations and strategies and quick action were the key. Key points um, that I haven't covered already, the importance of listening to and valuing local knowledge and integrating that into disaster responses. Um, address the loss of community confidence and certainty after two unpredicted floods. Um, integrate heritage expertise, um, upscale a mobile construction section, sector workforce for disaster recovery. Uh, the importance of arts in the community, the, the artwork um, top, uh, in, in the above left, above right, um, was a, a local artist um, in the subject, one of the um, flood uh, recovery workers, won the Archibald Prize, uh, a major art prize, um, and gave prominence to um, the, the impact of the floods on the commun community. Um, above right, there's a, um, a picture of the pod village that was established in the high ground. Uh, Nature-based um, solutions, including revegetation, are also an important um, consideration, um, was, um, particularly for stabilising the land slips on high ground. Also integrating an Aboriginal approach, both in terms of community resilience and people and place as country. Uh, a statewide system for emergency management and temporary accommodation. Uh, I'll conclude with the uh, old bendy, what that tree in central Lismore called old bendy decorated for Christmas this year. Um, people see this um, as a sign of resilience. Um, although it's experienced flood and it's bent, it, um, it still looks beautiful. Uh, there's a page of references, which um, you can access if you uh, like later. Thank you very much for hearing our presentation. Uh, thank, thank you. Very, thank you very much, Kerme. Thank you very much, Sharon. Uh, for sharing your experience with us. And yes, at the end, we come to the end of the long day and our last presenter, uh, Laura Mari. And uh, Laura is a member of e-commerce Belgium and uh, e-commerce effort. Uh, she is also one of the member of the monitoring uh, group and uh, she provides a great help during last two years, but we uh, play. Uh, screen is yours, Dora. Thank you, Janet. I hope you can hear me well. I think so. Okay. okay, can you see my screen? Yes. 
Yes, good. we can. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me here, and thank you to those who are bearing with me after this long day. It's challenging to come last after all of these very interesting presentations. So my name is Laure Maric. I work for the Royal Institute for Cultural Heritage. And I will present to you the case study of the flood that hit Belgium in 2021. Kikirpa is the Royal Institute for Cultural Heritage. It's the federal institution that documents, studies, and preserve, preserves Belgian cultural and artistic heritage for the future. We work on the conservation, scientific analysis, uh, study and documentation of work of art and heritage. Before I dive, I dive into my presentation, I would like to give a quick overview of the cultural heritage sector and the crisis management sector in Belgium. So Belgium is a country made up of regions and communities. On the diagram below right, we can see the Flemish region in yellow, the Wallon region in red, and the Brussels region in blue. The regions are responsible for protecting the immovable heritage on their geographical territory. And then on the diagram at the bottom left, we can see the communities that are represented, the German-speaking community in green, the Dutch-speaking community in yellow, and the French-speaking community in red. The communities are responsible for protecting movable and intangible heritage. As you can see, the regions and communities do not correspond exactly. And then there is also the further state in gray, that has limited responsibility for cultural heritage and only owns a small amount of heritage and collections. For most of these levels, there are different government agencies responsible. For the crisis management sector, it's, it's not the same distribution. Responsibilities operate at the different level. So there are different phases of intervention, different in terms of the scales of the operation, the resources deployed, and the importance of the crisis management. So we can have local, provincial, and federal levels. In an emergency situation, reference is made to discipline. So we have D1, D2, D3, and so D5. Uh, that's work for the operation management of the crisis. And among these disciplines, no one is in charge of heritage. Now that you have a bit of context, I'm going to tell you about the protection of cultural heritage during the floods of July 2021. With these floods, Belgium and Wallonia in particular experienced the worst flooding it has seen for years. The affected area were particularly hard hit, with 39 people killed and more than 100,000 affected. A large part of the area was underwater, infrastructure was also affected, and more than 250 heritage sites were impacted. We can see here the map and the area that was hit by these torrential rains. So as you can see from the photos, it was spectacular, unexpected, and violent. We were unprepared for it. The context was particularly difficult with the COVID-19 pandemic having weakened populations and heritage sites for more than a year, and the summer period delaying and reducing the responsibilities for rapid responses. In addition, the structural lack of preparedness at heritage sites with very few emergency plans in place further exacerbated the damage. Some of our colleagues were quickly on site and then referred back to remote colleagues for emergency advice. But the problem was finding people with first aid and crisis management experience. Kikirpa reacted very quickly, sorry, um, very quickly uh, and coordinated the crisis with 14 heritage institutions and organizations from mid July to the end of August. Kikirpa worked hand in hand with the Belgian Committee of the Blue Shield and, and where the Kikirpa coordinated the strategic part, the Blue Shield took care of the operational part with more than 190 uh, volunteers helping on site. Here are a few pictures of the damage caused by, uh, to the cultural heritage by the floods. The main observations at the time were that there was a lack of procedures and tools for impact assessment, uh, that there was an absence of coordination planning, 
that we didn't really have a rich culture within the cultural sector and uh, a lack of integration of heritage in the risk management. To talk about a bit of the challenge we faced, I'm going to talk about data collection. So the first challenge was access to data. As I said, the cultural heritage sector was not collected to the crisis management sector, so we had no information on the general situation, needs, or accessibility. We had no idea of the extent of the flooding, and we didn't have any maps available showing the extent of the flooding. Then the second challenge was data collection. In the context of a pandemic and a lack of access to sites, we called on our partner uh, in Belgium and ICRAM for methodology, for example, to try and gather as much information as possible, but without access to sites, we couldn't be sure of the reliability of the data collector. Nobody was allowed on, into flooded part of the heritage sites for several days, and we had to wait for structural assessments and other buildings like hospitals, a buildings that could provide um, for shelter, schools had priority. The third point was to determine what had been damaged. Uh, there were so many objects and not always inventories. And when there were inventories, they had sometimes disappeared because of the floods. So for example, in the case of an archaeological storage, many of the heritage objects had lost their identification in the water and the mud. The fourth challenge was to determine when to assess the damage. So some uh, damage such as the, um, the, the appearance of salts and mold appeared months after the floods. So the impacts are different if we assess them directly after the floods than if we assess them months later. So when do we assess this damage? I have mainly talked about data collection on built heritage, but the same applies on data collection on intangible heritage and the com communities that practice it. So the lack of data on intangible heritage and the lack of awareness and understanding of the importance of intangible cultural heritage also makes it a vulnerable aspect in crisis situations. And yet it is very important for the recovery of, of communities after a crisis. So what do we do with all this? The first approach is currently being put in place by Kikifa at the federal government level for risk preparedness and protection of cultural heritage in times of crisis. This is the case of the crisis project, a project funded by the federal government after the 2021 flood, which is responsible, among other things, for coordinating the crisis committee, gathering data on damaged heritage, and providing technical advice for the treatment of that heritage. But we also go further than, than that. Uh, for example, with the FEDERESCUE project, uh, Federal Rescue Strategy for Science and Cultural Heritage, uh, a project that brings together federal institutions with the aim of providing holistic emergency plans for the protection of people and heritage for those institutions. IKEFA is also working to integrate cultural heritage into the National Crisis Center system with the aim of integrating cultural heritage into Paragon, a new emergency planning and crisis management tool. And then IKEFA also work on the strategic coordination of crisis management and heritage protection within the Belgian context and with the emergency services such as the fire brigades but also with a view to be more active at international level. And we have also started and intend to continue to set up training courses on risk preparedness in times of crisis and to pursue research by applying existing tools and methodologies to the Belgian context. Finally, we have started to gather emergency equipment with the aim of being prepared for any situation and pulling this emergency equipment. In conclusion, our long-term vision is to improve crisis coordination at the federal level, continue research on the subject uh, in Belgium, develop protocols for the treatment of heritage affected by crisis, and make them available, and participate in and set up risk management and disaster planning training for heritage professionals. So, and to move forward on other projects that may emerge as our research progresses. So this concludes my presentation, and thank you very much for your attention. Uh, 
Thank you very much, Laura, uh, for your contribution. Uh, so, dear colleagues, uh, eight hours after eight hours, I would like to thank uh, each and every one of you panelists and participants for giving up your time, for staying online so patiently, for sharing your important experience and uh, we would like to all of you for listening and uh, till this point. So it seems that together we stay united in the pursuit of safer and more disaster resilient future for our heritage. So please note that tomorrow we will be together again uh, one o'clock uh, afternoon uh, Central European time for hearing more about the case studies from Nigeria and Pakistan. And uh, I also would like to thank to my colleagues, Veronica, for bringing all of us together uh, and uh, AJ for uh, staying together with us for making sure that I do not make any mistakes <laughs> till this point. So please stay tuned and have a good day and uh, sweet dreams to finish the day today. Uh, so hope to meet uh, tomorrow. And uh, Hank, I saw your message. Also, thank you very much. And uh, we can set the time for another meeting, sure. And have a good night. Good night. Good night. Good thank night. You. Good night. We'll continue talking in the new year. Yes, thank Thanks, you. Veronica and Zeynep. You've done very well. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.